Today's guest is a truly magical and an extraordinary person who went through the deepest valleys of the shadow world. What we only read for, he experienced. He was a Department of Defense Research Librarian for almost a decade, responsible for incinerating highly classified materials on critical historical topics and occult phenomena, including volumes of notes on Tesla, H.P. Lovecraft, L. Ron Hubbard, the Vatican, and the United Nations. And these notes were destroyed, along with reams of reports detailing everything from military intelligence-sponsored drug smuggling operations to experimental mind control programs such as Montauk. Records plundered from both allied and enemy states articulated the hidden objectives of modern mass movements such as Nazism, Zionism, Islamicism and other ideologies. His post was at San Francisco's Presidio base, which was seething with Satanism, child abuse, and controversial medical experimentation. Since Presidio was closed, his background in military reference and his experiences in mercenary and security enforcement exposed him to startling insight into geopolitics, the current demographic apocalypse, and the medical industrial complex tantalizing our future. The occult background of his persona is beyond any summary, descriptions, or introductions. He is a genuine insider who is here for total disclosure so we want to inform the New Age crowd that this conversation is about bleaching parts of the shadow of the collective unconscious. And if you expect rainbows and unicorns, that is not for you. He's unyielding, he's dealing with the enormous pressure of the aftermath of his experiences and one of the bravest people we ever met. We welcome the dragon of the Eastern Seas, Douglas Dietrich, you're an absolute legend. Welcome to our show, sir. You're so kind. I very much am honored to be here and I am deeply appreciative in return for your time and your patience. Thank, Thank you. you, Douglas. Thank you uh, as well for coming into our show. Uh, for our first question, we want you to present yourself because you are practically unknown in our country. So could you please present yourself to the Bulgarian audience and public? and give us a simple basic background of your complex persona. Uh, perhaps it's a good idea to start with your various genetic profiles and how they contributed to your unique biography before your military involvement. Thank you. I appreciate that profoundly. Uh, I want people to understand that uh, my mother in particular is profoundly important to my development uh, she is someone who uh, gave me the genetic background that I have in terms of its more exotic aspects. Uh, the, she was half Japanese, half Chinese, and uh, her father being Chinese and her mother being Japanese, that was extraordinarily rare. Um, because, of course, of the Japanese invasion of China, uh, a lot of people would expect that you would have a Japanese father and a Chinese mother that would sometimes be a result of the war and people uh, meeting each other, perhaps sometimes even involuntarily through products of rape or the like. But in my case, because my uh, mother's father, uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was Chinese, and I, whenever I speak to Chinese people about the fact that he uh, married a Japanese woman and uh, they gave birth to my mother in Tokyo, uh, then Chinese people are profoundly impressed. It would be the equivalent of a black man taking a white woman as a wife in uh, the days before the American Civil War, when blacks were still generally regarded as slaves. It is that anomalous. So, um, and uh, oftentimes, uh, when Chinese would encounter my mother, uh, they would uh, assume uh, that uh, she was Asian as she got older, but they would uh, generally guess she was Japanese because she was so white. That would be the term they would use. And what people may notice, if you take a look at the old Japanese paintings, the classical Japanese paintings of that the Japanese would paint of themselves, they would look very stylized, you can instantly recognize them as a Japanese painting, and you'll notice that the Japanese are always pure white. The Japanese themselves always considered themselves the Caucasians of Asia. This is because they had interbred with the Caucasian Ainu, which is a tribe that is anthropologically known as the 
Keri Ainu that were ultimately driven from the Japanese home islands to the northernmost island of Honshu, the largest uh, main island of Japan in the north. And that's where they are maintained on uh, something similar to Indian reservations in America, but they're Caucasian, they're Caucasoid. So the Japanese do have white blood in them more so than other Asian. And as uh, also uh, from uh, the reason that a Chinese man was allowed to marry a Japanese woman at that time was because her father was of a very long uh, and illustrious bloodline. And uh, this takes us back to the days of the original emperor of Qin. And the the emperor of Qin, of course, is uh, someone from where we get the very name China. Qin became his, his family name, his dynastic name of Qin became China. Um, this was the first emperor, Qin Chia Wang, who was known as the Yellow Emperor. And what had happened was that he had ordered his Taoist alchemist, an alchemist who followed the religion of Taoism, he had ordered him, and his name was Zhu Fu, and he gave Fu Chu an, uh, a, a, a laboratory um, specimen collection of living children. These were all children in perfect health, one and a half thousand young men and one and a half thousand young girls. Uh, these were actually boys and girls who were uh, about 1,500 of each. And uh, he ordered them him to cut them up, vivisect them, do whatever he needed to extract from them the el elixir, the elixir vitae, the vital elixir of immortality uh, that he wanted to live forever. And uh, the Chinese felt that this could be extracted from youth, this secret, this uh, this alchemical formula. Um, Fu Zhu said that he needed to travel to the land of Wa, Wa Kokuguaya, that is the state of harmonic equilibrium, which was the ancient name for the Japanese islands that the Chinese had uh, recognized the Japanese islands by. So he said that there were herbs and uh, plants on the islands of Japan that he would need to access to mix with the blood and skin and bones of these young children in order to uh, fulfill uh, the emperor's wishes and uh, and create the uh, elixir of immortality. And uh, when he took the children with him, all 3,000 in a tremendous entourage in a fleet to the Japanese islands, he never returned. Rather, he stayed there and became their emperor in the Kyushu dynasty, the southern dynasty of Japan. Now, the imperial family of Japan today is the Umato dynasty, and they've ruled for effectively 3,000 years. But they started in the north, and as a result, um, like the British islands, where the British had their War of the Roses between the kings, and the winner became the king of all the British Isles. The Yamato dynasty, the northern dynasty of Japan, ultimately drove the southern dynasty out um, over half a thousand years, maybe uh, a period of uh, half of Japan's history. They began to relocate, ultimately, the Kyushu dynasty to mainland China. And their history was lost to the Japanese for many centuries because the Yamato dynasty erased all records of them. And it's really only been recently in history that uh, Japanese historians have begun to acknowledge the reality of the Kyushu dynasty, the ancient Kyushu dynasty, that it existed. But the emperors always knew, of course, the Yamato dynasty. And therefore, when my mother's family was uh, recognized as the heirs and descendants of the Kyushu dynasty. They were certainly allowed to take a Japanese woman of noble descent, and that was how a Chinese man uh, was able to marry a Japanese woman. And then my mother was born in Tokyo during the great earthquake and fire of Tokyo. While Tokyo was burning to the ground in a catastrophe that was in which uh, many thousands died around her, um, her mother was delivering her from her womb and she was born into the middle of a burning city. 
Uh, so this was uh, at a time that was considered very dangerous and at the same time uh, a time of great opportunity. So she was given uh, the name of uh, Takabayashi Hideko in the Japanese, in the Chinese, uh, Lin Suqin. Um, so she was definitely respected. Her um, father was one of the men who ran the Japanese colony of Taiwan, in which the nationalist Chinese would ultimately relocate. And Taiwan is very special because they were basically the only colony of Europe that ever expelled, violently expelled their colonizers. If you ever take a look at the history of European colonialism, the Europeans may have suffered many defeats in terms of their advances. They were defeated by the Zulus. They were defeated by uh, the Maharatha dynasty of northern India. They were defeated many times, but they were never stopped. Ultimately, the Europeans would continue their advance. And once they established themselves, it took two world wars at home in Europe for them to be expelled. But in the case of the island of Formosa, uh, named by the Portuguese as Beautiful Island, uh, that was the only case where the natives expelled the Europeans completely by violent warfare. And this was done under the pirate king Kojinga, who himself was half Chinese, half Japanese. And uh, so when her father became one of the people to run uh, Taiwan for the Japanese, uh, that was because of his own background and his background furthermore stretched back to the Magi of uh, China. These were the Magi who had ultimately traveled to what was then Roman Israel. This was in the time of Christ to coronate the Christ. This is, of course, something I had found out uh, about the Vatican uh, being a Department of Defense research librarian. Uh, one of the things that I had found out was the Vatican Library had the writings that were originally uncovered by uh, many uh, Germans and Japanese who were searching for ancient documents on uh, Christ. And uh, when they were discovering these ancient documents, they ultimately sold them to the Vatican, uh, who gave a lot of money to put it in its own library and then keep it a secret. But the reality is that it was finally discovered by a man named Professor Landau. And uh, Professor Landau was someone who specialized in the ancient language of Syrian, Syriac. And uh, that was the language spoken at the time of Christ. And uh, what he uh, discovered was that this ancient book, uh, the Revelation of the Magi, uh, spoke of the Magi uh, coming to coronate the Christ uh, because the Christ is a title. It's not a, it's not a name. Uh, yeah. The young uh, man who they uh, coronated was uh, simply known as the son of Joshua. Uh, and uh, therefore it kind of uh, became Jesus. Uh, but when this individual was coronated uh, by the Magi, uh, the revelation that was ultimately translated by Brent Landau, the professor of Syrian language, ultimately, and he published it English at least, uh, the revelation of the Magi. So it's available for the public to read. Uh, he proved that the Magi were Chinese, that they came from China, and uh, they had basically uh, brought with them uh, an entire army to cross the desert. It's something that they couldn't have done without an army of logistics because they required enough people to provide the labor, the water, the defense. Uh, this was nothing less than an invasion of ancient Roman Israel, which the Romans were powerless to stop. Uh, and uh, they uh, then confronted the um, Herodian uh, king, the King Herod, who was an Edomite, who was placed in charge of Israel by the Romans, and they demanded to see the Christ child. Uh, this was something that is all explained in the Revelation of the Magi. I don't need to go into it in great detail now. The most important point being that these were mage kings or sage kings from China. And uh, so they were proto-Christian, meaning that the Christianity as, uh, as, as developed in ultimately the time of Constantine, and then from there spreading to the West, 
uh, it originated uh, or had its roots not in Judaism at all, but out of China. And uh, because the uh, Chinese families that were so special that came to coronate the Christ, uh, what made them special was that they weren't really human. They were really a subspecies of humanity that uh, would come to be known as vampires. Now, the important thing to dismiss is any concept of romance about vampires. Um, I've written a book about it, and it's half written. We intend to publish the other half in the near future, expand and revise it with the help of my co-author, Peter Moon, whose books are published by Milko. And uh, when it comes to vampirology, it is available on Amazon. Uh, people can find it by looking up my name, Douglas Dietrich, and the book. It is unfortunately only in English, but um, maybe Milko can help to translate it into uh, the Bulgar language. But uh, up to him, yeah, of course, we'll, his we'll discretion. Yeah, we'll put it in the, into the description of the of the video. Yeah, and you can put uh, yeah you can put descriptions of it. Uh, it at any rate. The thing that I do want to emphasize about that is that people may ask, where did these vampires come from and exactly uh, what makes them uh, so different and how is it that they became such a legend? Uh, you just understand, of course, that uh, the man has often said that dogs are his best friend. Uh, they, a lot of uh, white European men in America particularly love dogs, but um, this codependence on dogs actually developed as a defense against vampires because dogs react violently to them in most cases. That wasn't so much the case with myself because I'm only a quarter vampire, my mother being half, uh, and the vampirism came from her father's side, the Chinese side. But uh, this all goes back to, of course, according to the Soviet research, because the Soviets were the um, one state who uh, conducted state-sponsored research into vampirism without any sense of superstition. They did it from an atheistic, materialist, rationalist perspective, investigating Slavic legends of vampires. And as they became convinced that there were uh, many primates that were still extant, that were not human, uh, cryptids such as uh, the Alma, as they call them in the Siberian regions, what the Americans call Bigfoot or Sasquatch, uh, they approached with the same kind of academic eye or detachment vampires. And so this goes back to uh, the Miocene, uh, the age uh, some uh, 20 million years ago on the African savanna. And in German Ost Africa or Kenya, uh, that was when it was uh, much cooler and uh, there were genuine forests there. Uh, and the apes in the area of Lake Victoria were frugivores or fruit eaters with very large canine teeth for self-defense. And the fossils uh, proved that they lived a good part of their life on the ground, uh, tree dweller uh, and ground dweller alike. Uh, this is called proconsul, and throughout the Miocene, you had this uh, jungle environment, and then what happened was drought. Uh, basically, when the drought hit, it was actually planetary. It was called drought, which was orders of magnitude beyond any drought we can understand today. It was a drought that lasted 12 million years, and that's a terrestrial catastrophe of the highest magnitude. Um, everything began to die. Uh, so millennia upon millennia without rain, uh, other than occasional showers, uh, the forest began to die and apes had to learn to live on the ground. Uh, they fought with the apes that stayed in the trees uh, for the, the canopy, for the fruit, and um, those that lost were left to stand upright so they could see approaching predators and therefore ultimately became what we know as humanity. But there is always a kind of subspeciation. Uh, just as Darwin discovered in studying his finches on the Galapagos Islands, that some finches uh, live off the blood of other birds, just as uh, people who study forensics have discovered that uh, the corpse lice who devour cadavers have a subspecies that eats only other corpse lice. 
Uh, so too, mankind developed a subspecies. As uh, man had to learn to uh, eat food he had never eaten before, unlike the fruit apes who had inherited the treetops, he had to inherit the world. He had to learn to uh, eat other food that was before indigestible. And uh, at the same time, there were a subspecies of humanity that learned to feed off other men. This is what became known as the vampire. This is what the Soviets concluded in their study of the actual subspecies that they caught, uh, dissected, uh, tortured. I write about that in the book Vampirology. So do understand that this is a true, very real anthropological phenomenon. Uh, these are not some subspecies that's gothic in nature that became uh, a product of the Dark Ages, uh, that people began to think that. This was because of the understanding that man always had that there were vampires. Uh, it was like for m millennia, for the millions of years that man evolved, this danger was known. It was accepted as reality. No one questioned it as some kind of superstition. And uh, by the Middle Ages, you had this beginning of a misunderstanding, a different comprehension, because it was in that in-between time before we had the Renaissance, where man began to deny realities that he used to take for granted. The Renaissance was not just a rebirth, but it was also a kind of blindness. You became blind to things you used to recognize uh, because you believed you had found a new reality. That was the byproduct of the Renaissance. But before the Renaissance, we had the plague and the Black Plague was overrunning Europe. But the wealthy nobles, they would use silver. Colloidal silver is what we call it today. Back then, they would simply use silver coins and put them in their drinks. And therefore, it would help as an antibiotic, an antiseptic to kill the germs of the Black Plague. But as with the imbibing of too much colloidal silver, it has a tendency, if you overexpose yourself to it, to turn you blue. So much of the nobility would develop a blue tinge, look dead or undead to the peasants. And while millions of the peasants would die, the nobility would live. And so the peasants began to think the nobility were vampires. And that's how vampirism became affiliated or identified with nobility. That was, uh, it, it became almost romantic by the time it became a literary uh, device for someone like uh, Bram Stoker. So understand that that's not the way to understand vampirism. It's not clans or secret societies of uh, people of tremendous wealth and education. Uh, vampires are more like autistic people who are essentially very attractive and charismatic, but uh, not really functional uh, in society, almost like a high level autistic. Um, now, when they do every once in a while uh, breed, then uh, otherwise they, it's important to understand that they're almost exclusively always male. And therefore, it's not like they're breeding among themselves and creating baby vampires and Instead of converting other people to vampirism, as explained in the book, mostly what they spread is a kind of rabies if they get infected with it. And that creates people who eventually die within a short period of time. But people think of as almost vampiroid. This was one of the problems during the Dark Ages. But the point to emphasize is that otherwise they're not reproducing. And uh, they're almost exclusively male because males are evolutionarily more equipped, better equipped to rape to uh, kill, to they're just a stronger breed of specimen. So when they do rape someone and no one knows what causes this, some kind of like reproductive urge that kicks in every once in a while, uh, their lives aren't that long, maybe a few hundred years. But uh, when they do produce a child from a woman, it's called a damfire. This is an ancient term. People can look it up. And uh, the damfire in the Middle Ages was recognized as being the best vampire hunter because they're half vampire. That's what my mother was. Not a vampire hunter, but she was a damp fire. And damp fires were hired to kill vampires until the eras, well, until the age of the communists. Uh, the last known damp fire that was hired to kill a vampire was in Yugoslavia in the 1970s. 
So that was on record. Uh, and uh, some of these documents that were smuggled out of the uh, b- from behind the Iron Curtain to the Americans, uh, the Americans would dismiss. They would think it was the Soviet disinformation campaign. They would translate it uh, and say it's an object of interest. But most of the time they would just say, oh, the Soviets are trying to misinform us. And then that is how I wound up with so many of these documents on vampires, because I was, as a military librarian in charge of documents destruction, ordered to destroy the documents. And therefore, I wound up taking massive notes and basically smuggling them out uh, as often as I could. And um, that was uh, otherwise I would just try to commit to memory everything I could. Now, when it comes to uh, the entire importance of, say, for instance, uh, uh, how I smuggled out uh, some of what I did, uh, understand that it was the fact that the military in America is capitalist based. We're defending a capitalist society. And because of that, they give deep leeway to their defense contractors, companies that contract with the military state. This is something that you wouldn't have in communist countries. In communist countries, the state would control the military. In a capitalist economy, the military as to, it doesn't build anything. It has to hire contractors to build it, all its weapons and everything else. So what happens is it hires these private contractors and then respects their business privacy. It doesn't interfere with their business. So when defense contractors would uh, deal with the military, they had a private section of the library for them. That was the area where I would put materials to later smuggle out because the security at the postal library, meaning the library on the military post, the military base, would never investigate the private company documents. That was how I was able to take materials out and smuggle them out because I would hide them in private company files. Well, that, that, was... that explains a lot, yeah. And uh, uh, just before this is important to, to your story, can we uh, get back a little um, and explain what is a life like a vampire? The, the What would a life be like for a vampire? Yeah, you being a quarter vampire, what is life like? Well, I'm very fortunate. I'm very fortunate because uh, what happened was uh, a... Um, a long time ago uh, when I, and I'm still involved, we'll speak of secret societies later, I'm still peripherally involved with, in San Francisco, they're called the Tong. Now the Tong are the Chinese underworld. Um, they, they, it's also important to understand, it's very difficult for many uh, people to comprehend secret societies uh, because, uh, or or even history, because of the different political, uh, this, the different types of censorship or the control of the narrative that's taken by different governments or regimes. To give you a good example of this, and I'll get right back to what it's like to be a, a vampire, I yeah. do want people to understand that uh, one of the things the um, uh, Tito, yeah, Yoshi, Bruj Tito of Yugoslavia did was yeah. he would basically have spies go out to libraries in the West and destroy all evidence of uh, Mikhaila, uh, uh, Draja Mikhailovic. Uh, Draja Mikhailovic was the Serbian resistance fighter who fought against him. And because he would have his agents go out to foreign libraries and destroy, basically steal books on this man from those libraries, gradually all information on Draja Mikhailovich disappeared in the West. And then the West began to basically rely on Tito's information for Yugoslavia during World War II. So then the West think tanks trying to make decisions on what to do in the Cold War became deeply influenced by Yugoslavia and Yugoslavia became almost like an unofficial middle party between NATO and the Warsaw Pact. So this can have tremendous influence. It's it, as a result, most Americans think that Draja Mikhailovic sided with the fascists and the Italians, which he was forced to do at times, but they think of him as a Axis collaborator 
as opposed to Tito is viewed as this great freedom fighter. Same with uh, the North Koreans did something similar with books. And then the think tanks in America begin to think that uh, the uh, North Koreans were the ones who fought against the Japanese, while the South Koreans collaborated with the Japanese in World War II. Now, all of this would make a South Korean angry with rage, but Americans don't know any better. It's just, just they were victims of this kind of theft campaign of books in their libraries about Korea, of which there were only a few anyway. So when it comes to the vampires, understand that one more aspect of my lineage needs to be understood in order to understand how I'm able to live the life that I do. Uh, my mother's uh, Japanese side, the lady that uh, my grandfather from her side took as a wife was of the ninja clans. So the ninja uh, never disappeared. Uh, certainly if they had been annihilated by the samurai, then this would have gone into the history books, just like the, there was once an entire warrior cast of the warrior monk and, uh, the warrior monks in, uh, Japan were annihilated by the samurai. This went into the history books. If the samurai had done the same with the ninja, the, someone would have taken credit for it, but no one ever did. This is because the ninja never disappeared, but they became gradually involved with the Onmyoryo, and the Onmyoryo was the Japanese occult bureau, and that was an ancient uh, Japanese uh, uh, bureau that was created by the emperor to uh, basically be society's magical protector. Uh, they would exorcise or drive out demons from homes uh, and uh, they would protect the state by uh, divination, telling fortunes. Um, all of this still exists today. It was technically abolished during the Meiji Restoration. Uh, Are these on Myojis? Uh, oh, uh, they were known as on Myoji, the wizards. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, on Myoji. And, uh, but the department, the Bureau of on yeah. Myoji, our wizards, was called on Myorio. And so the on Myorio uh, became the Shikabu Shoku or the board of ceremonies. And so they still exist today. Um, my mother was part of that because that's what the ninja became um, affiliated with. They became ultimately um, absorbed by the Department of Magic. And uh, aside from that, um, their combatants became more involved with what became known as basically you would understand that this is almost transhumanism in the west not you because you're more central european and you probably aren't uh, overwhelmed by uh, so much of the west's uh, culture wars that is what we call them here but in uh, culture wars in america we call them uh, we we would call such people transgender or transhumanist but uh, the ninja began to basically find a place in society for their spies in what became known as bokuko or tomboys, like girls who looked very boyish, and wakashu, which means beautiful youth, but essentially means androgynous young men. And these were essentially prostitutes that were trained to kill. So these prostitutes that were trained to kill were the only ones who had access to the West. When the Dutch, first the Portuguese and the Dutch, tried to trade with Japan, the shogun, the Japanese generalissimo, didn't want them in Japan at all, so they literally built artificial islands to keep the Europeans on. No Japanese were allowed to go into these islands normally, uh, so the Europeans would actually bring slaves, but sometimes the Europeans wanted prostitutes, in fact, all the time. So they either wanted young girls or young boys, and the Japanese would send in these bokuko or wakashu. And these would be boys that look like girls or girls that look like boys, which is what the Europeans wanted. And this was the only way that they would be able to kill the Europeans if they needed to. So these were young children that were trained to kill. This is the tradition my mother raised myself in. So I was raised and trained with the ability to kill while cross-dressed. Now, this sounds maybe 
obtuse, uh, but it's very important because that's how I became involved with the Chinese Tong or mafia or underworld in San Francisco because the Japanese in America during World War II were all put into concentration camps. After World War II, most Japanese left the United States. And because they left the United States, because all of their money was taken, all of their land was taken, they had nothing to come home to. They just went to Brazil or they went back to Japan. There's almost no Japanese in the United States today. Uh, so the only Asians here are Chinese in terms of East Asians. Uh, then later, many Asian Indians came. Other Asians like Filipinos were always brought here as slaves originally by the Americans. And then later on, uh, they were uh, brought in as uh, basically American servants. Uh, but uh, the Japanese are gone. And the only really free people of any business consequence uh, who have a uh, use the capitalist society to make a profit were the Chinese. And much of their profit goes back to China or used to traditionally through the underworld, through illegal means, because they would do a lot of human smuggling, bring other Chinese into the country. Uh, the reason why the underworld is so important to the Chinese in America is because um, the Chinese were literally outlawed in America after they used them to build the railroads. Then the Americans said, now we'll outlaw them so we can get rid of them. And uh, then what happened was Chinese who lived in the United States uh, lived here illegally. So if they became, you became essentially a criminal just by being a Chinese in America. So most Chinese here were involved with the underworld. So that's the whole reason. Later that changed, but it only changed after World War II. In fact, during World War II, the Americans uh, rescinded those laws or changed those laws because they needed China as an ally. So that's, it was only during World War II they changed those laws. But the underworld is still basically the economy for much of the Chinese here. And because I was able to dress as a girl and knew how to kill people, that was why I became involved with the Chinese underworld because I was one-fourth Chinese uh, and they trusted me and they also... Uh, none of them were willing to dress up as a girl to kill anyone. <laughs> so so uh, because of that, I became an invaluable member. And as a result, during my involvement with the Chinese underworld, uh, I adopted a young girl who uh, later on uh, married uh, a very wealthy man. And thanks to that, his involvement with Silicon Valley, just so listeners understand, Silicon Valley is a creation of the U.S. military here in San Francisco. The U.S. military was headquartered at the Presidio. And what happened was they began to contract the local uh, companies to make computer networks. And so the original Internet was called DeltaNet. This was an army Internet. And then it became DARPAnet, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. And then it became the internet as we understand it, but it all grew out of San Francisco and Berkeley and the greater San Francisco Bay Area Metroplex region. And that was how Silicon Valley developed. It was a defense contract hub uh, locale from which they contracted with the military and then it became the area for the development of American technology. So since that's still the area where most of the high technology multi-millionaires, the moguls, the billionaires live. My adopted son, uh, because there was originally a girl, she was a young girl that I adopted off the streets as a prostitute. Uh, and because, uh, just so people understand this, uh, the black pimps in San Francisco, these are black African-American pimps who basically prostitute children. Uh, a lot of these people will never sell a child because they make too much money off of them uh, by using them up. Uh, if they get one purchase to sell a child, they're never going to have the money that they would get by using the child for a good 10 or 12 years until they die from drug overdoses or beatings or get murdered. Um, so they never want to sell their children. Uh, by that, I mean not their biological children, but their child slaves. And uh, the one that I wanted to purchase, 
Uh, I didn't know at the time had what was called gender dysphoria, always thought of herself really as a boy and wanted to become a boy. But at the time that I adopted her, she was a biological girl. Because of my connections with the Chinese underworld, we threatened this one black pimp to sell her. So he was willing to sell her, being afraid of being killed. And uh, when I purchased her, um, I realized she had no papers. Um, her majority genetic background was Armenian. They were threatening to deport her. So we just took her into our underworld network as a prostitute and allowed her to keep the majority of her own money. When she ultimately was old enough, she uh, had a sex change because she had always wanted to be a boy, at which point I couldn't marry her like I wanted. So I uh, actually married her off to a wealthy Silicon Valley billionaire who wanted this young boy as a wife. Now, because of his marrying this individual, who I've always promised to keep the identity secret for their security. Uh, as a matter of fact, the way that I met him was I was hired as his personal security at one point. All of these people are involved in taking in blood from younger people. It's called parabiosis. So when it comes to parabiosis, uh, understand that anybody who gets blood from a younger person, if it's the same blood type, gets rejuvenated. It's, it's medically proven this works. Um, the thing to convince anyone who doubts it is just take a look at athletes who are trying to avoid getting busted for using steroids or various kinds of drugs, it, what they call performance enhancement drugs. Um, if the Olympics or professional uh, sports catches someone using them, it's a disgrace. You could lose your career. So what athletes have found out is that when they're in peak condition, at their best level, they can take their own blood out and freeze it. And then before any important sports event, they pump their own blood back into them from when they were at their most healthy. And that enhances their performance just as good as any performance enhancement drug or steroid. And the authorities can do nothing about it because it's your own blood. You could pump it into yourself in front of them and they couldn't do anything. So this is what's been found out by the wealthy elite is that taking blood from uh, young people uh, helps them enormously, even to a degree reverses the aging process. So every Silicon Valley multi-billionaire like Peter Thiel was the one who was exposed doing this. They uh, usually try to get young boys, uh, young men. Uh, the reason they prefer young men is they don't want estrogen from young girls. And sadly, the majority of these high-tech moguls are men. There's almost none of them are women. So the blood transfusions they want are from young men. Now, they want to adopt young men to become transfusion associates. You want to adopt them because uh, that way you make certain that they're not on the street using drugs. You want to have them in your home where you can monitor their behavior and make certain they're in an environment where they're kept healthy and away from exposure to disease. So uh, most of the Silicon Valley moguls will have kind of a adoption agency, adopt young men, help raise them and give them an education. And uh, in exchange, these children growing up will exchange their blood. Uh, this is something that's unspoken of, but true. And so thanks to the arrangement I have with my son's husband, uh, I do have access to drink blood from young men. And uh, this is uh, important because uh, I'm straight, I'm heterosexual. And as a result, the young men to me are food as opposed to this myth that people have about somehow vampires seducing women and drinking their blood. I mean, that's so ridiculous. It's like, it's like having sex with your food. If, I mean, if someone's gonna eat a cow or a pig or a chicken, would you ever dream of having sex with them? I mean, that's the most lunatic thing ever about the vampire myth is that this is somehow a sexual act that you're taking blood. It's food. <laughs> so the food I take is from these young men, the blood, and um, my sex is with women. So hopefully that puts that into some perspective for people about the life of a vampire. Now, I'm very fortunate because for me, life is easy uh, for my mother and she raised me to prepare for this. 
she basically my mother was someone who everyone thought was a real fan of murder mysteries, a detective uh, aficionado, meaning like everybody thought uh, one of the ways that she learned English was through the Sherlock Holmes novels because they're very simple English. And, um, and so people thought, oh, she's like a big Sherlock Holmes fan. And so she would always be investigating crime. And they thought this was just an amateur criminologist who's just uh, investigating true crime. So she would keep track of the news and investigate serial killers and uh, criminals, where they were, who they were. This was because this is what she fed off of, uh, because she was feeding off people in the wild, so to speak. Then uh, she wanted to make certain that she killed people who deserved it. Now, in my case, I'm only one fourth vampire, one fourth Chinese, one fourth vampire, one fourth Japanese, uh, the other half white. Um, my father, who raised and guided me, um, had some Native American Indian blood in him. But this is my legal father He's not uh, necessarily my biological father, almost certainly is not. But when it came to my mother, on the other hand, uh, because of her vampire background being half vampire, when she would take a lot more blood than I do. When I take blood, uh, I take several pints. Uh, so, but I could never really drain a person dry. That's uh, my mother, on the other hand, had the physical ability where her stomach would be like a camel's hump. She could drain a man dry, and then she would look like she was pregnant with huh. literally about 12 pints of blood in her. So she would look like she was pregnant for several days, you know, sometimes up to a few weeks. And then the hump would disappear and she'd need to feed again. Uh, but because she fed in the wild, uh, she would kill criminals. You see, in America, uh, things are bad in any country, but in America, people may not understand how America has so many killers. Uh, thousands and thousands of people disappear in America every year. None of them are ever found. Uh, this is due to so many killers, uh, satanic cults. We have many dangers, but uh, one person, anyone who examines the crime statistics will notice that very few of those criminals or serial killers are ever caught. The ones that do make history books and then they'll say, oh, how, you, you know, intelligent or cunning this serial killer might be in their own way. But the reality is these are the stupid ones that get caught. The majority of them will kill until the day they die or una are unable to kill anymore. They're addicted. Uh, my mother would hunt many of these down and kill them and they would disappear and they would be just like their victims. No one would know that they were gone. So uh, my mother was very good at that. In a sense, she was a criminal who killed criminals. So is there any connection between um, the the vampiric nature of your mother and uh, her job for the emperor? Uh, it's interesting that that was never really exploited. It's uh, it really wasn't uh, considered uh, important to the emperor. The emperor considered uh, my mother much more important for her uh, ability to speak so many languages. Uh, the interesting thing was that my mother was, uh, because of her um, father and her mother together, her mother's background in the ninja clans, which are were always cosmopolitan and always needed to learn the languages of foreigners because these were the bok bokuko and Wakashu, who went as child prostitutes into the foreign cities on the artificial islands in the past, they had to learn multiple languages. So uh, the ninja kept that tradition up. So it was that tradition, along with her being of a multicultural family, my mother developed quite the talent for languages. And because she had the noble background uh, and was recognized as a reunification of China and Japan in the sense of their noble families, um, she was, as is the tradition in nobility and the royalty of families the world over, uh, younger people are trained earlier, expected to uh, be much more responsible at a younger age. Uh, and as a result, she was trusted with responsibilities at a very young age because 
her ability to speak languages so fluently was considered such an important talent. So she was uh, basically sent uh, with the Japanese missions to Berlin to serve as a translator. And at that time, she was literally between 14 to 16 years of age. Uh, so we're talking about an underage person. And it was there that the emperor uh, gave her the assignment. He felt it was very important being a marine biologist himself. So this is something that is important to emphasize. Uh, Ibrahim Rohito was w until basically uh, the lady known as uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher took over England. She was a scientist. Uh, Angela Merkel uh, in charge of Germany was a scientist. Now, until those two women ruled England and united Germany, there was never a scientist who ruled an empire or a country. Uh, Emperor Hirohito was the only one in history until those two women became politicians. And Emperor Hirohito was the first uh, world level leader who became a uh, scientist that was internationally recognized academically. He became a marine biologist who discovered a separate species of marine life, which in those days made your career. Now, nowadays with underwater robots and spy satellites, uh, we're discovering thousands of new species every day. But in his day, it, discovering a new species was a miracle. So he had discovered a new species of animal. He had proven himself as a scientist and he thought scientifically. And as a marine biologist, he helped Japan develop bioweapons, weapons of mass destruction using unit 731, which was infamous for experiments on human beings that was financed by Emperor Hirohito personally. And one of the things he wanted for his uh, uh, biomedical experiments, uh, he told my mother to collect Hitler's sperm. So my mother, uh, during her trips to Berlin, uh, collected sperm from Adolf Hitler by basically drawing him off uh, from the crowd, ultimately isolating him, seducing him, and basically giving him a few blowjobs. This happened more than once. Basically, she uh, performed oral sex on him. This was uh, something that happened uh, at least twice during her uh, various trips to Berlin with the uh, diplomatic teams that traveled there. She was introduced to him by uh, Otto Dietrich. Otto Dietrich was Hitler's press chief. He was the man in charge of propaganda for the SS. And uh, he himself was related to Sepp Dietrich, who was in charge of Hitler's personal bodyguard, the Leibstandlotte, or the Life Standard Bearer, uh, division of armored tanks that was under the command of Josef Sepp Dietrich, uh, who was known as Hitler's gladiator, one of his favorite soldiers. So Otto Dietrich was the man who was in their way. They were directly related to the man that my mother married, George Dietrich, from whom I get my name. And uh, but that was later in history. Uh, but uh, these men who introduced her to Hitler that was how she was able to meet him personally. Um, there is a photograph of him that I released uh, that uh, is loose online now of Hitler in a kimono. It was my mother who put him in that kimono uh, and uh, convinced him that uh, he stand there while she take a photograph of him while he felt like an idiot. <laughs> and uh, it was during that time of seduction that uh, she got uh, at least two test tubes of his sperm. One was delivered to the emperor. Uh, the sperm was put into a, uh, by the way, apparently from what she told me, Hitler didn't seem to care that she was doing this uh, while she was uh, performing oral sex on him, that she collected sperm in a test tube. He apparently didn't even think about it or, or uh, thought it was maybe a personal quirk or a fetish and dismissed it. He never protested, uh, but uh, in the test tube was a ginseng solution. Ginseng is an herb that uh, people can look this up. A ginseng solution uh, actually preserves sperm. So she was able to keep the sperm in the test tube until she got it to refrigeration. And in refrigeration, sperm can last half a hundred years. So, um, well, as I said, one test tube went to Tokyo and uh, what the emperor did with it 
is unknown. Uh, theoretically, he was going to use it to try and perform what Josef Mengele, the infamous Nazi doctor, did one of the world's first biogeneticists in the old days. Genetics was a term that implied mathematical units of inheritance. We would think of genetics the way they perceived it back then, more like genealogy. After the Jewish woman named Rosalind Franklin isolated the the helical structure of dioxyribonucleic acid or DNA, then we began to realize genetics could be manipulated mechanically. Uh, but before the West understood this, our man uh, Josef Mengele of the Third Reich understood genetics as molecular biology. And he performed what he called twinning because all clones are, are identical twins. So it was Emperor Hirohito's idea, apparently as my mother understood it, not that he ever spoke to her much about it, that he was going to clone Adolf Hitler. In other words, twin him using his sperm. Uh, perhaps he never pursued that, or it was something that he probably was distracted from with all his other responsibilities in the war. But people might ask, why would the Asians care about Hitler? It's important to understand that to the rest of the world outside of Europe and the West, uh, Hitler was a tremendous hero. When it came to basically my mother convincing Adolf Hitler that both Asian races, she was half Chinese, half Japanese, when she convinced them both Asian races were important, Hitler began to support the nationalist Chinese uh, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, the man who was the father of nationalist China, which then relocated and reestablished itself on Taiwan. And uh, Chiang Kai-shek, his government was based on the fascist model. That's why he was fighting the communists. But he was also fighting the Japanese originally. Uh, but uh, because the Japanese also wanted Hitler's alliance, both the Chinese and the Japanese depended on Hitler. Now, people can look this up. Uh, everyone knows about the DAK or the Deutsch Afrika Corps. N almost nobody knows about the DOK or the Deutsch Orient Corps. But they could look up the Field Marshal von Falkenhausen. Von H Falkenhausen was responsible for the Deutsch Orient Corps, the German Oriental Corps in China that basically trained the Chinese army. So you can look up all these Chinese wearing Nazi uniforms, uh, armed with German weapons, trained in the German manner of warfare. Uh, all of it is true. All of it is historical. These were the elite guard of Chiang Kai-shek. So when the Japanese were fighting the Chinese, they were trying to negotiate peace. My mother was a part of this. Obviously, my mother would want peace between both nations. And this was in uh, the late December of 1937. And in December uh, 11th through the 12th, they were holding these peace negotiations when the American Marines, and the Americans had an entire corps, an entire army of Marines in China at the time. The American Marines were led by a man named Evans Fortis Carlson. Carlson developed what were called Carlson's Raiders, which were famous Marines throughout World War II. He was a communist. He was buried in America, but the Soviets came and helped to bury him. So when he was buried, he was buried with Soviet medals on his chest, and you had an entire Soviet band to play the Soviet national anthem for him when he was buried in America. And this was like years after World War II. We're talking about by the 60s or the 70s. So you're talking about a communist Marine. He broke in to basically uh, destroy the Japanese-Chinese peace negotiations. This led to the Nanjing massacre. Now, this is important. This is important because his men were disguised as uh, basically Chinese coolies. The Japanese thought the Chinese had betrayed them and they began to slaughter the Chinese in Nanking, what became known as Nanjing. 
and what became known as the Nanking Massacre. Now, at that time, the local German diplomat, Stroop, and other German diplomats, the entire embassy called Adolf Hitler and said, the Japanese are slaughtering thousands of Chinese. Uh, they could destroy the entire city. We need your help. And Hitler said, I'll send something. And he sent an enormous Nazi swastika flag. It was so large, it literally weighed one ton. It was called the one ton flag. And what the Germans did was they spread that over several city blocks in Nanjing. And because the swastika was so large, it covered entire city blocks and the Japanese didn't dare to bomb it. And it was under that flag of security that all the Chinese escaped into. They took in all these Chinese women and children under the protection of that flag. Meanwhile, the German diplomats would go out and rescue Chinese to bring them into the shelter by holding up their Nazi badges with the swastika. And that would stop the Japanese anytime they caught them raping or killing anyone. They could rescue children and women simply by showing that swastika and the Japanese would immediately stop and they could take the women and children and bring them into the shelter. This was how Hitler rescued hundreds of thousands of Chinese. In China, he's considered a great hero uh, to the nationalists. Only the communists hid this history. So this is why both Japan and China have the deepest respect for Adolf Hitler. And uh, so he continued to help both countries throughout the war. Uh, so when it came to uh, why he was so important and why the Asians admired him, it's why ultimately the test tube of Hitler's sperm that my mother kept in refrigeration was used to give birth to my sister and myself. Uh, the man she married, George Dietrich, my legal father, who had been in the Navy for so many years, he was sterile. He had been married several times to white women. Uh, he had been married at least five times before he married my mother. He had been married so many times, the Navy considered it a scandal and they stripped him down by a rank from chief petty officer, the highest rank you could go to as an enlisted man in the Navy, uh, down by a rank. And um, so he, he was this individual who believed that an Asian, an Asian woman might be more fertile. So he married my mother for that reason. She married him because of his eyes. The, he had Alexandria's Genesis, purple eyes, just like Adolf Hitler. And so she married him for that reason. But she told me he could never produce any children. And so she fooled him into thinking that the births of my sister and myself were, were his children. He actually didn't believe it about my sister. She was born first in 1963, the year of the Montauk incident that uh, we will address later. But uh, he, well, my father thought she was the product of a liaison. He, she looked uh, small, dark, and hairy like a little Filipino. But when I was born, I was born with uh, very blonde hair and, like his. And of course, my eyes were like his, uh, blue, purple, purplish blue. And so he believed me to be his child. But really, my mother said we were, my sister and I were really both the children of Hitler biologically. So hopefully people understand the dynamics behind that. And, uh, and, and by all means, go on with your next question. This is a fascinating background. Uh, it, it took you an hour to, to tell all the stories about yourself. And this is uh, almost uh, incomprehensible. And of course, very controversial. But uh, actually, you're most famous for your um, stay in, in the Presidio base. Before we get to that, you describe yourself as a public informant. Can you elaborate on that uh, as an opposite of the notoriously famous whistleblower concept related to the typical, typical conspiratorial matters? Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, the really important to understand that um, the people who are known as whistleblowers, it, first off, I do want people to understand that I prefer the term public informant simply because I find it to be a far more dignified title <laughs> than the term <laughs> whistleblower. It's really just much more euphonic. It's just much more uh, pleasant sounding, professional sounding, respectable. But the term whistleblower, there's another reason 
why I, I want to avoid that term. The term whistleblower has become affiliated or identified with people like um, Snowden, uh, with people like Assange. And uh, when it comes to these people, uh, during the period of time where the whistleblowers became most famous or infamous was around the time that we had three names that really stood out. Um, there was Julian Assange. Uh, there was, of course, Edward Snowden. And then there was uh, the real victim, or the only one that was a victim, which was uh, uh, Manning, Private Bradley Manning of the U.S. Army. And he had a sex change um, and became um, Elizabeth Manning, Chelsea Elizabeth Manning. Um, now, my own son, who I had adopted as a girl, was a girl when I uh, purchased her as a child prostitute off the streets of San Francisco from a black pimp. Uh, her name was originally Elizabeth. Um, she had a correspondence going with uh, Bradley Manning while he was in prison because he wanted to become a woman, uh, whereas she had become a man, a young man, and um, they exchanged names. Uh, she took his name Edward. He took the name Elizabeth. And um, so he was really the only victim. He was exploited by Julian Assange. Julian Assange was a product of a CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, sponsored religious cult in Australia that had been incepted in a town in India. And uh, these were people who called themselves beings of the light. And uh, they uh, basically bleached their hair and their skin white. This is why Julian Assange looks so unnaturally white. Most people who see him in China uh, or even in America, they thought he was Swedish, uh, but he's Australian. And uh, so he's this individual who many people misidentify, but uh, he is an individual who was in Australia and the Americans used him to hack, he became a computer expert, and he worked with the US military, and he was hacking communist Chinese computers. And because he was hacking these communist Chinese computers, he became an expert at hacking, and then he decided at some point to become a traitor, quote unquote, to the Russians. Now understand that there are what are called double agents, and triple agents. So when it comes to someone like Edward Snowden, when he released all these documents through Julian Assange, they victimized this private known as Bradley Manning. Now to put this into some perspective for Central Europeans, the American military, which I worked for for years, and I grew up in the military in the sense that my father had served in the military all his life, my legal father. And because of him, I was able to get access as a child, as a child to the Presidio military base because they had the entire families of the militaries able to shop at their post exchange is what they call it, their commissary. These are like food and goods stores that are on military bases with discount prices because military men are never paid much compared to civilians. So they give them cheaper rates on base. So because I was able to have access to all of that growing up, I was what they call a military dependent, someone who's dependent on a military person. Even if they're retired, if they've served in the military as a career, they still have that access. And uh, the another term for it colloquially, unofficially, would be military brat. So because I grew up a military brat, I grew up with the military. These are people in America that are unemployable in the civilian world. These are people who are mentally incompetent. They can't get employment in an honest job where you have to be professional and you have to be uh, just on the ball. In other words just you have to be you have to be functional 
These are people who, because they can't work in the civilian world, they go into the military. It's no longer a draft. So because there's no draft in the military since Vietnam ended in America, then the worst of the worst go in there, people who would otherwise be in jail. The, so the majority of the military people are completely incompetent. That's the first thing that people need to understand. It's the same way with the intelligence community. These, these are just basically people who would otherwise be in jail. They're generally criminal. They're mostly incompetent, mentally as well as professionally. And they're just generally uh, not the image that people, that they project. The, the propaganda about them is completely false. Uh, and uh, it's this reason that America keeps losing wars. That's why they were beaten in Afghanistan by a bunch of ragheads wearing flip flops. <laughs> you know, so, so, so just understand that much. So when it comes to uh, Edward Snowden, he couldn't even make it in the military. And because he was bumped out of the military, he wound up in intelligence, quote unquote. And then he winds up taking this one poor guy, Bradley Manning, and taking advantage of him. Now, Here's why Bradley Manning is a tragedy, so people understand this. Because of what I've just explained about the military, the military is the same as being in jail. Just as in jail uh, or prison in America, uh, people are raped by other men. Uh, certain men who are effeminate or weak, physically weak, they become prison bitches. They become the rape meat for all the other men who dominate them and the only lucky ones get a lover who protects them, uh, that's, that's what it's like in the military. So what happened with Bradley Manning was he was this effeminate young man who became bitch me, who was raped so much, he decided I might as well become a woman. That's what was going on with Bradley <laughs> Manning. So, so he was victimized by Julian Assange, who said, release all this information that I got yeah. through, mm. you know, uh, Edward yeah. Snowden, and then they victimized him and they were going to use him as a scapegoat while they got away with all the credit. And then what happened was they got busted. And so with Julian Assange, he tried, well, well, with Edward Snowden, Snowden tried to disappear to uh, China. He tried to defect to China. He went to Hong Kong, tried to defect to China, but China wouldn't have him. China said, we don't want you. And that's how he wound up in Russia. So, but, but these men are not necessarily what they appear. They originally were people who were both affiliated with Michael Aquino. So Michael Aquino was the uh, Satanist who was responsible for so many crimes at the Presidio military base. Yes, that is the period we would like to talk about. Uh, at what age did you start working at the Presidio? Did they recruit you? How did you end up there? Well, because, as I explained, I had my father serving in the military for so many years, it's important to emphasize this. When my father retired uh, from the military, he, uh, we moved to San Francisco after spending about a year in New York. Now, understand this. I was born in Taiwan so that people understand the complexity of the military affiliation that I have. I want people to understand that the only reason I'm a United States citizen by birth, I have two birth certificates. One is Chinese, because I was born in the capital of Taiwan, but I was born in the Makai Missionary Hospital. Makai Missionary Hospital, M-A-K-A-I, uh, is one of its romanizations. There's a variety of spellings. But when it came to being born there, because my father was a U.S. serviceman on active duty at the time, at that time he was still on active duty, because I was the son of a U.S. serviceman, I was born a U.S. citizen. Now, this was already a miracle, just so people understand this, because it's important. Um, my father had been part of a class action lawsuit in which many people got together to sue uh, the U.S. military. It was one of the only lawsuits against the U.S. government that was possible at that time because military men had gotten together with officers and enlisted men both cooperating to sue the military because the U.S. military had a law per UCMJ, Uniform Code of Military Justice, that no military serviceman could marry any Asian woman because they couldn't tell the Asians apart. They couldn't tell the Vietnamese, Koreans, or Japanese, 
And because they were always fighting one of the Asians, first the Japanese, then the Koreans, then the Vietnamese and the Chinese, uh, they were fighting all the time. Uh, the end result was they just said, don't marry any of them. It's against military law. And so many officers started committing suicide who were in love with Asian women, as were enlisted men. They called these lovers suicides. They made a movie about this starring Marlon Brando called Sayonara. So people could watch that movie to get an idea of what was going on. So my father was one of many people. They sued the military. Then the Supreme Court of the United States said the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the military law was unconstitutional. And only because of the change in that law was my father able to marry my mother. And when I was born in 1966, the child of a U.S. serviceman, understand that it was only the year before 1965 that America had revoked its miscegenation laws so that people understand in Central Europe, in the United States, it was illegal for a white person and a person of black or Asian ancestry to have children. Any child born who was a half breed of any of those two races was illegal in America. So it was only because they had just revoked that law, thanks to all of the civil rights activities by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And due to the fact that I was born the son of a US serviceman, that I was legal to be in the United States and a US citizen. Otherwise, I wouldn't, I would have not have been here. So when they brought me over to the United States, it was uh, because I was not born on a military base, uh, I could never run for president. Uh, John McCain, who was a famous politician, was born in Panama, but he was born on a military base so he could run for president, just so people understand the absurdity the, of America. So when we came here, we first went to New York, where my father's family was, but his family hated him. They uh, had all the money from their father, who had worked for Kodak Company. Kodak Company was a famous photography company in America, and they had the highest technology at the time in World War II, defense contractor, and um, he was alienated from his family. There were many horrible things that happened that year we were in New York, and he said, I'm going to take my family to San Francisco, and he took us here because we had this big military base. And because I grew up in San Francisco and the Presidio military base is 25% of the city, it's basically 20 a quarter of San Francisco, a quarter of the city of San Francisco is the Presidio military base. Now it wound up having to be closed. It was the most important base in America next to the Pentagon, but it wound up having to be closed because I exposed all these scandals while I was working there. And that was because I was working with Michael Aquino. Now people need to understand that while I was growing up in San Francisco, we didn't live on the base because my father was not active duty. He was retired, but he had access because of his career to the hospital and all the other services. So I could go there until the age of 18, as well as my sister. We could go on the base and go into the movie theater and watch movies much cheaper than we would in a theater outside of the military base. Uh, it's a Tara. And so because we had these privileges, I had, in a very real sense, grown up on the base. But my home was in the poorer area of San Francisco that was called the Tenderloin. It was called the Tenderloin, like Tenderloin Steak, because the it was so dangerous that the police who patrolled that area got hazard pay and could afford Tenderloin Steak every night. So they called it the Tenderloin because it was the money area, the danger area for police patrols. So I grew up surrounded by violence. And I developed, because of the stress, you see in America, when they parole their prisoners, put them into uh, a kind of uh, test of freedom, they don't put them into wealthy neighborhoods, they parole them into areas like the Tenderloin. So prisoners who had just been released from prison would be unleashed, let loose there, and they would try to rape children like me. So I grew up with men trying to rape me. The only way I avoided rape was thanks to the fact that my mother trained me to dress like a girl. See, men get so used to raping other men in prison, they're no longer interested in girls. They're interested in young boys. So <laughs> I would avoid rape by being dressed as a young girl through the majority of my childhood. 
this is important because when I was going to the military base, going to school, oftentimes I was dressed as a young girl, but still the stress was always there. The stress was there because whenever it was discovered that I was a boy, usually men would try to rape me. So I would, uh, I underwent enough stress where I developed an ulcer. Now in the old days, they used to say an ulcer is psychological, that you developed it because of stress. Then some idiot doctor in Australia pumped himself full of this stupid virus, the H. pylori virus, and gave himself an ulcer. Nowadays, they think that H. pylori virus causes ulcers. It's just the opposite. It's the stress makes you vulnerable to the H. pylori virus. So the point is that back then they knew better. And so I was sent to, uh, well, first off, I was bleeding out. And because I had this bleeding duodenal ulcer and I was losing so much blood, now, it turned out I was losing a lot less blood than the doctors told my parents. My parents told, uh, were told by the military doctors because, again, we were at the military hospital. So just so people understand, the Presidio military base had a hospital on it. Letterman Army Medical Center, LAMC, they called it LAMC. Letterman Army Medical Center was where they trained 24% or a quarter of all military doctors in America. And when you join the military as a doctor, the military will pay for your doctor's education, but in return, you have to serve the military as an officer. Now, if you take this route to become a doctor and you say, oh, I wanna become a doctor, but I can't afford medical school because it's so expensive. Then they say, okay, uh, we'll pay for it, but then you have to become a military officer. There's something that happens which most people don't know, you forego the Hippocratic Oath. So in other words, every doctor swears the Hippocratic Oath where I will do no harm. Well, if you're a military doctor and they've paid for your medical education, you forswear that Hippocratic Oath, meaning that you're willing to kill people, uh, develop medical weapons, biological weapons. So what happened was when I was bleeding out at the age of 14, I was 14 years old, and they took me to Letterman Army Medical Center. And what had happened was the blood market had crashed. They didn't have any blood to transfuse into myself. The reason why was because in those days they used to take blood from homeless people and alcoholics and drug abusers. And they would give them like $20 and a donut and then they'd take a pint of their blood. So all the worst people, prostitutes and other people who were infected with diseases would give their blood. And of course, then the blood became full of disease. And then everybody started catching AIDS from blood transfusions. People began to die from blood transfusion. So the blood market crashed. So when the blood market crashed and they had no blood, the medical doctors at Letterman Army Medical Center told my parents, we have synthetic blood we've been experimenting on. Synthetic blood, we call it nanoplasma. And so they told my parents, your son's gonna bleed out and die. If you give us permission, we'll put this nanoplasma in him. But they gave my parents the warning that everyone who had been given it so far had died, but they were much older. And they said, your son's much younger. Uh, the young are pliable, He'll, he might survive. So my parents said, please go ahead and take the risk because otherwise he's going to die. Now I was of course unconscious. I was unaware of any of this. The man who, he put all that blood in me was U.S. Army Medical Corps Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Hagman. His last name is spelled H-A-G-M-A-N-N. -N. Lieutenant Colonel Hagman was a war criminal. He is an American war criminal. He's an American who's experimented on his own medical students. He, anybody can look this up. They took away his medical license. They took away his medical license, and yet he still has his own private company, Deployment Medicine International, which gets hundreds of millions of dollars in defense contracts to continue experiments on human beings. He killed hundreds of people. He took all my blood out and replaced it with some artificial blood that was nanoplasma. This was basically something that literally killed me. I was clinically dead for around 24 to 48 hours, and then I reanimated.
Now, originally I had the rarest blood type in the world I inherited from my mother, one of the rarest blood types, O negative, something that very few people can, you can't transfuse it to other people except other O negatives, basically. Uh, maybe one more blood type could match with it. But when I reanimate it, my blood was O positive, a universal donor. It was like the polarity flipped. And when I came back, I was bleach white, completely white, like Julian Assange. Uh, Asian people think white is the color of death. All the Asians were scared to death of me. Uh, only my mother would love me for several years until my color normalized uh, because basically my bone marrow began to adapt and change the blood uh, and the color finally changed. But this was the crime that was committed under the orders of Michael Aquino. Michael Aquino and Dr. John Henry Hagman at the age of 14 were already monitoring me. They knew about my background. It was Aquino who wanted me to work for him. He made that possible through basically a spy. There was a woman named Leanne Prifty. Prifty is an Albanian name. And in America, they have what they call Radio Free Europe, uh, Radio Liberty. And anyone who grew up in the Soviet satellite states has probably heard of the American propaganda radio, Radio Liberty, Radio Free Europe. This is what she worked for. She was Albanian and she spoke the Illyrian language of Shkipteri. And so the, she was used to broadcast behind the Iron Curtain by the United States State Department. So she worked with the State Department, but at the same time, this was something that she only did a few times a week or a month. She wasn't transmitting every night. So she spent the rest of her days working another job. She worked with the mayor of San Francisco. George Moscone. What had happened was that one day while George Moscone was in the office with a man named Harvey Milk, who was this infamous gay man who had sex with young boys. And there was an Irish Catholic policeman named Dan White who hated him because of that. He couldn't get him arrested because he was called the mayor of Castro Street, which is the gay neighborhood of San Francisco. And because this man was so powerful and the policeman, the retired policeman named Dan White, had his own job taken by this gay guy who he knew was having sex with underage boys. He was so angry that he decided to kill him and the mayor. So one day while Leanne Prifty was working with the mayor of San Francisco, Dan White came in with a gun. She stood in front of him and he pushed her to the ground and said, I'm too much of a gentleman to kill a lady. And then he blew the brains out of the mayor of San Francisco and he blew the brains out of Harvey Milk, who the United States Navy later named a ship after. Now, Leanne Prifty got fired because the woman who came in power was named Diane Feinstein. She was never voted into office. She just became the second in command and inherited the office by chain of command. So she became the mayoress. And she fired Leanne Prifty, who began working at the school I attended. And she told me, hey, there's a job open for the library at Presidio. And since you already have the idea, you know, the ID, ID card, I have an identification card, a military dependence identification card to, for access to the base. Why don't you work there at the library? You, you know, make extra money during the summer. So I started there as a summer job at the age of 16. This was due to this lady spy that I was sleeping with, who was Albanian, who then it turned out worked with Michael Aquino. So Michael there Aquino, was, but, yeah, later yeah, on, what, yeah. Can you tell us before that, what was the nature of the job and what was a typical day in the base as a librarian? Well, it, the job was horrible. <laughs> the first <laughs> thing that you have to understand is that I started off as a librarian's aide which is basically shelving books, but because everyone there, uh, people need to understand this about the government. It's, it's not capitalism. When you're in the US government, you're not working for a private company. So you may as well be in a communist country. It's, you can, 
you know, even the communists are more efficient because at least in communist countries, if you fuck up, they'll kill you. <laughs> in America, they won't do that unless you start killing people in the office. They call it going postal when people go crazy and start killing people. You know, you, they'll send in a squad of police to kill you, but you'll die employed. You'll never be fired. No one ever gets fired from the U.S. government. It takes like an act of God. So everybody there, just imagine a communist bureaucracy where you got where nobody gets killed. That's what American government is like. So you got people who are just totally unemployable in any honest job. These are people who spend all day literally drinking and sleeping and jacking off to porn, masturbating over pornography. I'm not kidding. It, this is like this is all they do all day and get paid for it. <laughs> it's like unbelievable. And so they don't do any work. So I was there and they said, hey, you're the youngest guy. You do the work. And it was like, uh, well, these documents are classified. I'm not even supposed to be touching them. Either you do that work or I'm going to tell the military police you are trying to steal it. Then you'll go to federal jail. No, you do the work. <laughs> so then I do the work. And then it's basically I got to work with more and more classified documents because these people didn't want to do anything. Now, bear in mind, this is a military library, but these are all civilians. They work with the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense is civilian. It's not military. So the military has no control over these people. That's another thing to, to bear in mind. So it's not like military men in uniform are watching them. It's a military men in uniform come in to read the books, but they have no control over the people who are giving them the books to read. So I'm there basically doing all the work. And then there's the other aspect of what I said about the Letterman Army Medical Center Hospital. Now, bear in mind, they had their own library. So was, there was the medical library, the postal library, and this is what's important, is that the state of California is enormous. Everyone knows we have Silicon Valley here, but the state of California is geographically larger than the nation state of Yugoslavia once was. And it's got so many people that our economy is the fifth largest in the world, where our economy is larger than United Kingdom. United, it's like the largest economies in the world are the United States, only because California is a part of it, and then communist China, then the empire of Japan, then United Germany, and then California, and then the United Kingdom. And now California is overtaking United Germany. So our economy is enormous. There's millions and millions of people live here. So we've got one of the largest prison systems in the world. And the highest paid police force in the world is the California prison guards because they have big machine guns in the towers, but none of the prison guards can carry guns inside the prison because then the prisoners will steal their guns and use it to escape. So it's the most dangerous job in the world. You're unarmed and working with dangerous prisoners. So they're the highest paid police force in the world. And they have a deal back when the Presidio military base was open, they had a deal with the US Army. So the US Army said, we need humans for experiments. And so prisoners were given shorter sentences or they were uh, taken off death row. We had death row back then. They were basically sometimes freed from prison if they would agree to go to experiments in the Letterman Army Medical Center on the Presidio military base. So many prisoners were experimented on. That's how they gave them the nanoplasma and many of them died. I was given the nanoplasma and I died too, but then I came back. But most prisoners would wind up dead and never coming back and nobody would care because they were part of the prison system and they had signed their rights away when they agreed to volunteer for experiments they signed their rights away that if they died they that no one could sue the government and no one could protest so many hundreds and hundreds of prisoners died like that now when they were experimenting on them i would have to give them reading material at the library so military police would bring prisoners from letterman army medical center where i would let them select what books they could read but this, of course, was not the classified material. We had the public library, so to speak, that was for anyone could read, like children, prisoners. And then we had the military library, different section. 
Then we had the private company section where I would smuggle materials out of to steal. So this was why you had such a dysfunctional uh, situation. But to describe just how bad it got, uh, Diane Feinstein, who took over as the mayor of San Francisco, she had a Jewish background, but she was an affiliate of Michael Aquino's. We had Michael Aquino being a psychological warfare expert, a man who experimented on people's minds, brainwashing people, conducting mind control experiments. He had unleashed an army of serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, the Night Stalker. These were all serial killers, the Golden State Killer. These were all part of an army of serial killers he had unleashed in California. My own mother had killed a number of them, drained them dry of blood. Michael Aquino knew this. That's why he wanted me on his side. Now, Michael Aquino, who had produced these killers, like the Zodiac Killer, who was seen all over California in a military combat uniform. His footprints were military combat boots was killing women all over San Francisco and California. He was never caught. The Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, was using a gun that the police finally identified, and they were going to catch him with his next murder. He was killing people using the same gun, so they were able to trace it, and they said the next time he kills someone, we'll be able to catch him. That's when Diane Feinstein, the mayor of San Francisco, got on national television and said, they're going to identify the Night Stalker using his firearm. And after that, he changed his firearm with every killing. So the police weren't able to catch him for another several years. That was under Michael Aquino's orders. She did that. Now, when it came to why this is important, I was dealing with a man named Michael Ramirez. Michael Ramirez had been a master sergeant, the highest rank you can achieve as an enlisted man in the army. Uh, serving in the United States Army's Green Berets under Michael Aquino. Now understand, Michael Aquino was a U.S. Army Green Beret. They call him U.S. Army Special Forces. When people think of U.S. Army Special Forces Green Berets, they think of Rambo and they think of John Wayne. But it's all Michael Aquino and Michael Ramirez. And Michael Ramirez was basically in the library and he was always trying to fuck the boys and girls. Go into the children's room. I'd have to keep him out of the children's room. So I knew he'd been sentenced to Letterman Army Medical Center's methadone treatment. Methadone is what they give to heroin addicts. He had picked up a heroin addict in the Vietnam War, his addiction. When I asked him, how did you get caught where the judge sentenced you to methadone treatment? Because most of these guys, they'll kill their families, kill their girlfriends, and they'll get away with it. Nothing's ever done to them. You have to like do it in front of a witness, and it has to be bad enough where the judge says, man, I got to do something about this guy, and then they'll sentence him to something. And he said, well, I killed my wife, but my nephew saw it, and that's how I got caught. And, uh, you know, by the way, he was telling me his life story while I was looking through all these photographs in his shoebox that he had. He had the shoebox he would bring with him full of photographs of all the young girls he had raped and killed in Vietnam. He would rape them and kill them at the same time. In other words, he'd force them to perform oral sex on him while he blew their brains out with a firearm once he orgasmed. Simultaneously, he would ejaculate and blow their brains out at the same time. He would take photographs of himself doing this at the same time. He had this photographs, like also his cutting women up, their bodies up. He was trying to show this to the kids all the time. So I would just send him over to the adults where he could show them off to other adults, try and distract him. That was a, what a day at work was like. All the guys were like this. All the people going into the Presidio military base were child rapists. The, when you're in the American military, you're stationed all over the world, places like the Philippines, where they rape children all the time and there's no punishment. Uh, there's, I knew people who were in the Panama, where they were just bored while during fire training, live fire training, turned a mortar around, 
at a bunch of kids playing soccer near them that they found disturbing. So they blew the kids up with a mortar and just laughed. No punishment was ever done. They just said it was an accident. This is the kind of shit they pull. They're all like this to the point where when I grew up, I, they called me a freak because they had all these magazines, Playboy, Penthouse. None of the soldiers wanted that because they were all into child pornography. I was the only one who would look at the magazines and they'd say, you like that? Them old ladies? They called them bleeders because they started having menstruation. They'd say, you like them bleeders? You know, we like kids who you make bleed. It was, this is what I grew up with. This is, so imagine every day surrounded by people like this. I grew up thinking I was a pervert. It wasn't until maybe I was 25 years old, a quarter of a century old, I realized it's not me, it's them. <laughs> that's that's how violated I felt then. I can't even imagine what it would feel like to be a child raped by them repeatedly. But this is this is what it was like every day working with these these people. But what was important about Michael Ramirez was when he kept trying to get into the children's room and I would distract him by saying, oh, let me see your shoe box, which he was always trying to show the children, taking a look at these photographs. And I'd say, go show it to the guys over there. You know, what I found out was he killed his wife in front of his nephew. And I'd say, did your nephew, uh, who, who was your, you know, did you ever show him these photographs? He'd say, oh yeah, my nephew, he would uh, take these photographs to the cemetery and masturbate over them at nighttime under the moonlight sitting on somebody's grave. And I said, who is your nephew? Uh, the, he says, the one I blew my wife's brains out in front of, that was Richard Ramirez. So it turned out he was the uncle of the Night Stalker, the serial killer. These are the people I worked with every day. So this is very interesting. Uh, I, have, I have two things to say here. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm shocked because uh, you should understand that uh, here in Bulgaria, in Europe in general, we are very impressed by this uh, shiny American Hollywood movies about the army and how competent uh, and um, grand uh, the U.S. Army is. And um, by all words and descriptions, so we understand that uh, we are talking about utter incompetence <laughs> and negligence. And that's how you are able, for example, to smuggle uh, documents. And this is very shocking and uh, hard to, to comprehend. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, I'm aware of your existence since 2011. Uh, I guess uh, long before Peter Moon. And uh, I watch uh, your lectures. Then I, I was totally impressed by your um, competence and uh, your speech and uh, of course i i was not aware who michael aquino is before that but uh, after your lectures i of course uh, researched him and um, since then i felt his vibration two times uh, the first time was when i watched this movie david lynch movie the lost highway yes. uh, i was completely sure that uh, the mystery man character was based on him. It was, yes. And, and the second By the time way, was the actor who portrayed him. The actor who portrayed him murdered his own wife and got away with it. In real yeah. life. Well, and the uh, <laughs> second time was uh, in a horror movie Beyond the Black Rainbow. It's a uh, a very freaky movie about a mysterious mind control project, and there was a mysterious. Uh, uh, character there who who was totally based on Aquino, and uh, I recognized that that vibration purely black magician, and in that context, can you go into depths was of who was Michael Aquino? What was his background? How was he so skilled in the occult, and why did he, did he create the Temple of Set? Thank you. I'll go into that. Uh, I want people to know that the man who played in that Lost Highway was uh, Robert Blake. Uh, Robert Blake was the actor who killed his own wife and got away with it, never spent a day in jail. That's the man who portrayed uh, the character based on Michael Aquino. It's all fitting, all very fitting. Um, as for um, Michael Aquino himself, he was an individual 
who was born to an Italian individual named Michelangelo Aquino, and he was named after his father, but he never had the Roman numeral second after the name, which is very strange. That was never given to him. He was never called Michael Aquino II on paper or otherwise. His um, mother was named Betty Ford. Um, she was actually of some German descent. Now, there was a deep secret he had that he was very ashamed of, that he, between his two parents, one of them had Filipino blood, and it was probably his father, almost <laughs> certainly his father. So he actually was a quarter Filipino, and he never wanted anyone to know that. It was, it was, I was instructed by him so emphatically to always deny his Filipino background that I actually did that reflexively for many years, even after I became a public informant. Um, so the important thing to understand is, again, I use that term to disambiguate myself, to distinguish myself from so-called whistleblowers like Assange and uh, Snowden, who are basically triple agents, people who are uh, half insane that are exploited by intelligence communities to uh, hemorrhage information and then uh, and then become the basically traitors, quote unquote, but they might still be spying for America, even though they've effectively defected or at some point they might be spying for others. These were the kind of people that Aquino produced. Uh, and when it comes to the cult that uh, Assange was a part of, it was called Shanti Nikotan. It's some Hindu or Vedic word for the enlightened or the light people. Uh, again, why their skin was all bleached. All of this was part of mind control experiments that were conducted through Michael Aquino's uh, participation. Uh, people can look up the cult that uh, Julian Assange grew up in, and they were ultimately disbanded by the Australian government. Uh, they were run by a psychiatrist who was actually running an insane asylum and experimenting on their patients. So this is the kind of thing Aquino would be involved with, but he came from this background where he decided that uh, when he was a young man, that, uh, well, first off, he always knew that he was evil. It was, happened because he was born on the night of the Nuremberg hangings. So when it came to um, the Nuremberg hangings, he was someone who was a product of a ritual. So this uh, requires um, some explaining. Understand that the US Army would never have tolerated Michael Aquino if they didn't already have a occult background, a uh, occult involvement. Uh, so you're talking about an army that um, in, in some ways can only win certain battles through the occult, like Operation Desert Storm. So when it ha happens to the, uh, to when they get men who try and perform these rituals of uh, the occult so that they would uh, uh, succeed, they would depend on uh, say, for instance, originally, Dr. John Leslie Groves, or rather General La John Leslie Groves, he had always tried to attain a doctorate, but I don't believe he ever completed one. But General John Leslie Groves was someone who introduced Aquino to the occult, one of the men who did so. He was the man who built the Pentagon. The day that uh, he took a golden shovel for a groundbreaking ceremony where he planted the shovel into the ground and said, we are opening, christening the Pentagon building. It was September 11th, 1941, yeah. just a few weeks before Pearl Harbor and America's official entry into World War II. September 11th, 1941, the anniversary that would later be September 11th, 2001. That is all occult ritual. A great example of the connection 
is that when the Americans invaded the Philippines, that was their original Vietnam War. And it was one of the largest genocides in the 20th century. In fact, it was the largest organized genocide in modern history until the Holocaust. The Americans invaded the Philippines, took over from the Spanish, and they killed three million Filipino Muslims. This is why the Muslims hate the Americans. And when they did this, uh, they were also killing Catholics in the north because the Spanish had Catholicized the northern Philippines. And one of these Filipinos came to America with vengeance and he based his assassination plan on the Koreans. The Koreans had killed this white man the Americans had put in charge of Korea named Durham White Stevens. They killed him with casts on their arms, saying their arms were broken, so their arms were slung in casts that hid their guns. And they killed him right here in San Francisco, and the New York Times said, Koreans killed the American dictator of Korea, who was in charge of Korea at the time, was an American put in charge by the first Korean War back in the 1800s. And so when this Filipino came to America, he killed the American president, William McKinley, on September 11th, 1901, 100 years to the day before September 11th, 2001. He hit his gun in a cast, killed American President McKinley, the man who took over the vice president, Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. He said, we've got to hide this. We can't let anyone know some Asian nigger killed our president. So they burned the body in acid, completely dissolved it. So no one would know he was Filipino. Then hired some Polish family to say it was their son. Cholgaz isn't even a Polish name. It's Filipino that they get from the Spanish colonies. And the man they claimed was Polish had already killed himself. So there was no evidence. The family had already hated this son. He was mentally disturbed, killed himself. So they took government money to say their son was the man who killed the president. They didn't care. And so the Americans said, oh, a Polish communist killed our president. The Soviet Union didn't even exist then. Now, that was September 11th, 1901. General Leslie Groves had the Pentagon groundbreaking ceremony on September 11th, 1941. And then what happened? They put all the Japanese in concentration camps during World War II. Only one Japanese was let free, aside from the ones who served in the American military. If the Japanese vo volunteered to serve in the American military, they were basically the suicide units. They would let them out of the concentration camps. Otherwise, they threatened to kill their families. But the one Japanese guy who was allowed to roam completely free without joining the military was Yamasaki, an architect. He later on built the American National oh, Records gosh. Center for all military records. And he built the Twin Towers. So this Japanese guy with his family was allowed to run free as a cockroach throughout World War II without being in the military because they had him build the National Records Center in St. Louis, Missouri, which he built without any fire extinguishers, without any fire escape, without any fire control implements or alarms. And that way they put all the military records in there for all the GIs. And then after the Vietnam War was over, they burned it to the ground. And so all the records were destroyed of military personnel in the Army and the Marine Corps in particular. But so were all the records of important people like Lee Harvey Oswald, who killed the U.S. President John F. Kennedy, like Elvis Presley and L. Ron Hubbard, or the man who killed Martin Luther King Jr., all their medical records destroyed. All burned to the ground thanks to the architecture of this Japanese architect, Yamasaki, working for the U.S. government. Then he built the Twin Towers. Then they took them down on September 11th, 2001. He built them to fall apart. That's your U.S. government for you. That's your U.S. military. All part of the occult rituals of sacrifice of generals like Leslie Groves. Only through men like that was Aquino allowed to come to such power.
Then Aquino, as a young man, he decided, well, the reason he knew he was evil was because of the Nuremberg hangings. October 16th, 1946, the night that he was born, the Americans said, we're going to bring the Antichrist into the world. Now, the man who hanged all of the Nuremberg criminals was this serial killer, John C. Woods. John C. Woods was in the Navy. My father knew him. My legal father, the man who raised and guided me, my father had him dishonorably discharged, meaning he was kicked out of the Navy as a criminal. Theoretically, he should never have been able to gain employment ever again. My father reported him for raping and killing young girls. John C. Woods during World War II reported to the army and said, I'm the guy that George Dietrich, son of a bitch, had kicked out of the Navy for killing and raping all those young girls to death. And the army said, step right up. We're going to make you a master sergeant. They made him the highest rank you could make an enlisted man immediately. Even though theoretically, he should never have been allowed to hold the job. He was the man who hanged all the criminals. They called war criminals at Nuremberg. He had hung hundreds of Germans all over World War II. He was a sadistic serial killer who made certain the noose was always loose so that we'd take hours to die. He would sit there and masturbate while they kicked and jerked until they finally died, taking hours before the life left them. All of the people at Nuremberg took hours to die. It took all day to kill them in 12 hangings. Only there weren't 12 hangings because Hermann Goering suicided. Martin Bormann escaped. There were only 10 men that they had left to hang. And John C. Woods hanged them all. Later on, he was transferred into the Pacific where the Germans were helping the Americans build the hydrogen bomb. All the German scientists hated him. Now, the man who raised me was German descent. He hated him too. And so one day while my dad was there, this was the reason he was sterile, was being at all those atomic bomb tests in those Pacific islands, from Bikini Atoll to Inuitok. So one day when he caught John C. Woods alone, he threw an electrical cable at him while he was in the water. Well, he pushed him into the water and threw an electrical cable to him because he was drowning and he was screaming for help. He said, throw me a line. And my dad threw him a cut electrical cable and he burned alive in the water. When my father reported to the officers, he thought he was going to go to jail the rest of his life. But the officers said, sit down, Mr. Dietrich. And they said, we understand you were witness to the death of Mr. Woods. And he said, yeah, I lit him up like a Christmas tree. He burned like a light bulb. Then the officer said, you said he was trying to light a Christmas tree, screwing in a light bulb. <laughs> and my dad said, yeah, yeah, that's what I said. And they said, you can leave, Mr. Dietrich. And so that was because they had to satisfy the German scientists so they wouldn't get their help. That was how they placated them. So my father's murder was something they took, or rather my father's murder of John C. Woods was something they took advantage of. Now, that night of the sacrifice, when John C. Woods hanged all those so-called war criminals at Nuremberg, 10 men who died, because they didn't hang 12 men for the occult ritual to bring in the Antichrist into the world, instead the arbinger of the Antichrist, the herald, the imperfect Antichrist who would herald the coming of the real Antichrist came into the world. That night, Betty Ford delivered a blue baby. She gave birth to a dead baby. The blue baby was completely blue not alive, and that was a baby they disposed of. Then a few hours later, it started crying in the disposal unit, and they pulled it out of the disposal unit and said, a miracle, the baby's alive. That was Michael Aquino. 
So Michael Aquino always told me, the baby never came back to life, of course. I'm really a demon that inhabits this human's body. And like you, I'm not really human. Did so he tell you he his name? Secure. I'm sorry? Which de- Michael Aquino. No, the, de- the demon. The name he would never give because that would give me his power. Oh, yeah. So it was something that he always kept to himself. That's one of the few things I never found out from Michael Aquino. There was plenty he never wanted me to find out that I did. But I never did know the name of the demon. So the, you think he, that because he, uh, because of uh, this entity, he, uh, uh, he was uh, so skewed in black magic? Of course. Yeah. Of course. And um, so then what happened was he decided, uh, since he was born evil, he decided that his dedication in life was to be uh, too evil. And um, as a young man, when he had joined the army, he joined the U.S. Army Special Forces Psychological Warfare Unit. And then when he was on leave, just fresh out of training, he went to see Rosemary's Baby, which was a movie that had used the founder of the First Church of Satan, and the Magus, Anton Zandor LaVey, as their consultant. In fact, it's Anton Zandor LaVey's eyes that are used as the eyes of Rosemary's baby, the devil child in that film. Mm. So he was there to see the opening of the film, Anton LaVey, and Aquino was there too. And he went there specifically to meet Anton LaVey at the opening of his film. That's where he converted, joined the first church of Satan. And later on, he severed from the first church of Satan to establish the temple of Set. There were two reasons for this, two major reasons. One was that uh, the Magus Anton Zandor LeVay was carrying out what he felt to be the logical ultimate endpoint of Jewish subversion. Very important to emphasize that the original Karl Marx, the original prophet of communism, the philosopher of nihilism, meaning a belief in nothing, that nothing matters, that there's no afterlife, was Karl Marx. But his original name was Rabbi Levi. Rabbi is a name. It's not just the name of a theological or religious position. And Karl Marx developed godless communism, atheistic, materialist communism. Then there was the philosopher who was known as Ayn Rand. She originally had a Russian name. She was of Jewish descent. She changed it to the pen name Ayn Rand and developed the philosophy of godless atheistic capitalism. So what Anton LaVey did was he said he took that Ayn Rand's godless capitalism philosophy, made it the foundation for his Satanism simply by adding magic because he said his Satanism was atheistic. He didn't believe there was a real Satan, that Satan is a concept that you find within you, that you are the true evil, that you can attain power by giving up belief in a God or Satan, and therefore there's no repercussions. And therefore, everything you do, you will never be punished for, and therefore you can do anything you want. This was Anton Zandor LaVey's philosophy, And it was the logical outcome of Jewish subversion from godless communism to godless capitalism to finally atheistic Satanism. Now, he did not believe in churches having tax exemption. In the United States, all churches have tax exemption. He, Anton LaVey, proudly paid taxes and said that churches should be taxed. Now, Our man, uh, Michael Aquino, our demon, said he wanted none of that taxpaying bullshit. So he started his own church that would be tax exempt. (laughs) So he wouldn't have to pay taxes. But beyond that, there was a theological disagreement where he said 
Anton Zandor LeVay doesn't believe in the devil or demons. And I know I'm one. So I believe in devils and demons, and I know they're real. So he believed in a theological Satan and therefore organized the Temple of Set around the theological belief of the original Set, Set N. Set N of ancient Egypt was, well, the name Cairo, the capital of Egypt, means place of battle. That was where Horus battled Set and destroyed him. And Satan was exorcised from the material world, exiled to the deserts. God of the night and the deserts and pestilential foreigners, Sethan, from whence we derive the term Satan. Sethan communicated with Michael Aquino, and that's why he organized the Temple of Set. But it's important to remember that this is not to be confused. Say, for instance, the very name for evil, Edom. Well, the Edomites were the race from which Herod was derived. Herod, who the Romans installed as the king of Israel, who tried to kill your God if you're a Christian. Herod tried to kill the young Jesus by ordering every firstborn son to be killed in Israel. And Herod knew that Jesus was the heir to the Davidian throne. And therefore, if Jesus lived, he would have the right claim, the righteous claim to his throne, Herod's throne. So Herod was an Edomite. Adam is the word red. Adam is the word red. Adam was the first white man. He was called red because only white people can blush. No other race on earth can blush. Only white people are pale enough to have blood in the face. Uh, to have a flush effect. And when they're naked, they blush over their entire body. So Hunt's Adam was termed red. Uh, Adam, Edom, very different things, but basically the same name. Seth, which from which we get the name Satan, was also the name of the righteous third son of Adam. When Abel killed Cain, it was the righteous third son of Adam, Seth, who was told by his father to go east. Adam said, and this is in the book, The Revelation of the Magi, which was translated by the professor, Brent Landau, who then uh, explained to everyone uh, that the Chinese were the first Christians before the Jews, rather than Christianity evolving from the Jewish people, it really sources out of China. It's important to recognize that Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve, he was given the prophecy that the Christ would return and provide redemption in every land to every people. It was Seth who carried that word to the Chinese. But the mages, the monks, who preserved that word in their mountain monasteries were the vampire kings of China. This is why they were considered magical. They were of that subspecies of humanity. So they carried on the prophecy of the return of Christ. That's how they were able to coronate the Christ uh, when they basically invaded Roman Israel to anoint him. That's how, that's what the term Christ means, the anointed. That's how he got his title. Now, when it came to uh, Michael Aquino and what he knew about me, he knew that Adolf Hitler had tried to give the subspecies of humanity known as the vampire their own homeland. This was to be uh, the north of Beograd, the north of Belgrade, known as uh, the Vojvodina region. Of course, in uh, Magyarozag or Hungary, they call it the Banatka, the Banat, the military frontier between Romania and Serbia and Hungary. All of this was to be united into a vampire gaul, 
uh, Gao being a district of the Reich. It was in under German occupation throughout World War II for that reason, as opposed to being under a puppet government. Meanwhile, the Vatican was aware of this, and the Vatican had their own empire under the Franciscans. The Franciscan monks were the dominant Catholic group in Croatia, Kravatska, and the Duke of Lepanto, the uh, Duke of Italy, one of their dukes, was made the king of Croatia. And this was Vatican territory. It wasn't Mussolini's own territory. Mussolini had recognized the Vatican as a city state, an independent nation. Their empire was greater Kravatska, greater Croatia. This was the last great Catholic crusade. They were to convert a third of the population, kill a third of the population, and expel, deport, or ethnically cleanse the remaining third. So Greater Croatia, Greater Kravatska was technically an Italian kingdom, or rather a kingdom under an, uh, one of the Dukes of Italy that was to become the King of Croatia, the Duke of Lepanto. And then uh, as for its, well, it speaks for itself. It was the only nation in Europe where the Roman Catholic nuns in Duvno and Lubnaz, they had organized concentration camps for children. These were the only concentration camps explicitly and exclusively for children in all of Europe. They ran that kingdom beneath the other Gao that was to become Bloodland or the land of the vampire. This was the formation of various parts of Europe under different spheres of influence at the time of the Reich. When it came to what Hitler got in return for offering the vampires their own land was their blood, which was transfused into him by Dr. Theo Morel. Dr. Theo Morel called this the Bulgarian treatment. And it was something that basically converted Hitler to a vampire physiology. That's why Dr. Theo Morel wrote in his diaries that Der Fuhrer's blood, the leader's blood, had turned beer brown as if he had been drinking blood. This is the way that Hitler readied himself for an extended lifespan so he could escape. Why now, was it called this the Bulgarian treatment? You know, knew all of this. I'm sorry. What, why was it called the Bulgarian treatment? It was the Bulgarian alchemists who basically shared with Dr. Theo Morel. His actual name was Morelli. Dr. Theo Morelli was really Italian. And so he had a greater connection with the Balkans than any normal German would. And Hitler himself was Austrian, also very connected to the Balkans. They were both very steeped in occult history. But in terms of the Bulgarians, I think very few people understand how important Bulgaria was to Adolf Hitler. To put this into some perspective for people, why this is so important. Uh, when it comes to uh, Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, it's named after the goddess of wisdom, really the goddess period, the goddess of Christianity, really. And therefore, what a lot of people didn't understand was that uh, much was done to try and relieve Sofia from the Soviet invasion, that uh, they did their best to try and uh, uh, make certain that Bulgaria remained loyal to the Reich and the Axis for as long as possible. Uh, it became uh, a great theater of uh, battle for the Reich, but I think that um, perhaps one of its important contributions as far as Adolf Hitler was concerned was their alchemy. As a matter of fact, it's important to remember that even though 
the Czech Republic might be considered the weapons producers of Europe with Škoda weapons works. The real arsenal of Europe is Bulgaria. They produce the ammunition. So Bulgaria was and is invaluable. It will help decide the future of Europe. In the past, many of its secrets, the reason it became the arsenal. Well, during the days of the Roman Empire, Julius Caesar was about to conquer Parthia before he was assassinated. His next war was with today's Persia. He wanted to conquer Parthia so he could have access to China. Because in China, they had what the Roman Empire called fulminatum, gunpowder. If Caesar had conquered Parthia, gained access to Chinese gunpowder, the Roman Empire would still be around today. But instead, he was assassinated. However, the men who had brought the news of fulminatum, of gunpowder, from out of Asia through the Silk Road, well, they relocated themselves into Bulgaria. This made them alchemists as they carried on their tradition. Somewhere along the line, they merged with the vampire. And it was this that Dr. Theo Morel had learned of and therefore learned of the fact that if you could transfuse enough vampire blood into a baseline human being, they would physiologically become, well, almost like a damp fire, like a half breed like myself. This is what Hitler became, thanks to Dr. Theo Morel. This is why Theo Morel was only told by Hitler to leave at the last minute. And it wasn't because Hitler was angry with him or expelled him because he hated him or had any argument. Rather, he wanted him to survive the Battle of Berlin. So he told him, get out of here, leave immediately. He wanted him to survive. That was the reason that um, he expelled Theo Morel uh, forcibly from the bunker once the Bulgarian treatment was done. And that was days before his escape. Because of Aquino's background, probably because of his extrasensory perceptions as well, being a demon, he understood what had happened, plus all the secret documents we were dealing with many of which I was ordered to destroy so that no one else would have their secrets. Yeah, what was your job for him as, a, as an occult librarian? What I had to do for him was he wanted many spell books. These spell books are usually one of a kind. Most of them were produced in the days before the printing press. And of course, once the printing press was developed, you're talking about a technology that was usually in some form of state or church control. It wasn't something that one could reproduce occult grimoires or spell books on in the early days. So these were usually produced by hand. And uh, the very term grimoire means grammar. Uh, it's a spell book because words cast spells. That's why we call it spelling. And uh, these were often writ in human blood on skin, oftentimes human skin, sometimes what they called kid skin or virgin skin from a kid goat, uh, the child goats producing what they called vellum. Uh, the vellum paper being the most prized kind of paper in the world at that time. And so these books would often be old. Sometimes the blood would have dried in such a manner that the pages would stick together and opening the book would destroy it. It would take someone with tools, uh, technology, to kind of heat the pages, steam them, uh, then open them slowly, this sort of thing. Mostly they're kept in refrigerators. So you're talking about museums and academies. Keep these books where no one has shown them because it would be offensive, human skin and human blood after all. So the majority of these books are truly secret and maintained 
in refrigeration in universities and museums that Aquino could access because he had an international security clearance, not simply a national security clearance, but because he was a commander in NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and he was a member of the World Affairs Council, he had an international security clearance. So he would say this is an international security issue. So he could get loans of these books from academies as far away as South Africa, Australia, various places where some of these grimoires wound up, uh, Europe, England, and he had occult churches he opened in England. These were what they called pylons of the Temple of Set. But there he was able to merge and cooperate with the old Hellfire Club. The Hellfire Club, of course, was the cult of the elite, the nobles and the decadent and debauched uh, degenerate rich of the British Empire. These were people who thrived off human sacrifice. These were people who were responsible for the great hedge of India during the days of colonialism, where they literally took the Asian Indian subcontinent and quartered it, divided it into four with, well, a super massive hedge row. The, for people who don't understand the dynamics of hedges, just a short divergence here, uh, when it came to uh, World War II, the Americans had more casualties in what they called hedgerow hell, the Bocage area of France, the in-depth defense developed by General Erwin Rommel before he was killed in war. That in-depth defense killed more Americans than Americans died at D-Day. That's because inside of these hedges, the Germans could hollow them out and hide machine gun teams. The British grew hedgerows throughout their history. They went down to India, and in the tropical environment, they mutated these hedgerows into the size of the Great Wall of China. And thousands of miles of them divided the north and south from each other, all four corners. And with that, they were able to control who got medicine, who got food, who got salt to preserve their food, which was the only refrigeration they had in those days. And they decided who lived or died. That great hedge of India was responsible for the death of 100 million people. These were all human sacrifices to the British, the elite, the Hellfire Club that Aquino merged his temple of Set with. We have here a history of allied genocide that my biological sire, Adolf Hitler, was fighting against. When it came to the entire situation of what the I was doing for Aquino with the grimoires and textbooks written at these times of mass sacrifice, many of these Asian Indians who were died, well, it was, understand this, all of the skeletons all over the world in medical laboratories, universities, by United Nations agreement, they all come from India. This was how we had the development of mad cow disease. Basically what happened was India as part of the British Commonwealth, having once been a colony, what do they do with all the imperfect skeletons? Everyone wants a skeleton or a skull with perfect teeth. Statistically, I know I could make a safe bet Neither Milko or Simeon have perfect teeth. I don't, and I'm half vampire. Well, a quarter. <laughs> so <laughs> I can tell you, it, only in a population of over a billion people like India, are you going to get enough young people dying at a young enough age where you get a skeleton with perfect teeth. That's why by United Nations agreement, all skeletons come from India, from what they call skeleton farms. Now, what do they do with the imperfect skeletons? Well, they turn them into bone meal. They did for the longest time, and they gave them to the British to feed to their cows. This is cannibalism, indirectly. The British eating the meat of cows that were eaten from bone meal of dead Asian Indians. That's how they caught the mad cow disease. That's why British beef is illegal to sell in the United States and Europe. So when it came to this kind of madness of cannibalism and mass sacrifice, much Indian blood and human skin went into writing spell books. 
a lot of what was the feeling to, of dealing with uh, such a such documents i'm sorry what was the feeling of dealing of, with such documents oh thank you just to explain when aquino would order them from india are places where he said this is an international security issue that has to deal with terrorism and as a member of the British Commonwealth, the Asian Indians should share these documents that they're hiding from their own public because it would cause outrage uh, to see that these books had been made from their own people's skin and blood. Uh, he said this has to deal with terrorism out of Pakistan or something like that. So I need to get these books on loan. So they would send them on loan. They could only come to the library and never leave the library. So for that reason, I would see Aquino use them to perform his occult rituals in the library when I was working there at night destroying documents. I had to work there at night destroying documents because if I destroyed them in the daytime using the incinerator, then the heat in the library would be unbearable for anybody working or any of the visitors. So I had to do that at night. Uh, that was when the entire library was heated and it felt like the temperatures of hell itself, which I, Aquino felt was ideal. He and his followers would be naked under their robes and naked under their robes are sometimes completely naked. They would perform their rituals using these occult grimoires. Of course, when you touch a book that's made out of human skin that could disintegrate into dust if it's not handled correctly, whose pages would tear if you open it because the blood would stick together after many generations. You are dealing with the fact that you need to steam it, uh, then open it slowly, otherwise keep it refrigerated. Uh, you're opening it with very delicate tools. And it's, it's uh, you're, you're de basically dealing with an archeological artifact and you can feel the power. You can feel the book has a life of its own. These are, I, I understand this, when you're dealing with Lao Tzu, the man who wrote the book, the I Ching, the, um, the, no, the Tao, the book of the Tao. He, he expressed in that book that weapons have a life of their own. You feel it. There's something about a weapon that makes it different from any other tool. You can pick up any tool for work, a chainsaw, a shovel. You don't get the same feeling that you get when you pick up a sword or a gun. Anything made to take a human life has a life of its own because it feeds off the life of something else. The Japanese understand this through the Shinto and the understanding that inanimate objects have life. So these books have a life, and their own soul, and in a very real sense, they can speak to you and in a sense, possess you. So they're very dangerous. But uh, do you have any stories of various uh, magical manifestations or different rituals performed at the base? Yes. Uh, one night when I was uh, the night of the broken circle, as I call it, there were many other nights like this, just so people understand. One night when Michael Aquino and his coven, these were all high officers. We're talking about officers uh, that are above the level of lieutenant. We're talking about captains, colonels, generals. Michael Aquino had converted the entire officer class to Satanism. To put this into perspective, so our listeners understand, Michael Aquino wrote the chaplain's handbook for the United States military services. The chaplain's handbook is used by all branches, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, so the chaplain's handbook gives specific orders that Satanism and witchcraft be recognized and that if any Jewish rabbi or Roman Catholic priest or uh, Protestant deacon, any of these religious figures is administering to the troops, they're ordered to step back and stand down whenever a satanic chaplain arrives on scene because Satanism is the unofficial religion of the United States military. This meant that as the man who wrote the chaplain's handbook, Michael Aquino was recognized officially as the US military satanic chaplain, meaning he had access to all bases, Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard. He could go on any base because he was the religious leader of the US military. 
So we're talking about an enormously powerful individual. And because of his domination of the unofficial religion of the US military, for those who doubt me, there's a video on YouTube, very respectable, very professional, called The Dark Side of Aldura. In The Dark Side of Aldura, it opens, well, Aldura is a place, a region in Iraq. And um, it opens that documentary with the man who was effectively the man who ran the US government during the administration of George Bush Jr., the younger Bush, who was effectively an idiot, a man who could technically not even read or write. And we can agree so, here. <laughs> I'm sorry? We can agree here. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. And so the man who was really running America at that time, uh, unofficially, was Dick Cheney. And that documentary opens with Dick Cheney saying, we have to turn to the dark side. We must go to the dark side. And the dark side of Aldura presents a young US Army Ranger who is appalled by the fact that everyone around him is conducting human sacrifices. Now there's photographs, and this is on YouTube, it's accessible, people can find it. You'll find the photographs where he took photographs of his fellow soldiers breaking open boys skulls they don't ever want to do this to a girl they don't want the estrogen they only want the testosterone from the young boys they would crack open their skulls and eat their brains this is satanic consecration their version of a satanic eucharist and so because he reported this to his superiors they said, you ignorant fool, this is our religion. How dare you try to turn us in? And so they put him in a prison, beat him half to death, brain damaged him, sent him home so crazy he killed his own girlfriend. The judge said, he's so crazy I can't even send him to prison. Just turned him over for his father to take care of. And then he died in his father's company walking down a beach like somebody pressed a switch. That was a magical occult attack, took his life. Anyone can see this in the dark side of Aldura and get the full story. And I'm giving you the real full story, the context he never had, and even the makers of the documentary didn't have. What he was seeing and photographing was satanic chaplaincy at work, the chaplains of Michael Aquino. And so Michael Aquino, he served in the safe goal, the same Gulf War I served in, Operation Desert Storm. And I served as an enlisted Marine. He served as a colonel. The last service he provided the United States military before he was forced out of the army for all the crimes he committed and laterally transferred to intelligence, the NSA, the National Security Agency, where he ultimately retired at the civilian equivalent of a rank of general what's called a super grade, a deputy director of the NSA, the National Security Agency. That was when he called upon Cthulhu. But yes, let me first explain. One night while he called upon the angel of death to assassinate an enemy, he had a wax hand. He had, his agents had collected the enemy's fingerprints. The usual old trick, have the enemy seduced by a young girl who gives him a wine glass when he's drunk enough all the fingerprints are on it they were saved and they produced a wax hand with his fingerprints identical on the wax hand this wax hand was placed on a table his men gathered around it and conducted the chant because i was destroying documents at night had the incinerator on I was in area while they were conducting this ritual of assassination. I had seen them set it up. I had gone back to my job, burning documents. These incinerators are large enough to stick a human body in. If you fall inside, you'll die. I then realized I was very close to burning myself alive because I couldn't feel the heat from the fire anymore. The entire night had gone cold, unnaturally cold. The flame was burning at full force. 
If I had hurled myself into the flames, I would have burned alive. But no heat. Almost to the point where, but did get to the point where I almost put my hand through it just to see if I, something was wrong. I put my hands close enough to the fire where I burned myself, but I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel anything at all. It was one of these things where the night had gone black and the other thing I noticed about the fire, it wasn't generating any heat or light. In other words, even though I was blowing it for all force and you could see the flames, there was none of the light in the room. The room had gone black. Not that the lights had gone out. No, the room went black. No fizzing of the lights like you see with the uh, lights that just kind of fizzle and, and then incandescent. They go out after a while. They're getting weak. It's no, just black. Everything was black. I pulled out my flashlight and it didn't provide any beam of light. It wasn't that the batteries weren't working. You could see the light when you pointed it at your eyes, but you didn't feel the pain you feel when you point a flashlight at your eyes. The room was just black, pervasive. Everything, a blackness had entered the building. Now, when I had left the man where they were chanting, around the wax hand. There were 12 men on one side, Michael Aquino the 13th on the other, but it was as if they had switched places. Michael Aquino's single voice was coming from the 12 men on one side of the room, and all 12 of their voices were coming out of the mouth of the single man, Michael Aquino, at the other end of the room. He was speaking with the voice of 12 men, they spoke with the voice of one. This I saw with my own eyes in the blackness that had taken over the building because they had summoned the angel of death into the room around the wax hand, which could no longer be seen, enveloped in that blackness, that inky blackness that had taken over the entire library. All I heard was the voices in the cold. All heat sapped from the environment. What were they saying? They were chanting in the old tongues, the dead languages. These were the languages that they had been trained in to speak backwards. This is a form of Aramaic, uh, sometimes Syriac, uh, sometimes Latin or Greek. These were often in the form of Enochian. Enochian being the most common. Hmm. And oftentimes these would be read backwards. This takes a lot of skill and practice that Aquino would force his men to train in. That's why people who were part of the Temple of Set had to be very literate. He had a reading list a mile long, would update it weekly. Most people couldn't keep up with it. So you had to be someone who was very academic to be part of the Temple of Set. These were highly educated people. This is why they were all commissioned officers. So when it came to Michael Aquino and the people involved with him, the language they were speaking would be unintelligible to most. But most definitely a language. So when it came to what they were saying, summoning the angel of death, well, they succeeded. A phone rang. I was told to answer it. Then asked Michael Aquino to respond, told him it was for him. At which point he received the good news, quote unquote, that their target had died. And uh, this was from a spy they had watching the target's home, reporting the ambulance had come to pick him up. His family was crying. He was obviously dead. Their calling on the angel of death had succeeded. Now, people might remember that Adolf Hitler originally had a program to euthanize the retarded, 
the mentally incompetent, the developmentally disabled in the Reich. And this you this euthanasia program. He canceled it. People might not be aware that at. There was early in the Reich, he had to stop the program. Nobody ever talks about this. There's a reason for it. People might wonder how come people in Europe during the Middle Ages when life was hard and you could hardly afford to keep people around who were mentally incompetent or retarded or developmentally disabled, how come they kept breeding to the point where there was always a subpopulation of them around? It wasn't just because of the generosity of the church saying have mercy on the weak. It was because they act as kind of a protection against the demonic. They have an incorruptibility of the soul. This is something that was proven to Adolf Hitler. And that's why he stopped their killing. It was one of these things that was found out because of the occult mercenary Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley was dispatched by the British government to sabotage the Germans in World War I and the Italians in World War II. At the time, Mussolini was considered a far greater threat than Hitler. When the man known as Alistair Crowley began to use the kind of attacks that Aquino was using to kill people in the Reich, it was Dr. Karl Maria Willigut, who most people have never heard of, an SS officer of the occult, who convinced Hitler that the retarded were kept by the kings of the Middle Ages to protect them from occult assault by enemy sorcerers. Therefore, the, the developmentally disabled act as a security asset against even the angel of death. This is why Aquino hated the retarded. If that man he had targeted had had a developmentally disabled person in the vicinity, he probably would not have died. This is one of the reasons that Hitler communicated such to Mussolini and Mussolini had Alistair Crowley expelled from Italy and said it was he would never be able to return again. He would be arrested if he was ever caught. The same with the Reich. They recognized that someone like Alistair Crowley was an occult assassin. A Crow Crowley had to work from Britain after that to conduct his spells. But this brings us back to the importance of, say, for instance, the SS. Carl Maria Willigut was a member of it. Otto Dietrich of the press was a member of it. The SS was very different from the German Wehrmacht. The German Wehrmacht were the armed forces, Luftwaffe, uh, the Air Force, the Kriegsmarine, the War Navy, the, uh, the, the, the Army. All of these constituted the Wehrmacht, and these people fought for the nation state. They fought for the old traditional concept of the nation state. It's a relatively new concept, actually. In the Middle Ages, you would be fighting for Christendom. But in terms of their national orientation, the SS was very different. The SS did not fight for the nation state at all. The SS fought for the race. They understood the concept that the Americans had conducted racial warfare, the genocide of entire peoples, the three million Muslims in the Philippines, the entire Native American population. They understood that the war the Americans fought was a racial war, the war of the Freemasons. The Freemasons boast that they were responsible for the sinking of Atlantis. When the Freemasons developed their own nation in America, the Germans established their own under a rival Bavarian 
Illuminati. The Illuminati are propagandized by the Americans as being the source of all evil. Robert Anton Wilson wrote a series of books, the Illuminati franchise, in which Robert Anton Wilson portrays them as Nazis. Robert Anton Wilson took his middle name from Magus Anton Zandor LaVey, the founder of the First Church of Satan, whom Robert Anton Wilson considered his magical father because they had a sodomy relationship. That's why he propagandized being a Freemason against the Bavarian Illuminati. Both Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill were Freemasons. Whereas the SS was the heir to the Bavarian Illuminati, the organization created to fight Freemasonry. The real war in the world of Europe is between the Bavarian Illuminati, which produced the SS, and the Freemasons. These are two great influences of the occult. When the SS fought for the race, the preservation of a European race, they understood and respected other races. Therefore, the SS had racial units from all over the world, including Asian Indian racial units, including units that from, from nations that were Slavic. These were racial units fighting a racial war as opposed to the old fashioned national war of the armed forces. This is why the SS was such a devastating force in the field and why they conducted the kind of war that they did against the communists and the Americans and why the communists and the Americans hated them so much and feared them. So when it comes to the legacy of that war, this is what Aquino was afraid of. This is why on my birthday, back in 1982 or 83, October 19th, my birthday Eve day, through the night into my birthday, October 20th, Back in 1982, he conducted a ritual at Wevelsburg Castle, the castle of the SS in Germany, using his security clearance as a NATO commander to not only conduct a binding ritual to try and shield the resurgence of the old gods that the SS had fought to bring back, he also conducted as a binding ritual on myself hoping to make me the heir to his temple of Set. These rituals backfired. The ritual backfired because of the Night of the Broken Circle, another ritual that was conducted without his being present. Why do you call it that? What happened was these officers who were in the cult of Aquino, these officers who were part of his coven, they got drunk one night, decided they were going to summon one of the most powerful entities to make them powerful. They went into the armory and they took the old M16s. These are old military rifles. They used to have wooden stocks, the first ones produced. After that, they were all produced with metal stocks or rather plastic fiberglass, this kind of real cheap plastic. Uh, there's very few metal parts on an M16. You'd be surprised. They're really just matte black plastic pieces of shit. <laughs> but the old wooden M16s were made for a reason. The Americans fighting in Vietnam got rid of their old M14 rifles, which used to be well tested, battle proven, accurate. Uh, they wanted rifles that could be handled by underfed, malnourished, third world people that were much shorter than Americans. Effectively, the size and physical capacity, capacity of an American child 
So they contracted Mattel Toys. Truly a toy company was involved here. With Colt originally producing the wooden stocked real M16, Mattel Toys later on took over and produced the plastic ones that had metal parts that you could use in combat, quote unquote. This was so Vietnamese soldiers could use them. Now, these were being used by the officers on a night where they were just testing out some new silencers for automatic weapons. This was cutting edge technology at the time. A uh, silencer is traditionally something you use once and you throw away because you can't use it after that. Um, but these were silencers for automatic weapons. This was advanced technology. So you could fire repeated times. And so they were taking this out, testing their silencers in the playground right next to the Presidio military base. They hung a bunch of child mannequins up that were taken from the first aid station. The first aid station, the child mannequins where you practice CPR on a child size mannequin. They hung those upside down, swing in on a, the old uh, swings that they had in the playground that also served as the football goalposts. They hung those mannequins there and were firing at them in the dark. So they wanted to be able to hit them. So they summoned Meliuk Tausch, the peacock angel, Lucifer himself, to imbue them with night vision. They cut their own hands, did a blood ritual, drew the circle of blood. And they didn't complete the circle. It was not closed. A broken circle. The circle didn't contain the entity they called forth. Maliuk Tausch, the peacock angel. Again, I was there that night. There was only 12 men. They needed a 13th name in their book of blood. They wrote mine into it without consulting myself. I was in, inculcated into their spell. I was working the, I knew what they were doing. There was nothing I could do about it. They're officers. I'm a civilian. I'm outside the chain of command. So I went back to incinerating and again, the interference with the sensation that something had gone terribly wrong. Everything goes cold, only worse than the angel of death, in a sense. This time inside, I couldn't feel anything. Whereas before it was more of, I couldn't feel anything from outside. This time it was, I don't know if you've ever had a blood transfusion. Well, the time that I had that full body blood transfusion, I was not conscious, but I've had some blood transfusions when I was conscious for reasons that would take an entire story behind to explain. And a blood transfusion is one of the most painful things you can get. It's usually frozen plasma. They've just thawed out and the blood just uh, really hurts. Just like going into your vein, it is painful. It is, imagine that over your entire body, that feeling that something has replaced your blood that's ice cold. That's how I felt. <laughs> then the flames weren't generating any heat. Then there's no noise. None of the crickets, none of the night owls, none of the sounds of night. Everything went silent as if nature had vacated the premises. When I went outside where the men were firing with their full auto machine guns on silencer, this kind of silent chortling at these swinging child, hanging child figures in the dark, all their eyes were glowing like a nocturnal predators, like a vampire's. Now a nocturnal predator reflects all light in area. They have more light cones in their eyes so that they can see in the dark. They reflect light from moonlight, ambient light. That's what was going on with these men. Human eyes don't do that. So when they began and reflect, I knew just by looking at them, they were possessed. And um, I said, the circle is broken. Just so people understand who are not spellcasters or magicians, this is the occult equivalent of Chernobyl. This is an occult nuclear meltdown that I'm basically describing. You're talking about something that is out of control. It is like a nuclear leak. It is at this point 
um, something horrible is happening. So when I'm trying to um, get their attention, uh, they ultimately realize what has happened as well. We're left in this panic mode, really. They're trying to say, you know, uh, maybe we can appease it by killing you, meaning me. They thought of killing me to appease Maliuk Tosh, the peacock angel. But, but I said, uh, Malik Tausch is not looking for sacrifice this night. Malik Tausch is looking for simply, he's just simply looking to leave. And uh, when I said we need to call on a god to expel him tonight, they said, well, you're a fucking Buddhist. We don't believe in God. You call on Buddha. And I said, this is your land. It's not mine. We call on a god that you are supposed to have recognized. Now, we went looking for some biblical book or equivalent, but I never realized it until that moment that all Bibles, all Korans, all holy books had never made it into the library, that we didn't have a single copy. So it was at that time uh, we basically all broke down and started to pray, it just basically because everything was becoming more and more slow as if we were drowning. It's just the entire world was becoming very suffocating, very constricted. Uh, pressure was closing in on us. Uh, with that desperation, we all recited the Lord's Prayer, which we all remembered. And eventually, after what seemed an eternity, we finally began vomiting, much of it blood, and the, well, Malik Tawish essentially decided to leave. At that point, um, he took something with him from all of us. Certainly in my case, I know he took something positive, a happy memory perhaps, but something has always been missing since that time. And some part of him has always taken its place. So in that sense, I've been possessed by Malik Tawush to a degree. He manifests basically during emergencies. He manifested once in Africa when I was serving with the mercenaries in the Horn of Africa. And we were dealing with the area where we had a conflict between the Ethiopians and the Somalis. And it had extended all the way to other parts of Africa. The Somalis, of course, are well, they occupy a great deal of the horn and they're not recognized as a nation except in the, the area where they're occupied by the United Nations, essentially, because they're always at war. As a matter of fact, their flag is this sky blue United Nations flag with the single star that's based on the United Nations flag because they're effectively occupied by the United Nations. Now, slavery is still rampant. And it's run by the corrupt elements of the United Nations. The United Nations used to have solid peacekeeping provided by Sweden, which would keep its troops trained in combat, Ireland, other areas. Then the United Nations began to pay areas in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union for their troops. But of course, Places like Hungary are so corrupt, they weren't going to send real troops down for peacekeeping in Africa. The Hungarians took the United Nations money and they emptied all their insane asylums, took out all their criminals, emptied their prisons. They unleashed these men with machine guns in Africa. They called them the army of madmen because that's exactly what they were. They were helping to run the slave operations. They had abducted hundreds of women from the Dinka tribe, some of the tallest people in Africa. When my mercenary unit encountered cages 
of these women, cages, each on top of the other, so that some of these naked women were shitting and pissing on top of the others in the cages below them. And besides all these cages, just a mountain of used prophylactics, used condoms that were United Nations blue, literally issued by the United Nations. The sky powder, baby blue condoms, prophylactics that the army of madmen had been using to rape these women repeatedly. I remember everything turned red. And I don't remember anything after that. When I became conscious of my surroundings again, my mercenary unit, well, they were staring at me as if I were the devil himself. I could never find out what happened. All I could get out of any of them after that was, yes, sir, no, sir, and I don't know, sir. They wouldn't answer any questions. But I do know that the entire United Nations unit was dead. And I hadn't fired a single bullet out of my rifle. Its ammunition was still in the clip. But I was covered in blood. Now, it's at times like that that Malik Tausch manifests. Understand, of course, that he is tethered to this world by his people, the Yazidi. The Yazidi exist in parts of Iraq. They are the people of Malik Tausch. They worship Lucifer. For that reason, they're constantly persecuted by all Muslims. Only the more secular Kurds of Kurdistan give them any form of a safety space. They were the primary targets for genocide by ISIS. And who created ISIS? General Paul Veleli, co-religionist of Michael Aquino, the man who helped him write the book Mind War, his co-author. In Michael Aquino's book Mind War, of which General Paul Veleli writes the preface, his being the co-author, they describe psychological warfare against humanity 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, nonstop, forever and eternal. General Paul Vallely bragged about having formed ISIS. He said, we made ISIS, I made ISIS. He did that by emptying all of the prisons and insane asylums of North Africa and the Arab world during the time of the Arab Spring. The reason that Michael Aquino and General Paul Vallely wanted the Yazidi people ethnically exterminated, annihilated, was because they are the anchor, the tether that holds Lucifer, the peacock angel, to this world. When Why Lucifer fell to earth, he needed his own people, his own worshippers. So he created the Yazidi. They were created by him instead of God. They worship him instead of God because he is their creator, not God. If they, Aquino, the Temple of Set, the cult of the kings of Edom, the Herodian insurgency succeeds in exterminating the Yazidi, then Lucifer is unleashed from this earth, has no reason to be here, will abandon the world. And that leaves it open for their anti-gods. Their kings of Edom, as they call them. Entities. Because how, how do you see Lucifer as a good, bad, or neutral being? Lucifer is good in the sense that without him we have no balance in this world. Understand that he is 
proud, resplendent, and beautiful. When I visited the Azidi, understand this about the Azidi. It's the largest temple they have to Lucifer in the world is in Armenia. Where, of course, the young girl that I adopted, who later became my adoptive son after she had a sex change, to deal with her own gender dysphoria. She was from Armenia. And that's the only place in the world that would allow the Azidi to build their temple because they wouldn't allow it in Muslim countries. So the largest temple for Lucifer is in the Christian nation of Armenia. The largest Yazidi church. It's not a church you can convert to. You can't say I'm interested in the Yazidi and want to become one. You have to be born one. Because they're Satan's own. Understand that. God created this universe in a, ma in a manner of an ecosystem. When you grow anything in a garden, you need fertilizer and positive carrion eaters. In fact, all of nature depends on the carrion eaters. When you take a look at nature, well, without something to devour the dead, from the vultures down to the insects, are the dung beetles, which the Egyptians worship because they understood the cycle. Then you understand that these flowers, these blossoms, the food that you eat that grows above the ground is not possible without the carrion, the worms, the vermin beneath that ground that recycles the waste that provides their fertilizer and enables these primary energy producers to grow. Everything that you love in the world, rainbows, puppies, anything that's beautiful has to have that element of ugly excrement beneath the surface to enable it to be. Without the demons and the devils to compost the damned who eventually recycle, there would be no enlightenment. There would be no teachers of peace. There would be no beauty and no love. All that's evil and negative in the world is as necessary as that which we appreciate. These resonances that we possess as human beings, they, on death, there's much that happens in this process. A part of us either ascends or descends depending on our vibration level of consciousness once you're in these lower levels you eventually through this composting process recycle so the damned ultimately once they realize they no longer belong where they're at ascend all of this is part of this process that the devils and demons are a part of Without them, we're nothing. Just this is a very this is this is a very profound uh, take on on Lucifer. I think. Uh, can you can you tell us the, if um, he had form when he manifested? He had form, most certainly, yes. And this is why he's uh, known as the Peacock Angel. His form was magnificent. So when I went to Iraq during my summer vacation in 1988. This was the first Gulf War, the Gulf War between Iran and Iraq. Iran was the great enemy then. Iraq was on the side of the West, essentially defending Israel by default, standing in the way of Iran, marching all the way to the Mediterranean. It was Iraq that stopped them in eight years of war, expending a million men. The Iranians too had lost a million men to the point where they had to preserve their veterans and were using young boys to march the minefields, to explode the mines in front of them so the veterans could march behind them to survive, to hit the Iraqis on the front lines. It was like World War I. 
I was taken to those front lines because they wanted a propaganda poster designer and they were looking for volunteers from all over the world for pay, of course. And I volunteered for pay. This was my major at John O'Connell Vocational Institute, where that spy named Leanne Prifty from Albania working for the State Department. She had to work at that school where she told me about the job at the library. Uh, of course, she was sleeping with me at the time, but Leanne Prifty was someone who had to get that job at the school because she had been fired from the mayor's office after Diane Feinstein took over and felt she didn't need a female secretary to be giving her oral sex under the desk. Unlike uh, she may have looked like a lesbian, but she claimed she wasn't one. So she fired Leanne. So she wound up working at that high school, the vocational institute where I went, attended, where I ultimately wound up working at the library because of her recommendation. All of this plotted by Aquino. Aquino later told me he had the mayor killed just so that I would get that job. That's because that's what got the secretary fired. And that's what she that's where she wound up in the school where I was at, wound up sleeping with me and seducing me into the job at the Presidio. She never would have been fired if uh, the mayor hadn't been killed. So Aquino claimed he had the mayor killed just to get her fired. That's something a human sacrifice in order to bring me into his orbit. Now, the reason he couldn't bind me with the spell on my birthday at the castle at Devilsburg was because I was already possessed by the peacock angel. Therefore, I was subject to Lucifer himself, not to Michael Aquino. When I went for that summer job to design propaganda posters for Saddam Hussein in 1988, when I was in high school at the Vocational Institute of John O'Connell majoring in commercial illustration, when I was there in Iraq and they took me to the front lines to see what the situation was so that I could conceive of a propaganda poster that would uh, help the West understand what the Iraqis were dealing with. That's where I met the Yazidi in northern Iraq. And the Yazidi accepted me as one of their own. They saw Lucifer within me. In other words, I didn't need to convert no one can convert to the Azidi anyway, but they recognized me as one of them because they saw Lucifer inside. That's when they offered me one of their children, a young girl as a bride. The biggest problem would have been taking her out of the country. It would have proven just legally impossible. The Iraqis would never have recognized such a marriage, so I had to refuse, though I was honored. They are often blonde haired and blue eyed. They can look like Nordic Europeans. The Yazidi are definitely a breed apart. This is why ISIS wanted them exterminated. Understand, of course, that Aquino became part of a cult beyond the Temple of Set, beyond and beneath Satanism. The cult of the kings of Edom, the Herodian insurgency, these are the anti-gods that are the remnants of failed cosms, failed universes God rejected. These are devastating entities that are not part of our ecosystem. Our metaphysical ecosystem of angels and devils and demons that are perceived in every culture. This is like the carrion feeders and the animals who consume the primary energy products. I, of course, as a vampire, am higher up in the food chain than a human being. This is not bragging. It's a simple fact of nature. Understand that a human being, well, if you're a primary energy producer, you're a plant. If you're a person or an entity, a living animal that consumes more vegetables than meat, well, that's a human being. A human being is an omnivorous primate. And just like a human being is much different from your average primate, which is a frugivore, a fruit eater, basically a vegetarian, your human being is a carnivorous ape. 
I happen to be part of the subspecies that feeds off the carnivorous apes. But even as carnivorous apes, a human being on the level of the food chain eats far more vegetables per pound simply because of energy efficiency. You couldn't eat a complete meat diet to keep up the human frame. It would simply be energy inefficient. So your average human is on the level in the food chain of an anchovy or a pig. My mother was more of an apex predator, almost at the top of the food chain. I'm a little bit below her. So when it comes to human beings, well, the Yazidi really aren't in that category any more than vampires. They can use magic without repercussions. It's how they've survived even the genocide of ISIS. But this doesn't mean people don't keep trying to kill them. But if they ever are wiped out, then you'll no longer have Lucifer to defend the earth. Understand, God doesn't consider the world his kingdom. It's Lucifer's. The devils and demons would stand beside you to fight off the anti-gods and their legions because they're not part of this ecosystem. They're like toxic waste from an industrial plant. You have the carrion feeders, the vultures and the worms, and without them, we have no nature. We have no crops. We cannot live. But you have industrial effluvia, pollutants from major factories, that kills everything. Those are the Goodness. kings of Edom, the anti-gods from these failed cosms in which no human being could exist. These and are what this, the Americans worship. Yeah, and this topic of the Yazidis bring us to the to the thread of occult geopolitics, um, because there's so much secret information locked into different kind of uh, genetic groups and regions. And uh, it's an easy guess that Aquino was after all kind of occult information from humanity's deepest past. Did you ever come across any ancient documents concerning the occult deeds and goals of the past empires? And what were the configurations and the occult influences? Very important question and important to remember just how bad it was in the past uh, and why some cultures are so important. Um, certainly my mother, who was part of the Occult Bureau of Japan, uh, the, her participation in the war, once the war went into proactive mobilization, when people were fully mobilized into prosecution of proactive hostilities, her role in the war changed. She was no longer so important as a translator because at this point the Germans and Japanese were in full alliance. There was really nothing to translate anything about uh, that they needed her for at the diplomatic level. Any translation at that point was purely technical, like weapon systems and the like. So she was deployed by the occult bureau, the Onmyorio, to fight the allies in their attempts to bring the anti-gods into this world. Now the Japanese had defeated a great occult threat before from the Mongols. The first people to perfect biological warfare. As bad as the 20th century was, and it's always important to remember that the Allies and the Communists killed far more people than the Axis powers. Certainly the Axis powers killed millions. As a matter of fact, they killed far more Allied civilians then the Allies were able to kill Axis civilians, believe it or not. Just proportionately, as many Germans and uh, Japanese and Italians and Axis satellite minor states may have had their populations suffer, <laughs> the Russians and the Chinese and other Allied forces suffered far worse in terms of their populations. This was a war of populations. And the Allied armies, forces, proved unable to protect theirs. 
But as bad as that slaughter was, the communists killed far more simply by collectivization and democide, uh, annihilation of their own populations. And still, beyond that, as bad as all that was, with the communists killing ultimately a population equivalent to that of the United States and Canada combined, it would be as if someone wiped out all the population of North America. That's how many people died in Russia, China, Vietnam, Cuba, and all the communist ruled satellite states combined. As bad as all that was, well, it was a lot worse under the Mongols. Probably the communists were responsible for killing far more than the Nazis. It would be about some percentage of the population. Well, we're talking about two and a half billion early in this century, probably around 4%. Uh, 700 years ago, the Mongols killed 12% of the world's population. 50 million people at a time when the planetary population was only 360 million strong. The Mongols were four times as murderous as any 20th century butcher. You're talking about the most monstrous people on earth in human history. The only people that can rival them now is if we count the abortions conducted by the communist Chinese empire. But that's another subject. When it comes to the Mongols, of course, the way they killed so many people was the use of biological warfare. They used the Asian gerbil. That was the carrier of the Black Plague, not the European rat. There are still rats all over Europe today, and they're not transmitting any plague. It was the Asian gerbil brought by the Mongols intentionally as their primary advance weapon that would sicken entire populations so the Mongols could ride in and slaughter them all. All of this originated intentionally by Mongol sorcerers that today we would call bio warriors or scientific developers of weapons of mass destruction. The alchemists of Mongolia, the people who learned to transport the Black Death on the backs of rodents that they then would introduce into target populations. All of this is why they had to be stopped. They changed, of course, the history of the world at that time. The, Ma, the Muslims, the heirs to Greek knowledge, the people who translated many of the Greek texts and later fed them back to the Europeans. The Muslims were the most advanced peoples on earth. They had developed computers. Understand that something that's high technology is impossible to preserve unless kept in refrigerated museum conditions. None of that was possible under Mo Mongol assault. When it came to the Muslims at the time of the Caliph, Persia, Baghdad, later Iraq, the most advanced places on earth had what they called jinn. This was a recognition of artificial intelligence as a living entity. To unplug the jinn was to commit murder. These were essentially artificial intelligences functioning at a level that they were recognized as an intelligence. Hence, they were bottled jinn. Their more primitive mechanical cousins or related machinery would be the automatic chess players that would appear in Turkey and the Orient later. That some would claim would be men hidden behind the mechanisms. 
Later it would be the case, but not originally. All of this was wiped out by the Mongol hordes. Destroyed. And the Muslim world never recovered. The Muslims were only stopped by Japan. Through occult warfare. When the Mongols invaded Japan twice. They were wiped out. Even though the samurai were the finest warriors in the world. They couldn't combat the Mongols. The Mongols were using firepower beyond Japanese comprehension. The Mongols were using the Turkish bow, which could fire for hundreds of yards. The Japanese bows and arrows couldn't even reach the Mongols before they were shot down en masse because the Mongols fired in waves so vast, their arrows blotted out the sun. The Mongols fought modern blitzkrieg. They attacked as a force of Marines. There were enough Mongol ships invading Japan that they rivaled the ships at D-Day. Their fleet was far larger than the American fleet off France in World War II. They had taken every ship from all over China and Korea and Vietnam. They couldn't plague the Japanese with their Asian gerbil. They couldn't infect them with their pestilence beforehand to weaken their population. So they had to invade in force. By the time they wiped out the samurai, all the emperor could do was get down on his knees and pray to the gods of his ancestors for divine intervention. That's when the kamikaze, the divine storm, manifested. Wiped the Mongols out. The largest amount of men ever killed at sea in human history. 4,400 ships sank in a single wave. Tens of thousands of men died. Drowning in a matter of minutes. All of this wiped out the Mongols and they retreated from the rest of the world. Without Japan defeating them, we would all be living under a Mongol world today. It was Japan that saved the world then and then again in World War II. When they basically defeated the Americans, which of course I outline in the book, The Roswell Deception, which I hope someday might be translated into Bulgarian as well. Then people will get the full story. Understand that the Japanese were already committed to raising a second kamikaze. This was the term that people affiliate with their suicide pilots. But the Japanese didn't just have suicide planes. They had suicide ships, submarines. They had men who would charge with suicide satchels, uh, suicide spears with explosives at the tip of the spear that they would plant against tanks or ships, attacking ships from underwater, wearing their own scuba suits. All of this is people something people can do research on. It's nothing that's hard to find out about if people really care to find out about it. And they were seeing themselves as a force of nature, right? It was a self-sacrifice to prove themselves worthy of the gods of their ancestors so that the storm of the kamikaze would return again, which it did. It was that which ultimately destroyed the Americans. The Americans had invaded Okinawa. The Americans had to use a fleet as large as the fleet used at D-Day to invade this tiny island, Okinawa. 80% of the men who invaded that island never made it to the shore. Those that did make it were so outrageous in their behavior, so 
genocidal. They killed women and children by eating them alive, cannibalizing them. The Americans ate them. More Okinawans died on the island of Okinawa when the Americans invaded than Japanese died at Hiroshima and Nagasaki put together. Both the nuclear weapons dropped on those cities put together killed less Japanese than Okinawans were killed by Americans who invaded that island. But then, the kamikaze came. A typhoon was spotted developing in the Carolyn Islands and tracked as it moved on what was originally a predictable course to the northwest. The typhoon developed just north of Rota. Guam Weather Channel called the storm weak. They called it Louise. And then what happened was like an intelligent living animal. It changed course. Originally, it was expected to pass between Formosa and Okinawa onto the East China Sea. But then, of its own volition, it veered sharply to the right and headed north for Okinawa Jima, Okinawa Island. So when this storm hit, it increased in intensity. The sudden shift of the storm caught all the ships and small craft in the constricted waters of Nakagusukuan. The Americans call it Buckner Bay, where their General Buckner was shot in the head by a Japanese sniper. None of them were able to escape for sea. All of them died in port. The forecast for Okinawa was for 60 knots, 90 knots, but it kept increasing. Struck in the afternoon with unprecedented fury and violence, the worst storm at Okinawa that it ever experienced in history. The storm center of Typhoon Louise passed Buckner Bay, raging at peak strength. Basically, all of the conditions that were created were such that aircraft carriers were dragging anchor. The damage left behind was incalculable. All the food, medical supplies, and other stores destroyed. 80% of all the housing and buildings the Americans had built knocked down, rendered unusable. All the military installations out of action. Planes were damaged. None of the tentage salvageable. Food stocks were left for only 10 days. Medical facilities were so destroyed that an immediate request had to be made for hospital ships. This damage destroyed 107 amphibious craft, four tank landing ships, two medium landing ships, gunboats, two infantry landing craft. This is why the Americans couldn't invade Japan. All of this, the invasion of the island, in order to invade Japan itself was for nothing. And the casualty list of the ships and the crews was even greater. 12 ships sunk, 222 grounded, 32 damage beyond the ability to repair. 36 killed, 47 missing, 100 fatally injured, would die within hours. All the Americans left homeless. So the kamikaze came and the Americans effectively surrendered. They had to conduct a medical evacuation of 36,000 men. A medical evacuation means these are men on life support. It was called Operation Magic Carpet. But they never talk about it in the history book. Uh, Douglas, since you have operated uh, 
from the inside for so many years and perhaps uh, you were able to compose a pretty detailed picture in your mind of who are the main occult factions or players on the planet right now. What are they, uh, what are their uh, ideologies and which one of them are, are continuations of past empires that we have discussed and can you just give us a quintessence of the general frame at work currently? I want people to understand that it's very important to know this, that uh, when I was working with Michael Aquino, I was sent into Russia at one point to contact his fellow Satanists. There's a reason for this. Americans need to understand, everyone in the West needs to understand, hell, everyone on Earth needs to understand this, that when the Soviet Union was created, they were an atheistic state. Atheism was the state sponsored religion, the anti religion, anti theism, or anti godlessness. This anti godliness means that they couldn't recognize Satanism as a threat. In other words, if they admitted to satanic cults, even existing to themselves, they were empowering the church and the church was underground, not recognized by the Soviets as legitimate. Since the church was underground and illegitimate, well, because there was no God, there could be no Satan. So the only effective resistance movement in the former Soviet Union was Satanism. These were the descendants of Rasputin. These were under the command of Alexander Dugin. This was the man I was sent to rendezvous with by Michael Aquino. The time I spent in Russia, nobody monitored me in my rendezvous with Alexander Dugin because, again, what's there to monitor with some crazy lunatic seeing another crazy lunatic? We can't recognize any Satanism as a threat. This was the man who later on wrote the book on geopolitics, which became the textbook for the Soviet and then the Russian military academy. It's the textbook that inspired the geopolitics of Vladimir Putin. That's why Alexander Dugin was proudly introduced by Alex Jones in the United States as Putin's brain. He is Putin's Rasputin, despite the fact that everyone denies it. That needs to be recognized as an occult power. To show you the kind of Satanism that exists in Japan, after all, they're not Christian. There is effectively no Christianity in Japan. So one might ask, what would be their version of Satanism? Something that might cooperate with someone like Alexander Dugin. This is where you had the cult of Yom Shinrikyo. Om Shinrikyo, based on the chant of Om. Yomu Shinrikyo was headed, of course, by Shoko Asahara, the blind guru. The Nippon Jin, or Japanese government, calculated that the Yom Shinrikyo organization had over 10,000 members in Nippon, Japan, and over 40,000 worldwide. The cult of Yomu boasted a particularly strong presence in the Russian Federation, where there was yet another 30,000 members. It's widely known in Asia, but completely unknown elsewhere that the sect was purchasing highly classified Tesla-derived energy weapons technology from the Russian Commonwealth of Independent States, which had been established to oversee the bankruptcy of the former Soviet Union. The cult's dojos, their yoga training halls in Greater Tokyo, Tokyo and Osaka, Osaka City, and other large cities were the primary recruiting grounds for their priesthood. 
a status of which required everyone to turn over all their worldly goods and move to the rural compounds. Their military training, they had militias. Their military training for the Yalmu cultists in Russia. They established entire private armies. They had a secret chemical factory in Australia. The cult of Yalmu was preparing for the day after doomsday. The Yalmu cultists were immersed in hot water and imprisoned underground to ready them for war. Then there was an earthquake reported in Western Australia, the first ever recorded there. If anyone's familiar with geophysiology, the uh, physics of geology, earthquakes are impossible in Australia. There is no fault lines. It was linked with sightings of strange beams of light. Investigations proved the earthquake's epicenter was Banjawarn Sheep Station, which had been purchased weeks earlier by the Om Shinrikyo cult. And that's where they had taken up testing Zoviet's weapons, secret energy weapons, reigniting the arm race that had ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union. This was a secret cult that had a terrifying array of energy weapons. Representatives of their cult visited the headquarters of the International Tesla Society of New York City in 1993, seeking patents and documents. But all those research notes had been seized by the US government's OAP, the Office of Alien Property, the same office that had stolen all of the land and financial resources of the Japanese they had put into concentration camps had stolen all of Tesla's property. They did this because Tesla had been driven to suicide. Tesla was stripped of his citizenship by the United States government because he refused to help them with the Philadelphia experiment. Using his technology, they needed him to make it work. Without him, they had a disaster. Tesla was told he was going to go to a concentration camp where they had stuck many Germans and Italians as well as Japanese. They used to sell their children out of Crystal City in Texas. People who don't believe me can look it up themselves. Tesla said he'd die first, and that's just what he did. He told his nephew, a diplomat of Yugoslavia, to take all his secrets that he could and escape. His nephew took everything he could, but that left him the heavy equipment, other things that he couldn't get rid of, for the government to steal. That's where Trump comes in. His uncle, John Trump, was sent by the Office of Alien Property to judge for the government what Tesla technology could be exploited. Uncle John Trump, he said, none of it's of any good. It's not of any use. It's all bullshit. Then he stole all the technology for himself and made the Trumps a multi-billionaire dynasty. That's why the Americans are the enemy of all mankind. Who's behind them? The Freemasons. The people that my biological father Adolf Hitler was fighting against. What about the Middle, Middle Eastern factions? We, we don't know anything about them. This takes us back to the Zionists. Of course, the Mossad existed long before there was an Israel. Just like if you take a look at the foundation of the American military branches, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, everything but the Air Force all was founded in 1775. There wasn't even a goddamn United States in 1775. There, all the official foundation says was 1776. But 
when it comes to the Freemasons. These are essentially Muslim Satanists taking all of the magic of Islam and it, inverting it, turning it upside down like Satanists would Christian symbols. This is why if you were in an area like Helena, Montana in the United States where there's a dominant Freemasonic population, you would think you had landed in the Middle East. But these are all anti-Muslims, Muslim Satanists, Freemasons. What is it that they're binding with? Think of the Middle East of that which no Muslim speaks of. Muslims, of course, speak of Allah, the God. What many people do not realize is that Kuturu, the ancient Sumerian conveyance of the Lord of the Abyss. Kutu means abyss. Lu means Lord or entity of eminence. Kuturu, abyssal Lord. al Katulu in the Arabic means the forsaker. Katulu, the word meaning the abandoner. That, of course, is readily accessible to a speaker of the Arabic language. The place where perhaps an English speaker could find confirmation of what I'm saying. Well, you just look to the Quran. It is there that. Well, in the Quran, it is mentioned to beware of al Qatulu. It's in verse. Oh, they call it uh, surah in the Quran, the chapter. Surah 25, ayah, or verse 29. So verse 25, 29 translates as, Mankind, shaitan, Satan, is al Katulu. Satan is the great abandoner. Beware, the great forsaker, the abandoner. Now, what? happens when somebody is in a Muslim nation and they don't want to be persecuted. Well, they simply separate themselves from civilization itself. You see the, oh, how do I explain this? When it comes to Arabic magic, al Qurulu, the forsaker manifests as a spiritual force that powers the practices of Tajrid wa Tafrid. The Tajrid means outward separation. Tafrid means inward solitude. Tajrid, disentanglement from home and wealth. Tafrid, isolation from all company. Tajrid and Tafrid are two terms and practices all but forgotten to conventional Islam, specific to Tashahuf, Shufism, the Sufis, the schismatic branch of Al Islam, the submission. Islam means surrender, surrender to Allah. Now, the adherence of the inner mystical dimensions of Islam. To them, tajrid wa tafrid are exercises used to transcend, meaning abandon, which involves the great abandoner, normal cultural programming by transcending, by abandoning dogma and fixed beliefs. A seeker can see reality as it truly is, breaking through the matrixial barriers, the moral boundaries of mortal man. Thus, Al Ketulu himself is stimulated by Al Nafs, the soul breath. What? It's the Arabic conceptual permutation of Ka, the ancient Egyptian term for spirit, life force. That's analogous to Chi in Qigong, or that's the bioenergy, the Ki in Aikido. This is uh, basically what Dr. Wilhelm Reich isolated as orgone, the psyche, the, the mind, the, in, the soul is what the psyche really needs. You abandon your soul. 
because the mental identity in the realm of the Arabi, the Arabs, self-awareness, self-awareness through desires, ego, carnal self-identity, the Al-Hadith, the tradition, perceives it as a little black spot in the area where one's heart is. That was asserted by the Prophet Abdu al Qasim Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdu al Matub ibn Hashim, Muhammad himself. He was said to have been born without that spot or had that spot removed. In its primal state, al Nafs incites us to commit evil, such being the base instincts of the nafs at the lower chakras, the nodal centers in which energy flows through the subtle human body. Al-Islam emphasizes the importance of resisting the inciting nafs via the, the hadith or the recitation, which holds that on surviving yet another campaign of jihad or religious war. The prophet Muhammad said, we now return from al-jihad ashkar, the lesser struggle, to Al-Jihad Akbar, the greater struggle. This was after they had slaughtered populations of infidels. And his followers asked, after so much bloodshed and so many of our own men lost, O oh, Prophet of God, what is Al-Jihad Akbar, the greater struggle? Unto which he replied, Al-Jihad against Al-Nafs. So you see, the Sufi, go to the desert, abandoning all, stimulated by Al-Nafs. The abandoner, Cthulhu himself, then causes al hal the static condition of rule, the possession, the mystical experience of spiritual state. The relationships between Al-Nafs, al Katulu, and al hal the static condition of rule or possession is intricate. So I'm oversimplifying everything. So the abandoner is acknowledged within some schools of Pasha Uf, the Sufi. Well, al Qutulu's name is writ in the Quran itself, so he cannot be denied. Of the two orthodox interpretations of the ayah, the verse in which he is forewarned, the most universally applicable is that shaitan will abandon man, the other being that shaitan causes men to forsake Islam and its culture. And that latter interpretation is fairly consistent with the spiritual meaning that the ancient Mukaribun posits al Ketulu. Now, the Mukaribun practices of the Sufi, they're thought sinful by any Orthodox Muslim. So these Sufi, these are the secret societies that are affiliated with the cult of the kings of Edom that Michael Aquino aligned himself with. They was what about the, the Asian factions? They're even more enigmatic. Well, when I explained what Aum Shinrikyo was up to, what they were serving was Shoko Asahara, who was the anti-Buddha. Buddhism is an apocalyptic religion. This is very important to understand. So when it comes to the apocalypticism of Buddha, then you have to think of the fact that uh, there's different phases in their history of humanity, the ages of man. There's three recognized ages of Buddhism that your average Westerner who says, oh, I want to be a Buddhist. I want to be at peace. He'll find out that the first two ages are the age of right Dharma, Sa Dharma, uh, Jingfa, or the, you, I would call it in Japanese, Nihongo, the Japanese language, it would be Shobo, the age of the true law. 
And then there is the age of semblance dharma, the pratirupadharma in the Sanskrit. Jengpa, the uh, zobo in the Japanese, the Nihongo, the age of facsimile law. That's followed by the age of Dharma decline. The Pashima Dharma. The Mofa. The Japanese, it's Mapo. The latter day of the law. The degenerate third age when people become lawless and forget the Buddha's teachings. Now, traditionally, this age was supposed to begin two millennia. 2000 years after Bodai Shakyamuni's, the Shakyamuni Buddha's passing and last for 10,000 years. Now, temporally, not temporarily, tem in, in, temporally, its place and time, this age of anxiety in Japanese history commences from the mid 11th century. The specific fear was that society had entered or was about to enter Mapo, the third latter day of the law. Uh, by the Japanese people's calculations, the Nipponji. The third age of Mapo commenced in the year 1055 of the Christian era. This anxiety over Mapo shaped many aspects of medieval Japanese culture, served as the catalyst for the growth and renewal of Buddhism. And uh, the uh, understand that by the time of the 12th century, chaos and change overtook the Japanese empire, the governmental organization changed, the economic structure shifted. There were battles, countless battles of various sizes, a number of devastating natural disasters, little or no governmental control over much of the country for much of the time. And of course, the this was the climate of the age of apocalyptic Buddhism and Japanese Mapo anxiety continues to influence them today. Uh, during this degenerate third age, it's believed that people are unable to attain enlightenment at all through the word of the Bodhi Shakyamuni. So society becomes morally corrupt. Now, in Buddhistic thought, the teachings of the Buddha are still correct during the age of Dharma decline, but people are no longer capable of following them. But Buddhistic temporal or time cosmology assumes a cyclical pattern of ages. And even when the current Buddha's teachings fall into disregard, a new Buddha will be born to ensure the continuity of Buddhism. A new period in which the true faith will flower again will be ushered in sometime in the future by the Bodhisattva, the Buddha to be, the Buddha to come, the Maitreya, the Miroku, like miracle in the Japanese. So Shoko Asahara presented himself as that Buddha. He was the anti-Buddha. He aimed to kill the emperor and take over Japan. He would be a Japanese Cromwell. But there is the thought that he was pushing that convinced people that he was real, that there was a fourth period of Buddhism, a fourth age in which there would be an eternal peace. So this is what can happen with the danger of an anti-Buddha. There was a priest in the ancient days called Nichiren who founded the Japanese nationalist cult of Buddhism. He was the man who predicted the invasion of the Mongols. His cult disciples were the ones who framed the Aum Shinrikyo for the strike on the Tokyo subway. This was a war of cults. So understand that the Japanese depend in their politics, their power politics, people die, influenced by cults and their wars with each other. Cult warriors that attack each other. When the government was left powerless in the face of the Aum Shinrikyo attack. I don't think most people understand how important this was. Understand that when the Aum Shinrikyo came to the United States to purchase Tesla weapons and were told they had all been taken by the US government, effectively monopolized by the Trump family, 
Then the Om Shinrikyo cult purchased them from the Russians. So when they began to use these Scalar weapons, Om Shinrikyo went on air. Shoko Asahara appeared on Japanese television and said, Japan will be attacked by my earthquakes. That's when he unleashed Tesla Scalar weapons and the Osaka earthquake left over a billion United States dollars in damage within a matter of a single minute. With his plans to kill the emperor and overthrow Japan, his proclamation of his ushering in a fourth age of Buddhism. Understand that most people misunderstand harp technology. They think that maybe it can be used to call, well, cause earthquakes. Well, it's extremely low frequency raves compared to scalar weaponry. It, well, elf waves, as they're called, they can be used for earth penetrating tomography, EPT. This allows prediction of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, sub subterranean surveying capabilities. That's something that can detect fault lines, but they cannot affect them. Nikolai Tesla developed a terrifying array of energy weapons a hundred years ago that could indeed cause earthquakes utilizing EMP, electromagnetic pulses. So because the Om Shinrikyo had purchased such technology from the Russians, and the Americans knew about this because of their trying to purchase it from the Americans, they unleashed their weapons on Japan. The Holy Pope of Yomu, Asahara Shoko announced in his radio broadcast that Japan will be attacked by an earthquake in 1995. Kobe, meaning Osaka Kobe. And that's when the earthquake struck. Fifth largest city in Japan, population over five and a half million, to hit, hit by one of the most destructive superquakes in Japanese history. Entire apartment blocks collapsed in seconds. The ancient capital city of Kyoto Shi was integrated in conurbation with Osaka, all severely damaged. 7,000 dead, 30,000 injured, 300,000 displaced, 100 billion United States dollars in damage was ultimately calculated in the aftermath. The Supreme Leader Asahara's attack had to be stopped, but the Japanese government couldn't officially stop him because that would throw the entire Japanese public into a panic. This was the second largest economy in the world. His next target was Tokyo by his own challenge. If he took down Tokyo, the entire world stock market would collapse. The economy of the world would crash. So they turned to the cult of Nichiren Buddhism. These were the cult of the Mapo Apocalypse, Soka Gakai, Value Creation Society. The lady who used to host Revolution Radio with myself, Noreen Helphan, was a member. They attacked the Sobi, the Tokyo subway station, killing very few people, but framed the cult of Shoko Asahara, which then gave the Japanese government the excuse to close in on them. The Japanese government couldn't respond to shutting down the Om Shinrikyo cult on the basis of earthquake technology because that would throw the stock market into a crash. But to show you the fact that the American government knew about it, when the Tokyo Towers collapsed, Colin Powell was the black general who was then serving as Secretary of State. He immediately, 
He immediately froze all Shoko Asahara's Om Shinrikyo assets in the United States. He froze them because he thought they had taken down the Twin Towers. That was the technology that they had. This is the influence of Japanese cults on the surface of the world today, battling each other in secret for your future, which you know nothing about. They were talking about Japan. I was there in 2015, and uh, there's something that uh, I still cannot understand. Uh, being there, it was very puzzling that uh, they managed to to mix the Shinto and the, the the corporation yes as a concept yes. uh, which seems like a contradiction how do you explain that this is because they were able to synchro syncretize blend both buddhism and shintoism in the past this is what they do with shintoism and corporatism understand that um, the japanese will take the best of something combine it and make it work. To try and help explain this, the power that Japan has. Just recently, they've doubled in land size. 7,000 new islands have been added to Japan. Japan itself has four main islands, the largest, but there are 7,000 Japanese islands. Granted, a number of them are artificial, some of them built in the days of the samurai to house the Europeans on so they would never step foot on Japan itself. Yet recently, overnight, Japan doubled with 7,000 new islands. This while the seas are rising and other island nations are sinking, Japan doubled in landmass. Don't take my word for it, anybody can look this up. Look up 7,000 new islands discovered in Japan. It's true, it made the news. Nobody talks about it because they don't understand it. So understand this, the way that Shinto can integrate into corporatism is through Buddhism. The understanding that there is a Buddha in the robot. There is a book by that title written by a Japanese roboticist, a robot scientist titled The Buddha in the Robot. This is because they understand that that which is created, it's the same as if you gave birth. If you give birth, you impart something of yourself into the child. When you make something, you impart something of yourself. So any robot created is human in essence. The Japanese understand this, which is why they imbue their products with a sense of soul and work with a sense of purpose. Their robotics factories would be considered the way we consider mass productive facilities for chickens or ducks or poultry we're producing or breeding on a mass scale. This is because of the ancient Shinto's concept of the kami. You've already heard the term kamikaze, the divine wind. Kami, God. Kami are spirits residing within a place or idea, anything in the world or beyond it that can instill in human beings a sense of divinity, mystery, or awe is home to a kami. The peace one feels at the summit of a majestic mountain is the influence of the kami that lives there. The passions aroused at the banks of a raging river are also reflections of the kami that are present. The kami are not only manifestations of the physical world, but great ideas and beliefs, such as alternate religions or belief systems, also have a kami. When one feels a sense of awe and wonder, whether caused by the sight of a, a volcano in Hawaii, or a butterfly in Brazil, or a swell of patriotic pride at a national monument, then that person feels the touch of a related kami. In the presence of a kami, an adept with the appropriate abilities can make contact and even entreat the spirit for aid, the power of the kami depends on its location. Um, a small, beautiful stream would have a weak, mild water kami, but a great mountain would be home to a mighty earth kami. 
The power of the kami can change as the nature of the place or idea it inhabits changes. Thousands of years ago, the kami of computation was barely alive. The Mongols had killed it. It existed only on in the abacus or a few Greek astronomical instruments. Today, the computer spirit kami is vastly powerful with offspring and relatives in abundance. But how to translate this into what has just recently happened? You see, Shinto is the indigenous religion of Japan before Buddha brought the concept of Zen or the teachings of Confucius were adopted by the emperor. Shinto taught that everything in the world had a spirit called the Kami, that the Kami were divine, no matter how simple or mean their source from stones on the ground to the mountains above each contained a living soul that could be contacted, respected and even entreated for service. So the rituals of honoring and communing with these spirits became the basis for the Shinto religion. And Shinto teaches man to honor nature in all its specific forms. And in this way, they also honor the specific kami connected to that form and gain their favor. In return, the kami helps man to succeed and prosper. The kami do not care what other beliefs man has. And so Shinto has existed harmoniously alongside every other religion and philosophy for over 5,000 years. Today, with the very, the very nation of Japan threatened by the Russo-Chinese, the Sino-Slavic Synaxis of Russia, China, North Korea, with missiles flying over the skies of Japan every day. The kami are taking action. When the very mountains can be crushed by nuclear fists, then those mountains must act. And the kami have called on their agents to do so. The Shinto priesthood and their young progeny. This is why practically overnight, 7,000 islands have arisen in Japan and it's doubled in landmass to 14,000 islands. But Anyone no can look at this fact. I'm sorry? But there's no people. There's a demographic catastrophe. Everyone is suffering this, including Japan's enemies. Everyone is suffering this crash, except for the black Africans and the Asian Indians. Maybe the people of certain areas of South America but mostly it's black Africa and Asian India where the population explosion is occurring. Even in Catholic Philippines, where the church has the influence of discouraging abortion, the population is declining. Mm -hmm. The problem this, is, yes. I'm sorry, in this large scale picture that you painted, where would you position the Vatican? The no, Vatican this. fought on the side of the Axis in World War II. Understand that what we need to do for the future in order to rehabilitate civilization is we need to turn to Bulgaria, its very capital is named Sofia. The Roman Catholic Church has a redeeming feature, even though for 3,000 years it might be considered one of the longest lasting criminal organizations in the world, the atrocities it's committed, have not always been without purpose. The Crusades were justified in the sense of the threat that Islam presented in its debased and barbaric form after the fall of the ancient Caliph. At that point, the Crusades were necessary to save Europe. There was no concept of Europe in those days. The closest concept that we had was Christendom. There was the negative aspect of it in which much of what the church attacked was the Orthodox Church, which is what they did in World War II through greater Croatia. Their crimes being so vile that the Nazis were disgusted. But nevertheless, what will redeem the church 
will be a redeification of Mary, Mariolatry. They have Mary on a par with God himself. But this is where the Eastern Orthodox Church can prove itself specifically through Bulgaria, through Sophia. In Carl Jung, and it's important to understand this about Carl Gustav Jung, the original progenitor of our modern concept of psychiatry was Sigmund Freud, who was Jewish. However, Sigmund Freud was obsessed with the degenerate negative aspects of sexuality, uh, fetishes, with everything from fecal matter to uh, just incest, very negative aspects of dysfunction are what characterize Freudian psychiatry. The Nazis wanted an Aryan psychology. Carl Gustav Jung considered himself the Aryan Christ. He was someone who was trying to usher in a generation of mutants in the most positive sense. His psychology was based on symbolism rather than fetishism. He was the Nazi answer to Jewish psychotherapy. And Carl Jung's answer to Job, Jung calls Sophia the Logos, the word itself. He named Sophia the mediator between humanity and God. Now, Sophia wasn't something he invented. The ancient Greeks, who were patriarchal to the point of pathology, basically misogynist, would only refer to wisdom as Sophia, always the feminine. She is the feminine wisdom exiled from this world because in Gnostic Christian mythology, she created the world without consent from God. And in doing so, created a false God called the Demiurge and the serpent and the fall. The redemption of the world is the return of Sophia from exile. In his epic work of Christian mysticism, Valentin Tomberg wrote that the complete Holy Trinity is not Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In fact, it is the Holy Trinity plus Mother, Daughter, and Holy Soul. The Holy Trinity, according to the greatest master of Catholic mysticism I have ever read, is actually composed of six parts, not three, and it is feminine and masculine in, in nature. It is intersex of both sexes. It is fundamentally androgynous. There's so much we do not yet understand about human identity. Why must traditionalists cut off all possibility for transformation out of fear alone? This is why I had to learn to live with the young child prostitute I adopted off the streets who I had had sex with while she was growing up, who I had intended to marry. I had to come to terms with her gender dysfunction, dysphoria, her being unhappy with being physically female, that she had always felt spiritually male. I had to come to terms with that. I wasn't going to spend the rest of my life fucking her up the ass, so I married her off to a wealthy man who could care for him the rest of his life. But. I came to understand that to combine the feminine and the masculine is the goal of all this gender trouble, to make one where there is now division. In the answer to Job, Jung, Carl Gustav Jung, refers to Yahweh, or God himself, as unconscious, a monster, a beast of nature. It is only Sophia who is able to create self-reflection through the mediation between Yahweh, Yahweh and Job. It is the feminine out of which the logos, the word, is born. So we need to understand that when it comes to what has happened in the world thus far, the misunderstanding of Christianity itself, without the revelation of the Magi, which should be in the Bible, we have an incomplete Christianity, a perverted Christianity based on Judaism. Something so sick as a concept of Judeo-Christian. What a term. 
you may as well more readily say Judeo-Islam. They're both Semitic peoples of the desert because Yahweh and Allah are both a war god, a sword god, a moon god, a mad god of the desert who calls for the mass murder of entire races. If modern feminism is corrupt, in spite of the positive which I've articulated, it's because of this latter reality that I've just described, because culture itself is corrupt. If the transgender movement, of which my adoptive son is personification of, is incomplete, it is because it is too political and not enough immersed in the archaic foundations for transforming gender, the mythical synthesis of male and female. But we also have ourselves to blame for removing Sophia entirely from our retellings of the biblical story. Sophia is the feminine Christ. Without her, there is only cruel and delusional Yahweh of the Old Testament, the primal God who shaped the world, but who is not fit to run it alone. Because you mentioned the Magi several times during this interview, uh, we would like to continue with the subject of magic itself. You once described magic as a mechanism, sort of a different kind of physics. Can you give us your view on magic? Yes, yes, of course. But definitely some thought to finish here. To continue back to magic, I do want people to understand that uh, you have people out there, these pseudo philosophers that are confusing young men like Jordan Peterson, who explicitly defined the relationship between male and female as that of Christ and Mary, which is probably a Roman Catholic background that many Canadian men like him have. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, the great philosopher, was Canadian, as was uh, Mr. Chardin. T.L.R. de Chardin was uh, the French-Canadian uh, Roman Catholic that had the concept of the Nuosphere, the concept of what the New Age would call the Akashic Records, a kind of mass memory or awareness. In other words, what that incomplete Western Christian concept implies is that Mary raises Christ. The purpose of woman is in their, well, the eyes of the West, not to become heroes, but to raise them. Now that is impossible for a truly ambitious woman. And if I were born a woman, obsessed with these mystical and philosophical questions, I would resent that statement so deeply I may never recover. So that philosophy is centered in that way upon a male subject. In order to redeem the father, the next generation of mythical thinkers must reorient the woman out of this secondary position. And perhaps that entails changing the very biology of childbirth with DNA editing. Who knows what will follow? So the transhumanist idea through the Shinto concept of understanding the humanity in all things must return Sophia to this world, not be finished at the half answer of Mary. Uh, Mary Sophia is the ultimate form of woman both raiser of heroes and the hero herself. That is completeness, perfection, not this half answer of woman in one corner, men in another, men striving, woman bearing children. The reason for the fall and the progress of history is to return to Eden with higher values and more complete myths, not merely to repeat the past. But that brings us to magic and changing this reality around us. How does magic work? Spells may be kinds of video game cheat codes, certain instructions that are fed to the operating system of reality that allow rewrites and new instructions. They, of course, are also sorts of sonic keys that, when spoken aloud, change reality on a quantum level. Reality might be best perceived as Maya, illusion. Those bold enough may force their will upon it. Spells are no more than disciplines 
to more easily part that veil. Enchantments may be seen as a completely rational phenomena that operates outside of scientific research. But of course, you must never forget that dark forces attracted to words, gestures, and more importantly, emotion and intent. Hear the spells being cast and change the world to accommodate the will of the caster. So when it comes to the kind of magic that, well, I'm trying to think of harp. How does that fit in? That is evocation as a super science. Of course, evocation may be considered the completion of an equation, the closing of a circuit. When you evoke an entity, you complete that mathematical physics equation. You close that circuit. Harp does that mechanically. Two nodes are created, still points in space time, creating a world line the entity can use to navigate to enter our dimension. Topological symbols, such as the famous elder sign, which of course Howard Phillips Lovecraft described in the only novella ever published in his lifetime. He had many short stories published, but never a book. The only book published in his lifetime was The Shadow Over Innsmouth. In there, he describes the Elder Sign as the swastika, the Hockenkreutz, the Hooked Cross. That was the cross that Constantine saw in the sun itself when the voice of God spraketh unto he, under this sign, conquer. That became the Hooked Cross of the Roman legions. That became the ward of the National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiter Party, the National Socialist German Workers Party, and the Nazis. The ward which holds off the anti gods. This is what's used at either end of the summoning, creating an area of hostility for the entity to be summoned, then imprisoned like a rat in a trap. Then a charge is created where once it was necessary to enter Gnosis, communion, which would shatter your mind and leave you insane to complete that circuit between the Twa nodes, thus charging them. Alternate power sources can now be used. Most often in the 20th century, this was electricity, but certainly nuclear, geothermic, or any other kind of power can be used to charge spell. The amount of energy used will influence how effective the evocation is, and the amount of power generated for heart is practically infinite. The use of power. Yes. Any examples of how the military applies that magic on the battleground? Yes. Yeah. Understand that um, first. Understand that the use of power and the solution of an equation attracts entities. Specific entities react to specific equations, much like the use of a true name, the barbarous name of the anti-god, which no human voice can even mouth. The human vocal cords simply aren't evolved. But so long as a basic circuit of energy is created and successfully closed, no entrance to no cease is required anyway. This is how technology has taken over the field of magic. That's what needs to be understood first, which is how the military of the Americans can deploy it at all. These aren't men willing to die by the thousands like the Japanese to sacrifice themselves to feed the kami and create the kamikaze. These are cowards and fools who use their minds and intellects in the hopes the anti-gods will fight their wars for them. So when it comes to their use upon the battlefield, think of 
God, what comes to my mind aside from Iraq? I'm trying not to personalize this because, of course, I served in Operation Desert Storm where Cthulhu was called upon by Michael Aquino. You had the Iraqi army, which had held off the Iranians for eight years. Men who had sacrificed a million lives in what was the World War I of the Middle East. Surrender en masse within hours. None of that is natural. That is supernatural. Think of the damage that was done. When you think upon the horror of what came out of Montau, I was asked about, of course, what happened in 1963. But our man, Mr. Well, my co author, Peter Moon, can answer to that with greater detail. I, on the other hand, was born in 1966. And that's when the Montauk monster was unleashed. If you ever see the movie Forbidden Planet, which was produced in the 1960s, you've got this science fiction film with some of the best special effects anyone had ever done up to that time. You've got Robbie the Robot, of course, and Leslie Nielsen, normally a comedian playing a straight role as a captain of a flying saucer exploring the cosmos. But then you've got this monster that murders Earthmen in their sleep, this energy beast, invisible, intangible, with a touch that can melt steel and claws like white hot swords. So the United States Air Force managed to summon something a lot like the Forbidden Planet monstrosity and accidentally let it loose on Long Island on a fall day in 1966, the day that I was born. In a short version of the story, well, despite the hazards identified in the Philadelphia experiment, the government was still interested in exploring some of the possibilities offered by the technology inadvertently discovered during Project Rainbow. So Rainbow was used to signify full spectrum dominance that the Americans were seeking. Full spectrum dominance of every dimension. Not just ours. So a few years after the end of the war, as Americans understand it, understand that it didn't end until 1952, so the war with Japan was over by then, the Japanese-American peace treaty going into effect on the emperor's birthday as a sign of his victory. But by 1966, and still to today, America is still, along with all the allies, legally at war with the Third Reich in exile. But in the midst of the Cold War, as the Americans called it, because they couldn't legally declare a third world war with the Soviets, a quiet portion of Montauk Air Force radar station was appropriated for a continuity, a continuation of the experiments under more controlled conditions. The SAGE radar was supposedly positioned to watch the skies over the Atlantic for Russian bombers, was actually a massive land-based installation designed to duplicate the effects of the equipment installed on board the USS Eldridge back in 1943. Now from 1959 through 1983, experiments in teleportation, dimensional transport, and time travel took place on the eastern end of Long Island, only a few miles from the quaint summer beachfront homes of the Manhattan elite. Some of these experiments breached the dimensional barrier to whatever took place. Well, to whatever place it is that the Evanesers came as from. That's another story. But on at least that occasion of my birthday, something different came through. The Montauk monster was this rampaging force of destruction that angrily lashed out at anything, living or non-living. 
that happened to fall in its path. Slashing with its extremities, causing horrible burns. It's, well, it was basically an Evanescer in reverse. Just maintaining its existence in normal space using up whatever energy it had, outraged that it wasn't embodied in, packaged in a mortal coil to possess that would keep it in a dimension in a stable form. So it was basically enraged, feral, wild. It's uh, thus far, so far as I could see by the records I destroyed, appeared to have been the unique product of an experiment in dimensional physics. There were no other reports of similar creatures existing, but it's possible that any high energy physics experiment might breach the dimensional barriers and open a doorway for a similar being to step through. Fortunately, the monsters can exist in our dimension for only a few short hours before they vanish, never to return. Now, when they tried to theorize about it, everything suggested that the Montauk monster and the Evanesser were the same species perceived in two very different manifestations. Certainly the similarity of the special powers suggested some kind of link, and that forces me to go back to the Philadelphia experiment, which my legal father was a part of. He was a man of much combat experience and was considered, of course, valuable in action in the Pacific. But he had also served in the Mediterranean before the Pacific War began. He was originally a China gunboat sailor. My father had been all over and maybe that's why they wanted him to be one of the sailors in support of the program. Now, he wasn't on the USS Eldridge. He was, he was on shore. Now, in the summer of 1943, the nations of the world were engaged in the most titanic conflagration wrought by humankind, the Second World War. And in search for a decisive advantage, scientists on both sides were working feverishly to bring newer and more deadly weapons to the battlefield. And Project Rainbow, full spectrum dominance, was one such program. An attempt to employ the principles set forth in Einstein's incomplete unified field theory to render ships or planes invisible to radar. And that project later became much better known to history as the Philadelphia Experiment. Now, because the eccentric genius Nikola Tesla had killed himself, it was under the direction of John von Neumann, Dr. John von Neumann. The scientists and engineers of Project Rainbow appropriated for their experiments the USS Eldridge. DE-173 was its ship code. This newly constructed destroyer escort, then fitting out at the Philadelphia Naval Yard, and the Eldridge's, well, their gun turrets were removed and replaced with massive generators, and the entire ship was wrapped in magnetic coils. And on October 28, 1943, the Eldridge went to sea for the final operational test of the Rainbow equipment installation. At 5.15 p.m., three electrician's mates threw the switches that powered those math of well, those mammoth field coils. And a green cloud of mist formed around the Eldridge, and the ship grew transparent. And moments later, it vanished completely in a blinding blue flash. Now, to the observers, the command and support ships stationed nearby, like my father was on, the small destroyer was simply gone. Although eyewitnesses at the Norfolk Naval Base, almost 200 miles away, claimed that the Eldridge appeared out of nowhere and remained for several minutes before vanishing again. But when the Eldridge returned, it was clear that Project Rainbow had far exceeded the expected results of simply rendering a ship invisible and immune to torpedoes in our space-time dimension because it physically wouldn't be here. But by accident or design, American scientists had breached the walls of time and space, catapulting the ship hundreds of miles in the blink of an eye. The experiment was deemed a failure because the effects on the crew were extraordinary and horrible. Most men on board, the lucky ones, simply went irrevocably insane. 
spent the rest of the war confined in a special ward of Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland. Others were burned terribly, both inside and out, in a manner reminiscent of victims of spontaneous human combustion. A few simply vanished from the ship altogether and did not return when the Eldridge came back from wherever it had gone to. Most horrible of all, some men were actually fused into the steel superstructure of the ship when the Eldridge reappeared. Now, the small number of crewmen who survived the experience with mind and body more or less intact didn't escape the effects altogether. These sailors displayed a peculiar tendency to simply fade out of existence weeks or months after the experiment had taken place. Trois men caught in a barroom brawl in Philadelphia vanished into thin air at the sight of a dozen witnesses, never to be seen again. Another man was seen to walk through a wall and vanish. Likewise, never to be seen again. There are, of course, hundreds of men that were living for generations into the 90s or the aughts, the zeros decade of the first decade of this century. But no one aboard that ship on October 28th, 1943 survived, at least not to be sane. The Office of the Naval Research had this nice little form letter called OI-511 that denied any of this ever took place. But it doesn't explain why the Eldridge's own logs from July to December of 1943 are missing. Only I can explain that because I destroyed them. Now, what came back with some of these men, one of whom my father was physically in a fight with, one of those barroom brawls that sailors always get into, because the guy wasn't responding to him, he felt he was being disrespected. This is what you call an Evanescer. It's just basically something that it's not human at all something that's come back with a different kind of power uh but definitely not behaving as a normal human being it's how do i say this the experiment when it took place the way you could describe the results if you were somehow to try and partake in a, well, my father, he was brought in with so many other sailors because he had been a witness. They were basically presented something that was probably produced by L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard was a specialist in psychological warfare. That was how he became so adept at psychology. He was someone who was used to monitor the effects of the atomic bombs on human psychology at Enowetok at Bikini Atoll, where my father had served. So what he presented was the fact that uh, what the Navy got out of the deal that could be considered the most dubious success was that they got a number of Evanescers that came out of the Philadelphia Project. These Evanescers are the Montauk monster, in essence, but it's jacked a human body. So when these Evanescers came on back with the rest of the crew that was fused into the hull or uh, stark raven mad or burning alive, these faders look like any other human 
they were once human after all. The only real difference between an Evanescer and a human, the sailors called them faders, lies in the mind and the personality. The Evanescer's human persona has been completely compromised or replaced by an alien intellect from some distant reach of space. They don't speak much. They're often perceived as sullen, expressionless, apathetic. This is why they enrage a lot of people around them into attacking them. These Evanescers seem to download memories, learning from the people they've replaced. So they're familiar with details of the person's life and society, but they're cold, ruthless, brilliant imitations of the person they used to be. There's one more thing about the Evanescers. They don't age, at least not in the way most people do. Every Evanescer in existence looks exactly like its body did in 1943. It sticks to its cover identity unless threatened with imminent violence or confinement. That means that an Evanescer spends most of its time looking, acting, and reacting like an extremely withdrawn or quietly hostile human being. They don't use two words where one word will do. If confronted by a small number of enemies, the Evanescer may strike back with all its formidable powers, seeking to silence them forever. Against overwhelming odds or in difficult situations, the Evanescer simply leaves using its paranormal abilities. When a fader is not protecting its cover identity or trying to fit into human society, it moves quickly and ruthlessly to neutralize opponents in the most efficient manner possible. Uh, a fader breaking into a power plant uh, well, it simply evanesces, fades past the guards, murders anyone who happens to stumble across it while it's doing its work. Our, an evanescer decides that a situation is irretrievable and uses his powers to vanish instead of risking capture or incapacitation. They might use human weapons and tactics, but they don't arm themselves unless it fits the cover identity or they don't care who sees them in a fight. An Evanescer is much more likely to rely on its dimensional warping skills in order to neutralize or escape its foes as quickly as possible. They come to our world through doorways, portals, dimensional gates, or conditions resembling those devices. And whether they meant to or not, the scientists of Project Rainbow stumbled on the means of creating a doorway and managed to send, at best count, 120 human beings into a place where they don't belong. And the way L. Ron Hubbard presented it, and my father was sure it was him that wrote the presentation that was delivered to the sailors who had been involved with the project to warn them to be on the lookout and report if they ever found these men again. What they got back in return were 100 or so lunatics, 10 or 12 cadavers, and about a half dozen Evanescers human beings possessed by alien intelligences, driven by two primary motivations. First, they require electromagnetic fields for sustenance. While they're physio physiologically human, they, they alien intelligence that is imprinted over the human mind seems to require electromagnetic energy to stay alive. So they even raid power stations, electrical plants, radar stations, or TV and radio towers in an emergency but most prefer to establish a cover identity that allows them to access electromagnetic energy on a routine basis. Therefore, Evanescers pose as engineers, linemen, technicians, or scientists. Sometimes Evanescers sell their technical knowledge in the private sector, use their fortunes to create private power plants or stations where they can indulge their hunger at will. If you've got some eccentric millionaire whose desert retreat includes hundreds of acres of windmill generators. That could be an Evanescer laying low in his stronghold. In fact, some Evanescers, this is why the sailors were given the forewarning to be on the lookout. Well, they were entreated as if they were commie. They work for the government now, exchanging their knowledge of technology for facilities and funds suitable to their work. Some of these individuals were involved with the secret experiments at the Montauk radar station from the mid-50s until the mid-80s, dabbling in teleportation and time travel and broadcast power and other phenomena. 
You see, no one knows how many Evanescers there are. About six to ten of the Eldridge's crew and the technicians aboard the ship on the day of the test are currently unaccounted for. The uncertainty stems from the question of exactly how many technicians were even on board when the generators were started. Nobody counted. There may be more Evanescers, especially if the rumors about the Air Force's Project Montauk or similar Soviets experiments are true. So understand why this is so important to Peter Moon's story. Peter Moon writes about time travel. At the time of one of the atomic bomb tests where they miscalculated something that he became an alcoholic about because it haunted him the rest of his life. It was a test where they thought the world had ended. Castle Bravo, the largest United States nuclear explosion ever. When Project Castle Bravo was conducted, there was a technical advisor on board that my dad knew he recognized from the USS Aldridge. He felt so outraged, so violated, that at the moment the test was conducted, he lost his mind and attacked this individual, hoping to push him overboard. He was on a carrier. He could have done this. This wasn't like a ship with a guardrail. He found himself unable to move this individual. Squarely behind him when the bomb exploded. Trying to push him off. Deck. Everybody was too paralyzed by what happened to even notice he had broken ranks. The man he was pushing against just laughed. Turned into, my father swore, solid substance. You couldn't call it metal. Solid, opaque. That's what saved my father. They had miscalculated the power of the bomb. It was orders of magnitude more powerful than they thought. The world exploded. The sky disappeared. They could see space itself. Everyone could see each other's skeletons. Through closed eyelids. Through their closed eyelids, everyone could see the bones in their own hands. My father saw all the other sailors turn into skeletons. But the man in front of him protected him from all the radiation. By the time the sailors became visible again, they all glowed in the dark because it was pitch black. The sun had disappeared. All they could see was space. Then it rained black snow all over the Pacific. All the islanders and islands miles away melted alive. The sailors at the center of the test were like in the center of a storm. The eye of the storm protected from that effect. The majority of them would die of cancer. All of them technically survived, but not really. Sterilized. Burns equivalent to days in the sun, flesh peeling off in chunks. But that sheer opaque wall of something that my father was pushing against, reformed into a man again, turned back to look at him and laugh and walk away. But my dad was the only sailor able to help the others. They thought he was somehow superhuman, not realizing he'd been protected by an Evanescer. My father described that man. 
and he matches the physical description of Dr. David Lewis Anderson. The man who invented time travel for the United States. The man Peter Moon met several times. We never eat in front of Peter Moon. Married a woman he doesn't live with. Just to maintain the cover of humanity. Dr. David Lewis Anderson wound up working at Kodak. Kodak was gone. The Japanese had produced technology that rendered Kodak technology worthless. Kodak was an abandoned factory town, a ghost town. But they had an enormous power station. Because of his defense contracts, David Lewis Anderson moved in all by himself in an empty industrial site with its own hospital, abandoned amusement park for the kids, abandoned schools, and a power station that could have kept them all running. All feeding David Lewis Anderson. Chemical vats large enough to melt bodies in. Him living there all by himself for years. Feeding off the energy. Giving tidbits of his knowledge of metaphysics to the US government. That is a very interesting take on these events. Your dates seems to differ from the original legend, but I guess uh, they're coming from the Presidio's archives. That and my father, yeah. but uh, certainly the dates uh, from the Presidio archives fit into from my narrative. My understanding of what was put together by what I saw and what my father told me. My legal father, of course, the man who raised and guided me. Was Aquino what? aware of what was happening in, at Montauk? Yes, he considered Dr. David Lewis Anderson a great rival for black budget finances, for monetary resources. They were working on different projects. And uh, so he first made me aware of Dr. David Lewis Anderson's work with light cones. And uh, this is something that um, is uh, how I first became aware of Dr. David Lewis Anderson. And when I brought up the name with my father, then showed him some images is when my father identified him as the man who was at Project Castle Bravo. And the man he had earlier seen at the Philadelphia experiment. That Dr. David Lewis Anderson's knowledge is not that of a human being. That he's an Evanescer, a creature feeds off energy. People might ask, why don't they just take over the world? What would be the point? They're just here to feed. Uh, it's not in their agenda to administer, but to parasitize. What so, was Peter Moon's reactions to this? Peter Moon can't deny it. He says uh, that he, it's simply something that he feels that he has an affinity for Dr. David Lewis Anderson, but he understands he can't deny anything I say. He saw Dr. David Lewis Anderson. You're talking about a scientist who is a major physicist. He saw him in a kickbox fight where he said Dr. David Lewis Anderson was getting the beat down but then turned around and kicked the guy's ass, this professional master of kickboxing, no less. This is the stuff that happens only in movies. It's so cinematic, it's not even believable. The average person is getting beaten in a fight. The ability to recoup and recover yourself and then to persevere and prevail is, that's cinematic. It's almost impossible. It happens once in a while with true warriors, but we're talking about nuclear physicists <laughs> that can do that. That's a bit superhuman. Yeah. 
So Peter Moon's not able to deny what I'm saying. And when Peter Moon was with him and he had all his food, Dr. David Lewis Anderson just said, E, E. And Peter's going, Aren't you hungry? Don't you want some? No, no, I I don't eat food. <laughs> and you're telling me this guy is human? Please. I I also met him, by the way. I don't know if you were. And what was your impression? Alienated. I I was uh, with a psychic friend, yeah. which was actually friends of Peter's. Yeah. And she said that um, she's seeing like a Delta T antenna construction above his head. Okay. Yeah. Thank but you. he visit, he visited me and my friend in Bulgaria for a day, yes. which was strange. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, he appears at the damnedest places. And yeah. as you know, he's he's been in Central Europe. He's been in Bulgaria, Romania. He mm. gets around. Um, he is someone who uh, I think uh, at some point um, he Peter Moon was 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 just put it this way. It's it's one of these things where he's been a profound influence in Peter Moon's life. He may have been not so much influential in your life, but your meeting him is exceptional. Yeah, it's consider yourself to I don't know if I'd call it a privilege or a blessing. But <laughs> so consider yourself. It's it's certainly a rare experience. Uh, I treated him with Fanta. <laughs> what was that? I treated him with Fanta. OK, yes, oh, Fanta Fanta. Lee was, <laughs> he was oh. enjoying it. That's good. That's, that's there you go. So that's it. So he drank something in front of you. And, yeah, uh, yeah. That's not impossible, of course. It's uh, but that's that's interesting. The Fanta, of course, by the way, was developed by the Nazis. So that's that's actually yeah. quite ironic. Um, <laughs> so when, when it comes to the magic in warfare, I've described the kamikaze. The other was at uh, well, at the uh, as I said, Operation Desert Storm, where the Iraqi army. If you ever take a look at the damage that was done to the uh, to the Iraqi columns, what they called the highway of death, uh, entire military mechanized columns just devastated. You could take a look at all the air power of the Americans and the battleship offshore and all of this was immense. There was still more to it than that. That's not what gets an army to break that's been through eight years of war. I'm not sure I understood how was that how was that damage done? The, well, the damage was done a lot by American technology, air power, and the battleship offshore, and drones guiding the missile strikes. Um, he, much of it can be explained quite quite logically. The supernatural aspect comes with the break of the army's morale. The fact that so many of them surrendered without a fight, because when they fought back, they beat the Americans. Uh, the spoiler attack at Al Kafia uh, devastated the American Marine Corps. Uh, so you're talking about it's not like the Iraqis couldn't fight back when they weren't affected by the supernatural elements of the American assault. Michael Aquino's raising of the anti God. This is why when I was in Operation Desert Storm and was taking all these surrenders, like all the American Marines and Army were. You couldn't even call these prisoners. They were just like, just like frightened children. None of the Americans spoke Arabic or in those days, it was still nobody knew in any general popular sense. Nobody knew HP Lovecraft. It wasn't until after the 80s that people began to know about him in a more popular sense where he entered gaming communities and all that, because basically what had happened was Arkham House, which was run by the Edomite cult under the, the cultist that ran it. Uh, the man whose name, I hate him so much, I bleached his name out of my mind. Uh, I'd have to look him up, but uh, in terms of uh, Arkham House, their owner had basically stolen all of Lovecraft's work uh, Lovecraft had never willed anything to Arkham House, uh, which was simply created uh, in South City by August Derelith. I mean, his name comes back to me 
as in this flash of sickness, it makes me want to puke. But August Derleth had never met H.P. Lovecraft in his entire goddamn life. And August Derleth just came out of nowhere and said, I own all of H.P. Lovecraft's work. And nobody did anything about it. And he stole everything and kept it under copyright, lock and key, forever, for years. Not only reprinting it as misprints by altering the text completely and stealing Lovecraft's work, or writing his own work and claiming it was Lovecraft's just to make it sell. That son of a bitch pretty much made sure nobody heard of H.P. Lovecraft outside of occult circles. So at that time, just when Lovecraft was becoming to enter the popular culture, but was still very much only on the minds of teenage gamers or role, role game players or the like, role playing gamers. Uh, we didn't even have the computers back then for video gaming to the degree that we do now. So the closest thing, you didn't even have Cthulhu in video games at the, at the time of Desert Storm in any great degree, other than something similar to an octopus type of Pong or something. Uh, I don't think they ever used his name until the, after the Gulf War. But the prisoners that were coming in were all saying, Al Cthulhu. Al-Cthulhu. The Americans would just shake their heads and not know what the fuck was talking about, and they didn't care. So many of them had seen Cthulhu. They described it to me as I described him to you. Al-Shaitan is Cthulhu, reciting the verse from the Quran. So did Aquino invoke him? Very much so. Yeah. That was what defeated the Iraqi army, sent all the men running, demoralized them. That was, uh, yeah. that was how the Gulf War was won. It was, and, yeah, go on. And of course, the, the anti-gods and H.P. Lovecraft are a huge topic, which we would like to discuss in our further episode. But, Absolutely. Uh, for a final now, um, bring our attention to our geographical locale. Uh, yes, uh, you, could, you could understand that uh, we have uh, some personal interest, interest in any view or secret information you might have uh, concerning Bulgaria. Uh, could you give us anything at all in that direction, please? What I can tell you is that the the cult nature of Bulgaria is such that with all the intelligence that was amassed uh, from behind the Iron Curtain by the Americans, there was, I think, the most decisive or important thing that stuck with me all these years has been what I relayed about the Bulgarian treatment administered by Dr. Morel to Adolf Hitler, my biological father. I think that beyond that, what I need to emphasize to our Bulgarian listeners is that they must understand that in a very real sense, the future of the world lies with them because they're in the middle of everything. They're the crossroads between the resurgent and very aggressive Turkish Empire, the Black Sea, and the West, it's the future of the world in many ways will be decided in Bulgaria and the Bulgarian people need to realize how important everything they do is, that they have to make the right decisions and that they have to understand that they need to mobilize in a cohesive cultural identity, that they once had a czar of their own and that this renders them one of the only nations in the world to have a czar besides Russia and Serbia. So, honestly, they are one of the bulwarks of civilization itself. The, one of the heirs to the Roman Empire. Uh, whatever decisions they make, whatever direction or path they choose affects the rest of us. 
And as so few of us remain, as the populations decline everywhere from Japan to China to Russia to uh, anywhere in the developed world, they have to understand that they need to start reproducing. And um, if any of us are to have a future, and I would admonish, of course, all the developed world's nations in that regard, but in Bulgaria, you're holding a line, you're holding a front line. And we don't want to get political with it, but I think people understand the spiritual importance of what I've just said. Why do you think this area is so, is so pivotal? Is it uh, only because it's, it's a crossroad? There is that, but beyond that, the Bulgars are descendants of a kind of Slavdom that was once present in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bosnia and Herzegovina. They are part of an ancient Bulgar lineage of Slavs that is exceptional and unique. Something affiliated back to the original homeland of, uh, or heartland, that created the Alexandrian Empire. Alexander, of course, was Macedonian, not Greek. And for those who do not know, Macedonia was claimed by the Bulgarians, and Adolf Hitler acknowledged and recognized Bulgarian occupation of Macedonia in World War II. This was something that uh, is important to remember because this provided the Bulgarians an outlet into the Aegean Sea. This was also something that was pivotal to the original Alexander. People need to understand that the great leaders in the world who have changed world history have to be cosmopolitan. They cannot be regional and and what we would call, uh, oh God, provincial. They need to have a worldly identity. This is why Alexander the Great was not Greek. He was Macedonian. Adolf Hitler was not German. He was Austrian. Mm -hmm. Napoleon Bonaparte was not French. He was Corsican. Josef Stalin was not Russian. He was Georgian. Georgian. When it comes to Alexander the Great, you're talking about someone who can readily be identified with Bulgaria. This is a man who went on to conquer the known world at the age of 24. He is very dear to me because I am what I call cosmogony, obviously a hybrid between Asia and Europe. I am a product of both the Caucasoid and Asiatic bloodlines. Alexander the Great held the largest wedding in human history. He called it the marriage of East and West, in which each soldier in his army took a Persian bride. He himself converted to Buddhism. Had he not been assassinated, the Hellenic world would have been a Buddhist world, more aligned to what I've described about Asia and Shinto. What needs to happen is an identification with what Bulgaria is capable of. When I spoke of the Sofia, the very capital city in Bulgaria, which takes its her name, understand that the Russian Empire has been active in Syria for many years. What Bulgaria needs to do is culturally extend itself as they did under Alexander. Imagine instead of a papacy in Rome, which is indicative of patriarchy, a universal mammacy, a mammal or female papacy in, well, New Babylon, a reconstructed Baghdad. Bulgaria could be part of a project like that. Instead of Russian military intervention, 
a kind of Sophian intervention in that area of the world would be along the lines of what Alexander envisioned with his idea of a Buddhist Europe. This is something that uh, would usher in a new age, truly a new age, more matriarchal or matrilineal, something that would really help mankind evolve. This is uh, something the Bulgarians can do if they begin to lead the world by allowing, well, the woman to lead. It would maybe be an improvement from their current electoral cycle, but I won't go deeper than that. <laughs> <laughs> is that why America always wanted uh, divided Balkans? This is why America has done its best to destroy the Balkans. It, uh, it did its best when it launched a supermassive bombing raid into Romania. It uh, did its best when it used NATO to basically break its, its own mission statement, which was a defensive organization to stand against Russian invasion, and they instead attacked Serbia. This was a violation of NATO ordinance and its own reasons for existence. Uh, it's raison d'etre. The uh, Americans at that point rendered NATO in its own way an illegitimate organization, just as the United Nations was rendered illegitimate by its involvement in human slavery in Africa that I encountered. I think that uh, people need to understand that all the Balkans have never been united because it's been in everyone's interest to divide them, or render them impotent by uh, stirring hatred against each other. I think, of course, that uh, obviously uh, that entire region from the Baltic to the Black Sea is what geopoliticians call a shatterbelt region, meaning many cultures are here. We'll go into that next episode because much of this was fragmented, fractured by the Jewish pale of settlement. Uh, this is something that uh, help to stifle, stymie, or, or retard the growth of these cultures for many centuries. Uh, the cultures, of course, were shattered by the invasion of the Mongols. It's what led to the division uh, culturally of Eastern and Western Europe was those that were conquered by the Mongols and, and those that were essentially saved by Japan destroying the Mongols at the other end of the world. So when it comes to all that the Eastern Europeans have suffered, and I count the East Germans among them, uh, the, they are still the only real hope for the salvation of Central Europe, because even though there may be a demographic disaster, they are still culturally more intact. There's challenges to that. Uh, Bulgaria is certainly on the front line of that. Uh, but this is why there has to be a rally around cultural identity. When you speak of secret societies, there's a, another Freemason who had an enormous uh, influence on uh, so much of the world. Uh, an individual who uh, basically changed the world, who was half Japanese and half Austrian. As I am half Austrian biologically and a fourth Japanese and a fourth Chinese. I too am a child of nobility from my mother's side. This man was a child of nobility from his father's side. Richard Kodenhove Carlegi. The Kudenhove of Austria, Hungary. And he was really born Nicolas. E. Aijiro from his Japanese mother's uh, name. And Richard Nicolas Aijiro became the Count of Udenhov Kalergi. He was the man who pushed for a pan Europe, but he was predicting a blending of races. I understand that in America, 
this is much more necessary. In America, you have so many races extant that in certain areas, the major cities, they need to be safe. Well, safe zones for people like me, cosmogenates, what they used to call miscegenates, hybrid peoples or mixed race peoples. My point, mixed to the extent where I have a different species within me of humanity, not just I'm not just different racially, but in terms of human species. When it came to Richard Kudenhoff Carnegie, Adolf Hitler, my biological father, called him a cosmopolitan bastard because he was essentially trying to deconstruct the cultural identities of Europe. You could consider me an anti Carnegie, someone who's trying to preserve the cultural identities of Europe while demanding that certainly large zones of the United States become safe zones for hybrid people like myself. If people begin to interbreed in Europe, those products of interbreeding are welcome here in the United States. They don't belong in Europe. Europe needs to be considered a kind of regional safe zone for Caucasian man and woman. Just as the Asians and black Africans maintain an ethnic homogeneity, any attempt to outbreed the European races is nothing less than genocide. That needs to be acknowledged and it needs to be fought. It's what my father fought against. He believed in a superiority of all races in their own Lebensraum, our living space. This is something that needs to be communicated to the postmodern world. Whereas the Kalargi plan has resulted in so much damage to Europe, understand that I am my father's son and fight against what he has wrought. And that is something which I call on all Europeans to rally. Rally to, rally with, rally for. The human future depends upon it. Thank you for this call to unity, Douglas. Uh, for last question, could you please uh, tell us what do you think uh, of the role of Eastern Orthodoxy and Muko also told me that you have had some involvement with the Serbian branch of it. Yes, it's uh, this is what happened was when I served as a mercenary in the Balkans. I was employed by the Prince and Princess of Yugoslavia. Now, naturally, they would deny this, but there's enough witnesses around that would reinforce what I'm saying. It's not something that I have a need for people to believe. It's simply something that, well, they have to come to terms with if they want to understand my narrative. What happened was the prince and princess of Yugoslavia were never coronated as king or queen, but they still exist. They live in England, London, of course. Uh, in fact, the prince of Yugoslavia was born there uh, when the Yugoslavian monarchy uh, escaped during World War II. Uh, when the um, when it came to the Kaiser of Germany, even uh, they still exist as a royal family. They're simply not coronated and therefore they exist as a kind of royalty in exile or um, in both these places, whether Serbia or Germany, they need to reinstitute a constitutional monarchy it's just for cultural identity. And when it comes to the prince and princess of Yugoslavia, they were, of course, heirs to King Alexander Karadjordjevic's first Yugoslavia, and they would identify more with that, but they should be satisfied simply to come home to a constitutional Serbia that would welcome them, one would hope, in the future. When I worked for them at the time of the Bosnian conflict, they could not abide by a non-Christian uh, in their service, and I told them I had never been baptized a Roman Catholic, something my father, who was a Roman Catholic, again, very similar to Hudenhov Kalergi, whose father was Catholic. And when his mother married that man, 
she converted to Catholicism, which is what my mother did when she married my father. And when uh, uh, I had told uh, the prince and princess of Yugoslavia, my father had been so uh, understanding. He wanted me to make the choice for myself, so I had never been baptized at birth. Then I was baptized on the spot as a Serbian Orthodox Christian. No, <laughs> I've never really attended church very much, but <laughs> formally, yes, I'm Serbian Orthodox Christian. Uh, but you met an angel. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's it's an incredible life story. I mean, one thing that I've always told people about having experienced a life that was an endless sea of horrors is I'm never short of a story to tell. But when it comes to the um, being a Serbian Orthodox Christian, I do think that um, certainly Nikola Tesla needs to be recognized as a saint by the Orthodox Church. He was, of course, someone who was very cosmopolitan himself, and his cross-cultural cross reference was he identified uh, both Croatia and Serbia as his fatherlands, He, or rather Croatia as his fatherland and Serbia as his motherland. So he was someone who would have hated to see the fact that they uh, came to war with each other on such hostile terms. He would have probably been more a uh, Yugoslav. Of course, for American listeners to understand, if any Westerners uh, are listening, try to understand that Yugoslavia simply means South Slav. And the King Karadjordjevic once tried to get Bulgaria to unite with Yugoslavia. So it technically, integrates the Macedonians and the Bulgarians as well. But um, it's something that the Bulgarians wanted to retain their identity, and it was probably for the best. And I think that that should be the way that we work with this in the future. Certainly, the one thing that I do want to explain to people is that the, um, the Orthodox churches are probably in great need of a kind of reformation, just as the Roman Catholic Church has become very fossilized, very ossified, and corrupt. This is what I try to tell people. It's like being a police force. Any police force that tries to police in a highly corrupt area has to develop relationships with the underworld. You wind up dealing with informants in order to enforce the law at all. This means you also have to have undercover agents, and undercover agents then become involved with criminal organizations. Uh, effectively, they commit crimes while on duty as police officers. The lines become very gray, very blurred. So people need to understand that a church as old as the Roman Catholic Church becomes corrupted because of its exposure to so much of the exorcism, the demonolatry and diabology that then impacts the enforcers of the doctrine, the word of God. This is how churches become corrupted. The way that the Roman Catholic Church can save itself would be towards allowing women to become priests, allowing nuns more power, and ultimately uh, this could lead to a reformation of a sort that would certainly lessen the cases of child abuse. The Eastern Orthodox Church has been very fortunate in that it has not suffered such scandal, but it's still is very much a church that is very fossilized in many ways. <laughs> it has a, a kind of, it's important that it retain a sense of identity. And this is why many people were angry that the Roman Catholic Church gave up the Latin liturgy. The Slavonic churches still retain their uh, Slavonic liturgy. All of this is very important. Um, at the same time, I truly believe that uh, the idea of integrating Sophia openly into the church would lead to a kind of reformation that would make it much more identifiable with the entire population in the postmodern age. This would, uh, this would uh, render it something that doesn't look like something out of the Middle Ages. It would render it the hope of the future. As I said, Bulgaria, with its own capital, taking the name of wisdom herself, this would be a natural point for a orthodox revolution in a kind of Sophionic renaissance. 
a reformation of a sort that would then inspire the other churches, uh, attract younger generations in a, this is, Europe once identified itself only as Christendom. This would lead to a new Christendom. That would be my hope for the future. That's a great point to conclude. That was, that was absolutely mind blowing. We thank you for your service to mankind. And we'll catch up very soon with more show. God bless you. And thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. I will stop recording. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, let me see if I can find the button after all this time. And uh, the golden apple from our show. And today we want to welcome again the brilliant Douglas Dietrich. Uh, with whom we are going to expose more shadowed history and delve into the existence of cosmic beings which are of great threat to modern mankind. And uh, welcome, Douglas. And before that, uh, let's start with a rather huge topic. In the eyes of the rest of the world, you're notoriously famous with your alternative take of uh, the Great War. Where is uh, the best place to start exploring that? I, if the question ends there, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the answer, of course, takes volumes of books. The best that I can recommend before attempting to answer it as succinctly as possible is to uh, recommend the Roswell Deception, uh, subtitled and the Demystification of World War II by uh, myself, Douglas Dietrich, and my co-author, uh, Peter Moon. I do want people to understand that that will give you a far more complete answer, even though that is uh, not nearly as complete as I would want. Uh, obviously, someday I hope for a revised and expanded edition uh, to provide much more information. Uh, Peter Moon wanted to get it out right away, and I understand that it was important to do that but that always leaves room for improvement. Uh, that being said, I want people to understand that the important thing to remember about World War II is that in a very real sense, the Atlantic theater of conflict, the European theater of conflict uh, never ended. We are still legally at war with the Third Reich. Uh, the Third Reich government is now in exile. Uh, that is, of course, something that is uh, very intimately connected to my homeland and heartland, uh, island China, uh, Islas Formosa, which is the Portuguese word for a beautiful island. It is uh, the hundred islands of Taiwan on which I was born. The uh, entire history of Taiwan as a modern entity is uh, intimately connected with the Third Reich and uh, the Third Reich in exile because the nationalist Chinese government is itself in exile, an exile government not recognized by the United Nations because the United Nations is legally at war with Taiwan as the last remaining warring Axis power. Now, that's a very important distinction to make, warring Axis power. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the United Nations uh, is legally at war with what they call uh, Hitlerism. Uh, it is uh, distinctly in Title uh, 42 of the United Nations Charter. Uh, it is uh, um, not a nation state, so it does not have a constitution. It has a charter. Uh, and uh, so because it has uh, this uh, charter, Title 42 of that charter gives the reason for uh, the, uh, the the United Nations existence. Um, understand that the United Nations was uh, a product of World War II, far more so than people realize. Uh, it was established as an organization of war per its own charter in uh, January 1st of 1942, just a mere few weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor. On December 7th, uh, in by Western time, or um, uh, to the uh, if you go to the American side of the Pacific of the international dateline, uh, it was on December 7th, but on December 8th, which is west of the international dateline, uh, as opposed to east, uh, the Americas east of the international dateline, uh, Japan is west of it. 
In Japan, the Pearl Harbor attack was December 8th. So uh, in the West, on January 1st of 1942, just weeks after the Japanese surgical preemptive strike on Pearl Harbor to prevent an American attack on Pearl Harbor on, well, an attack sourcing from Pearl Harbor on Japan itself, which we outline in some detail in the book, uh, the Japanese struck out in self-defense to preemptively prevent that attack with a surgical strike uh, that was uh, very militarily precise and did very little damage to civilians. There were very few civilians that died uh, when they attacked uh, a preeminently military target, uh, even to the point where the Japanese ignored uh, the fuel depots because they didn't want to deprive the civilians of fuel through the winter. So the uh, Japanese were acting uh, both uh, rightly uh, and in self-defense and uh, the entire attack has been mispresented just as the war has been mispresented. Uh, in terms of the uh, American response thereafter, when they declared war on Japan and they rallied a united front of colonial allies to protect their colonial assets, uh, this was done under the auspice of the newly created United Nations, which uh, if for people who don't understand the dynamics of this, uh, all military manuals that were issued during World War II a good number of them that were issued by the Americans would emphasize that it was a United Nations conflict. They would say this is a United Nations conflict and that uh, uh, anticipated or presaged uh, the kind of United Nations uh, united front that they would present in the Korean conflict, which was simply in and of itself an extension of World War II. Uh, the Americans failed to invade Japan. They failed to uh, divide Japan between themselves and the Soviets in a frustrated uh, realization of that objective, they instead divided the Korean Peninsula with the Soviets based on the dividing line that the Japanese had created. It's not as if either the Soviets or the Americans were there to create the demilitarized zone. I explained in our last interview how the Japanese had used atomic technology to do this, atomic bombs that were built in North Korea from the same uh, Hungnam plants uh, in North Korea, the Japanese called it Conan Complex, and uh, this is the same complex that produces all of North Korea's bombs today, uh, which is why for the longest period of time, or forever until recently, they were producing World War II era atomic bombs, and uh, they were using World War II era Japanese technology. So when it comes to the Japanese having uh, atomic weapons, this is uh, beyond, uh, it, it's, it's simply indisputable. This is because the Japanese had an endless amount of uranium in North Korea. That's where the North Koreans get their uranium. They mine it from their own country. Uh, during World War II, all of the Korean Peninsula was part of Japan. It was uh, legally recognized as part of Japan, an integral part of Japan, as much of part of Japan as its four main islands. And uh, altogether, it's 14,000 islands as they exist today. Uh, so the entire Korean Peninsula uh, was accessible to Japan and was never bombed by the Allies. They never made it through Japan to bomb the Korean Peninsula where Japan's nuclear assets were being manufactured. So the Japanese used those to stop the Soviet advance, uh, creating thereby the Korean demilitarized zone. Uh, and then later the Americans and the Soviets fought over that peninsula while still legally at war, both parties with Japan. So the unrealized battle for Japan took place on the Korean Peninsula. It ended a year after uh, peace was declared with Japan in 1952. The Korean War um, came to a ceasefire. It has technically never ended. Uh, both North and South Korea are still legally at war. Uh, both my island China, as represented by the nationalist government, and communist China on the mainland are still legally at war. And uh, both Japan and Russia are still legally at war. The, all of this is accessible to anybody. Anybody can look this up. So when it comes to the uh, Japanese uh, winning World War II, uh, one other, so many other important things to keep in mind, of course, uh, but one of them is that the San Francisco Peace Treaty was drawn out between Japan and America and all of the allied parties except the Soviet Union in 1951. 
it went into effect on the emperor's birthday eve day in 1952 the anniversary thereof which we just celebrated through this weekend so um i want everyone to know that uh both uh, Simeon and Milko are interviewing myself on May Day, uh, as it's known through much of the world, especially in the former communist <laughs> nations. And it's uh, the 1st of May. Uh, April 29th was the beginning of what the Japanese call their Golden Week. So uh, just so that people understand, this is the Ogon Shukan. And this is Japan's version of the Chinese or Asian Lunar New Year Festival. In other words, the most important holiday on the Chinese calendar is the Asian Lunar New Year, in which they take uh, basically about 14 days off, uh, two weeks off. And uh, traditionally, it would be a full two weeks of everything shutting down in general. Uh, except emergency services. And uh, the Chinese take that very seriously, traditionally. Uh, the Japanese take this week as seriously as the Chinese take Lunar New Year. And uh, this is Japan's spring festival. It transitions April into May. We're still in the middle of it. Uh, we're uh, just past the very beginning of it. And the uh, golden week is when you have four nationally observed uh, public holidays uh, spaced in close succession to each other. Uh, but first and foremost among them, the holiday that starts the entire week off uh, was Saturday uh, this year, the 29th of April. And uh, what that is, is it's known as the uh, Showa no Nichi Hai. The Showa no Nichihai is the uh, Sunfire Day of Enlightened Peace. And this is Emperor Hirohito's birthday. Now, understand that, of course, Emperor Hirohito is dead. Uh, once he died, he uh, ascended into heaven, per Shinto belief. Uh, this is called apotheosis. That means that already he was recognized as divine, but essentially ascends to a newer level of godhood in the Shinto religion. And uh, this apotheosis is celebrated every year uh, in Japan to start off their golden week, the most important holiday season on the Japanese calendar. Now, Japan's been around 6,000 years and it's had hundreds of emperors and only one of them gets a holiday. <laughs> now, with every emperor, while they're alive, their birthday is a holiday, but only while they're alive. Out of 6,000 years of hundreds of emperors, only Emperor Hirohito gets his birthday honored after he died. Only he was considered to have attained such a state of apotheosis, of godhood, because he won World War II. So it's not like the Japanese don't know that they won World War II. They also knew who won World War II for them. Now, nobody in the rest of the world knows this. <laughs> no yes, matter why how much we... you try to explain it, most people just shut down and they refuse to listen. How, how do you control uh, such a massive narrative? Uh, what's that? How do you control such a massive narrative? It's just as a uh, Reich's propaganda minister, Dr. Paul Joseph Goebbels said, he said, you repeat the lie long enough, loud enough, consistently enough, people will simply accept it. And here's how to explain why this narrative is so controlled. The first off, it's important to understand the Japanese people themselves, understand that every, certainly before 1945, uh, now at the time of 1945, when the Japanese forced the Americans to basically repair all the damage they had done. And it's important to remember the Japanese demanded per their victory all kinds of things that you can verify on your own. You can look it up. I mean, just a great thing to emphasize while we're here together today, not only is it the emperor's birthday weekend, we're just emerging out of from Japan's side of the world, 
uh, which I spent the weekend celebrating, which is why I'm basically uh, hung over and crashing. <laughs> I talk right now to Milko and Simeon and uh, trying my best to talk through a pounding headache. Uh, I've taken a bunch of painkillers and uh, it's not so much that, it's the vomiting I'm trying to control, but everything altogether taken into account, I'll hold up as best as I can. But after this weekend of celebration, uh, the aside from that, it's important to know that recently in our latest interview before the one we're conducting today uh, with Milko and Simeon and uh, you know, the biological son of Adolf Hitler, uh, we are basically <laughs> talking about the, uh, the day in which uh, this idiot in America uh, named uh, Jack Douglas Tiagera uh, leaked a load of documents about the war with Russia and the Ukraine and everything else you can imagine. And this kid is just a reservist in the military, meaning that he spends one weekend of every month on active duty and two weeks out of the year in training. And other than that, he's at home the rest of his fucking time and is nowhere near a military base. But this individual had top secret clearance. And one thing I can tell you as a person who's worked with secret documents during the almost decade of time that I spent with the Department of Defense, I myself never had technically any security clearance. But what I can tell you is that unknown to most people, outside of the US military, top secret is the absolute bottom of the security clearances that you can have. There is hundreds of security clearances above top secret, hence the term above top secret. And then you get to the point where you've got crypto top secret, cosmic top secret, and various other forms of top secret that are beyond uh, accessibility theoretically to people without massive levels of security clearance and experience, etc. Now, this idiot was in a chat room with a bunch of other white male supremacists talking about their love of guns, and they all got together because they're gamers. And he decided to impress all his friends by just leaking everything he could to prove how important he was and having the absolute bottom level of top secret security clearance, he, abs he assessed the absolute top of everything secret in America at this moment concerning the war in Ukraine and other um, subjects and leaked it all just to show people how important he was. Now, this is an individual bottom level uh, reservist who technically should not be able to access any of this, but he was able to access all of it. So I hope that this reinforces, validates, proves everything I told Milko and Simeon in our last interview about how the United States government is dying. It is on its way out. There are no abilities to keep any secrets. It's the only reason that people can't find out everything that I've exposed is because it's not that people can't access it. It's because either because of people like me, the information has been completely destroyed or wiped out, which leaves you with all the circumstantial evidence I'm always providing, or that people don't know how to look for it because they don't know what to look for. People are not gonna find anything by looking up Japan won World War II in America, but then ask yourself, no matter what country you're in, how come after World War II, the Americans had to completely destroy their Department of War. America for hundreds of years had a Department of War. After World War II, well, in the middle of World War II, because if you look at the San Francisco Peace Treaty, World War II didn't end with Japan until 1952. America had to dismantle its Department of War in 1947, while they were still legally at war with Japan. It's because they lost the war. America had to uh, never declare war again. The Japanese told the Americans, you 
are never allowed to declare war again, ever, forever. Hmm. Then, and since then, then why the Americans have never again declared war. They cannot because they lost the war to Japan. Douglas, Douglas, uh, but why is Japan then tolerating that uh, globally pushed narrative or propaganda regarding the ending of the war? This is a question that is just based on, shall we say, understandably, a kind of westernized bias. And here we'll, we'll have to qualify. Understand mm -hmm. to all our listeners, of course, that uh, Simeon and uh, Milko are not Western by classic definition. Uh, they would be considered Eastern. But understand that all of Marxism that prevailed over first Russia and then China and then United Vietnam uh, and then Cuba and so much of the world, uh, that Marxism is a Western heresy that Marxism is simply a Jewish narrative created by Karl Marx, who was educated in Germany, but of Jewish ethnic origin. And uh, this Marxism became the anti-religion, the anti-theism, as opposed to atheism and anti-theism and anti-godliness of uh, so much of the world that then suffered under collectivization and uh, internal deportation and uh, gulagery and the massive pogroms that killed millions and millions of people, a population altogether equal to that of all of North America, uh, the United States and Canada combined. It's a veritable nation of the dead created by communism. Under this anti-theism of Marxism and under this kind of propaganda, this environment of total control, this matrix of information control, uh, the Zalviet's narrative, the Soviet narrative, was that uh, they had won World War II and they fed everyone uh, an endless series of lies uh, where no one was provided alternative information to grasp otherwise. So within this world where they told you that, oh, the Soviets, we, uh, we, we just invaded Berlin, where, of course, basically everything died. Uh, altogether, the Soviets lost a million men in Berlin. When Stalin gave Zhukov his orders, he told him, there are no more divisions. He said, this is it. We have nothing else. And they expended all that they had. Then they'll propagandize and say, oh, but then the Russians turned around and invaded Japan, or rather Manchuria, they'll qualify that uh, sometimes, but barely. And then they'll say, and we wiped out a million man army with these modern mechanized forces. Now, anybody can look up on YouTube, uh, any of these Eastern European produced propaganda films where you'll see this mechanized hordes that are overrunning Manchuria with these uh, Japanese units that are armed with swords, and it's all crap. The opposite is true. The films that you see that are genuine historical films, you see old men on horseback. These are the World War I veterans that Stalin had to remobilize. He, re he remobilized old men from World War I, and these veterans attacked Japan with cavalry, waving sabers. This is on footage. This is on film. This is what you see. This is the reality of their history. And then the Japanese under Emperor Hirohito pulled back because they had been ordered to, just like when he had the Americans in the Aleutian Islands. And people can look this up. The big battles in the Alaskan island chain, where the Japanese, as I said, uh, won the Battle of Midway, which the Americans will tell you again and again that they won the Battle of Midway and that the entire Pacific War was decided at the Battle of Midway. And they'll say, that's where we sank Japan's carriers, which of course Emperor Hirohito thought was the stupidest investment in the world of his Navy and didn't mind seeing destroyed anyway. And he sacrificed those gladly because he accomplished his objective, which was to occupy American territory. He occupied the Aleutian Islands, a thousand miles of American territory, 
and prevented the Americans for the rest of the war from bombing Japan from their own country, Alaska, where the Americans could easily have bombed Japan. Because he occupied those islands, the Americans not only had to dedicate one third of all of their manpower and material resources throughout the Pacific War to retaking those Alaskan islands for the next four years, they also had to initiate a deadly quote unquote island hopping campaign conducting this amphibious warfare campaign where they lost thousands and thousands of men taking tiny island after tiny island. Some of these coral atolls so small that you could see the ocean on either side of you wherever you were standing. You had 16 feet across worth of land where men were charging at each other with bayonets and shovels and samurai swords. And every time the Americans took one of these islands and lost thousands more men, it was also they could finally get in range to bomb Japan. None of that would have been necessary if they had held Alaska. <laughs> this is why Midway was a tremendous defeat for the United States. But they'll never tell you otherwise. Yet you can look up the Japanese occupying American territory throughout World War II, and you'll find out everything I say is true. The Japanese invaded America. But the Americans never tell you that. But if you look it up, you'll see everything I say is true. And then when Emperor Hirohito said, it's time to move out, the two major battles took place at Atu and Kiska. These were two islands in the Alaskan island chain, Atu and Kiska, and he ordered on one island for his forces to fight to the death. He said, fight to the death on this one island, and they all did. Every man sacrificed his life. The next island, he ordered all the men to withdraw under the cover of clouds. He said the fog's rolling in now. He was a marine biologist. He knew all about the weather. He said the fog's rolling in now. He ordered all the men to retreat by submarine. He said, everybody retreat, get into the submarines and get out of there. And when they all retreated and got into the submarines and got out, the Americans and Canadians invaded the second island. Through the fog, they saw each other and they killed each other completely. The Americans and Canadians wiped each other out. <laughs> and Hirohito just sat back and laughed while the allies killed each other. Are there regular Japanese aware that they won the war? Here's the thing that Japanese will tell you once in a while, the older Japanese. The older Japanese will say something like, oh, you know, we really won the war. They'll tell like get American guests if they get friendly with them. But they won't be able to provide any details. Uh, the majority of the younger Japanese have no idea and they don't care. Understand that to the emperor and the family, the Yamato dynasty, it's something the public doesn't need to know because it's not important. The public is got one of the highest quality life's uh, highest qualities of life in the world. They live the longest lifespans on Earth. The uh, they're the healthiest, wealthiest. They're among the healthiest and wealthiest people on Earth. Period. When uh, the emperor won the war, there were several things he was trying to change in Japan anyway. He was a scientist. And as a trained scientist, he understood that he needed the population to worship him as a god and obey him without question throughout the conflict. When he won the war and attained what he wanted, he wanted Japan to become much more scientific and much more rationalist. And so he was trying to tell people that he had disavowed his divinity. When he did this, he wanted Japan to go on a more modernist uh, road. And he understood that if he told them we won the war and defeated the Americans, it put him back into a position of godliness, godhood, divinity, of infallibility that he felt was not productive. He wanted the Japanese to question things so that they could progress. 
And because of that, he wasn't interested in telling the Japanese that they had won the war. He was interested in improving their lifespans, forcing the Americans to open their markets, which the Americans did, at which point the Japanese wiped out all American industry. Uh, American industry is dead. There is effectively nothing America produces. When Donald John Trump, who we'll talk about soon enough, again, his connections to Nikola Tesla, when Donald John Trump organized a space force, when he created a new branch of military service called the Space Force, one of the things that people can look up and find out is true about what I say is that he issued uniforms that were woodland camouflage. These are like old camouflage uniforms meant for fighting in forests. And everybody thought that was the funniest thing in the world. Like, uh, why is the Space Corps wearing these forest green uniforms, you know, with these like leaf patterns on them, like they're going to be fighting among foliage? Uh, and what the public couldn't understand was that Trump had demanded that this new American Space Force be issued uniforms made in America. And the last uniforms ever made in America were these woodland camouflage uniforms. <laughs> that every uniform ever since is made in communist China. That the moment America goes to war with the communist Chinese, they're going to war naked because they've got no one to make their shoes. They got no one to make their clothes. Everything they got, hell, all our medicines are produced in communist China. Communist China cuts off their meds and every senior American without heart medication or blood pressure medication dies. Uh, that's millions dead instantly. So it's basically America is a third world nation. As a matter of fact, America's lifespans are some of the shortest in the world. There's every developed nation on earth has a shorter, has a, has a much longer lifespan than an American. America can't even keep its citizens alive. So everything about America is exactly the opposite. All that you're hearing about America is based on the same kind of propaganda the Soviets used to feed you about how things are going great. And it's just like the Soviets kept saying, we won World War II uh, without telling everyone how the Japanese nuclear used nuclear landmines, essentially, buried warheads and ordnance of the atomic scale to disintegrate the advance. And that's why the Soviets stopped halfway down the Korean Peninsula. I mean, of course, has anyone ever asked the question, why did the Soviets stop? <laughs> no, uh, and the Soviets weren't going to tell anyone. Uh, well, the Japanese nuked us and we all disintegrated and that was it. So we just stopped. Uh, no, they wouldn't say that. Uh, were the Americans going to say that? No. Were the Americans going to say, gee, we lost the war. Our industry's gone. We don't even make our own uniforms anymore. Uh, our, our people live some of the your shortest lifespans in the world. We can never declare war again. And we no longer even have a Department of War to wage war if we declared it. Oh, no, of course, they're not going to say that. But uh, with the Japanese, understand that certainly before 1945, when they had the Americans come in to fix all the damage that they did and inject enormous amounts of money into the Japanese economy to help the Japanese rebuild from what damage the Americans had done, uh, no other country has been able to do this. There was, here's one of the big mistakes that adds to that propaganda. There was a novel written that was written after World War II uh, titled The Mouse That Roared. We can look that up uh, right now. I'll look it up and uh, find out what year that was written. Uh, and uh, the year that that was written was um, around 1959, uh, but it was actually published in 1955. It was made into a movie in 1959. So you're talking about a few years after the Japanese had legally won World War II, when peace was declared in 1952 on the emperor's birthday. Uh, the anniversary thereof, which we just celebrated this weekend. Now, just a few years after that, there was this Irish American named Leonard Wibberley, who wrote this satire, a comedy called The Mouse That Roared, where the myth that he started was that if you're a poor, small nation and you need money, declare a war against the United States and let them beat you 
and then they'll rebuild your economy and then you'll be rich again, comparatively speaking. And all of this was a propaganda novel that was contracted by the United States Department of Defense. This was an American hired by his own government to write this propaganda novel that they made into a film about this former British principality that is poor and then to get money they declare war on America hoping they can lose and then uh, you know have the Americans pay for it. Uh, all of this started the myth that if you declare a war on America, if you lose, they'll rebuild you up. And this was to explain the stunning success of Germany and Japan after World War II. Now, the reality is, if you look at any nation on Earth that America has gone to war with, Nicaragua, Panama, Vietnam, Cambodia, these are the poorest nations on Earth. North Korea. These are nations where, like in North Korea, they've literally had to resort to cannibalism. All of this is proof that no one gets rich by fighting a war with America. If they win a war against you and they lost a war to all these people, the Americans never defeated anybody except maybe Panama or Granada. Is anyone here like Granada is even a nice place to visit as a tourist? No. <laughs> they won against Granada and Panama, but that's like... Uh, that's like Milko and Simeon picking up baseball bats and waiting at the bottom of a wheelchair ramp. And, you know, when the senior citizens release the, uh, you know, the daycare center for senior citizens, the uh, elder care center sends them down on the wheelchair ramp, then uh, Simeon and uh, Milko bash them with baseball bats. That's what, you know, Granada <laughs> and Panama was like for America. That's not winning a war. That's 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 a massacre. Uh, it's on the level stats. of Indian extermination uh, that they used uh, to commit. So, Douglas, uh, uh, we wanted to ask you, do you think that on a deeper layer we can see World War II as a war between different secret societies or bloodlines? Well, I would say that um, this is very important because it goes to the heart of World War II, particularly in Asia. This will also bring us to the subject that we'll get to with the anti-gods. And uh, we're going to breach these subjects several times as we come back to them uh, when we talk tonight. But understand that uh, it, when it came to the uh, uh, fall, the sundering of the ancient state of Israel uh, that uh, occurred uh, so many thousands of years ago, Uh, we know at the time it was around 600 years before Christ. And uh, when the um, original Israelis fell and the tribes dispersed, uh, this was at the same time that uh, we had a uh, tremendous uh, cultural revolution uh, in Japan, which went from the Stone Age to the, uh, to the Bronze Age. Uh, this industrial revolution occurred because the uh, the primary tribe from Israel, uh, primarily that of the House of David, had uh, essentially relocated to Japan. Now, we know this because the Japanese relics of the Yamato dynasty have the shield of David on them. Uh, the shield of David is what's on the Japanese sacred reliquary of their uh, giant killer sword, uh, their uh, uh, pearl of, uh, well, their necklace of black pearls that are the size of bowling balls, uh, their uh, um, sacred mirror, which reflects how much of the dragon bloodline that a Japanese person has in them, the more of the Hachuri or the serpent people lineage that they have, the more stronger their reflection is in the sacred mirror of the Imperial House of Japan. Now, it was a stated military objective of the Americans that all of the Japanese reliquary was to be captured, uh, reverse engineered, uh, and ultimately destroyed once they removed uh, the secrets therefrom. Of course, the Americans lost the war, and that never happened. The sacred reliquary are completely forbidden 
for any Westerner to gaze upon, even but the they still exist, right? I'm sorry. They still exist, right? Oh, of course. They've never been touched by any of the Americans. The Americans were never allowed to touch them. Uh, the uh, Americans, of course, lost the war and therefore were never given access. Uh, the Japanese uh, imperial dynasty maintains them. Uh, so these are originally relics from the ancient sunken continent of Mu. For those who are skeptical, um, you're only advertising your ignorance. It's very important to <laughs> emphasize the fact that uh, the ancient sunken continent of Mu, uh, which of course I try to refer to as Muvaya, simply because it's more euphonic, it sounds better, but it's essentially spelled as Mu. Uh, people can look this up, of course, with the ancient writings of uh, the Kojiki, uh, but also there were Western researchers who've delved into this topic. All of this has been proven scientifically. The uh, modern geophysicists or paleogeologists refer to this as Zealandia. And Zealandia is what they insist is the seventh continent. This is the sunken continent under New Zealand that uh, is just orders of magnitude larger than New Zealand itself. New Zealand extends under the water uh, as another continent undiscovered by man uh, until recently, scientifically acknowledged. Scientists not only confirm it, they insist that other people uh, recognize it and that children need to be educated about it. All of this is true and people can confirm this themselves. That is the sunken continent of Mu, of which all of New Zealand is simply the mountaintops thereof, that the scientists have proven exists and want people to also accept exists. And that was the continent from which the Japanese had emigrated. All of the tori, the wooden gates throughout Japan that look like the Greek letter pi or the mathematical symbol, these gates represent the ancient teleportation gates by which the Japanese emigrated en masse from that continent when it sank during the ancient wars where Scalar weapons were used that basically turned the ground into liquid and sank it, but it sank just beneath the surface of the seas. Uh, so close to the surface that scientists have to count it as effectively part of New Zealand. So this was essentially where the Japanese had originally emigrated from. Another fact here that proves everything I say is the fact that the uh, people who investigate how life came to New Zealand, we'll find out that New Zealand was never colonized by human life until literally just a thousand years ago. The Maori, the indigenous people of New Zealand, were only there for maybe a few hundred years, a thousand years before the whites arrived. They had colonized what they themselves will say was a completely empty continent. They said all the land had no human life. They came and inhabited it. What they were inhabiting was simply the mountaintops of Mu. And then the whites came and tried to exterminate them. So these ancient relics are Muvian. This is why they're so spectacular. This is why you have this mirror that can reflect the very genetic makeup of a person. You have the uh, black pearls that create this sacred necklace where the black pearls themselves are the size of bowling balls, which must have come from uh, ancient mollusks that were enormous. The uh, sword that is able to kill giants is said to have been able to cut through trees in a single stroke. Uh, these were only embossed with the seal of David when the tribe from Israel established itself on Japan. For those who don't understand the reality of that, uh, basically what happened was that uh, uh, between 600 to 500 years before Christ, uh, then what happened was that uh, the Japanese compiled the first Hebrew Japanese dictionary. This is a historical reality. Uh, the first Hebrew Nihongo uh, dictionary speaks of the god emperors as incarnate through the Kuzoku 
or the imperial family of Japan, the makuya, that's the Japanese language equivalent for the Hebrew word mishkan, refers to the holy tabernacle. That's that portable shrine where God and man encounter per Exodus, the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 29, verses 42 through 43. Now, this is, of course, popularized through that American propaganda film, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the original entry into the film franchise. Well, you see that in Japanese parades, whenever there's a holiday and all these men are bouncing that portable shrine off their backs, that's representative of that ark, which came to Japan. So the Japanese inherited that technology, but they took none of the negative aspects of that patriarchal culture. Instead, uh, they began the commencement of the written Japanese calendar, commemorating the coronation of Jimu Tenno. Jimu Tenno Heika is the first recorded Japanese emperor in the year 660, 660 years before Christ, per Western chronometry. And it is the conviction of the Makuya minority of Japan that the triune sacred treasures of the most ancient extant imperial dynasty on earth are the uh, relics that now bear the shield of David because they were simply had that embossed upon them at the time of that revolution and the coronation in writing of that emperor. Uh, so the six pointed symbol of Judea being a shield, not a star, became the shield of Japan. So understand that uh, these Trinitarian treasures they're known as the uh, they're the treasures of the Koshitsu Yamato or the Imperial House of Greater Manifest Balance, which the Americans wanted to scientifically analyze, reverse engineer, reproduce and ultimately destroy thereafter per their genocidal policies. Their demoniacally hubristic objective was based on exterminating the Japanese as the true Jewish people. So understand that these are where the bloodline wars come in. America was locked in a racial war with Japan where they were determined to exterminate them because they saw them as the true Jews. And yet the Japanese were recognized by Adolf Hitler as true Aryans. This is because ethnically their bloodline connected to Germany through ancient India. When the British invaded India, they encountered the Dravidians. And if people look at the map of the Dravidians in India, they're all in the South and they are black. They are Negroid and they are not Aryan. This is what the British first encountered and they call that Elder India because that's the first India they conquered. It took them ages to conquer Aryan India in the North. Aryan India in the north was the genetic source point for much of the Indo-European, it has Aryan bloodline going into Central Europe and towards Japan. So the Japanese are ethnically Aryan with a cultural embossment or imposition from the original Judaic tribe. The only pure ethnic Jews are within the minority in Japan known as the Mikuya people, M I. Uh, M-A-K-U-Y-A in the romanization, M-A-K-U-Y-A. And uh, the Makuya people, the people of the Ark, uh, they are the people who have the most Jewish blood in them in Japan. The majority of Japanese are Aryanized in their bloodline from the ancient influx from India. But because of their original bloodline from Mu, they are hybridized into that as not even being fully human by standard definition. They're not baseline human. The Hachurui or the serpent lineage from ancient Mu, the sunken continent, gives them what's called the dragon bloodline. So the most pure dragon bloodline is the imperial family. But until the Americans started coming in and injecting all the money the, the Japanese demanded because the Japanese had won the war, the Japanese were very purebred in terms of all this hybridization, that is. And it's important to remember the Mongoloid influence from China that I brought up from my mother's bloodline, 
from the original alchemist Fu Zhu escaping from the first emperor of China with 3,000 children uh, to prevent the emperor from having them skinned alive and their innards removed to extract the elixir of immortality. That southern dynasty, the Kyushu dynasty, later fought by the Yamato dynasty, retreating back into China, then reunifying with the Yamato dynasty through my mother's marriage, or rather her father's marriage to a Japanese woman of the ninja clans, providing that reunification of those dynasties. Uh, that Mongolized, hybridized Japanese ethnos had driven the original archaic indigenous white people who were Caucasoid, the Ainu people, A-I-N-U, north to where they exist today on the island of Hokkaido, which is considered a great frontier island uh, where they live with the indigenous Japanese bears that roam wild on that island with the Ainu. These are like Japan's version of Native American Indians, but they're all white. And so the Japanese, even though they're the Caucasians of Asia through all of that interbreeding with the whites that they expelled, were essentially a culture that was very hybrid, but very pure in its own right until the end of World War II. So around the time that the prosecution of hostilities ended, 1945, up until that point, you could you could say definitively that every Japanese person in Japan was in one way or another related to the emperor. They were essentially one giant family. This is another reason why they all protected him so, uh, so fanatically. But of course, the pure bloodlines at the top were less and less, are less and less baseline human. This is why every once in a while they have to marry a commoner, bring a commoner inside. Uh, it's not just for incest. It's the fear of not looking human enough. This is all true. It's not meant to be somehow disparaging. This is the dragon bloodline at the top. So to them, it's not necessary. Think as they would. It's not necessary that the people, even if they're your relations, your one giant family, it's not necessary that they know everything. In fact, uh, there's very little they need to know if from the emperor's perspective or the perspective of the imperial family. Uh, in some cases, the less they know, the better. So it's just best to have them uh, go on uh, living life, enjoying life, enjoying the benefits of winning the war. But you don't need to tell them why or how. So that was their perspective. Very practical, very pragmatic. And they didn't care about the Soviets. Uh, and the Americans and the British making this claim that they won because it's obvious to the Japanese people they didn't. <laughs> Everyone in Japan, say for instance, there's this one man who was writing on YouTube in this comment that he entered. He said, I stopped this Japanese girl and asked her what she knew about the war. Uh, he was trying to ask her about atrocities, if any of these Japanese are taught about Japanese atrocities during the war. And she just told him, I, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. And then went away. And he was just writing about how ignorant the Japanese are. And I'm like thinking, say if you were some white girl and some crazy looking Asian guy grabbed you by the arm and started talking to you about this World War II, saying, hey, do you, you know what you did during World War II? What would the white woman do? She would basically say, look, I don't know what you're talking about. And try to get away as fast as possible, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just a normal reaction uh, that any human being would do. So this is uh, another factor. The Japanese have the attitude of humor the crazy white man. Uh, basically, white men in Japan, the one thing that they all have in common is the Japanese pretty much think of them all as crazy. Uh, there's nothing they do that makes sense. Uh, they go there, they get drunk, they complain, they, uh, they cause trouble. Uh, in terms of the Japanese police force, it's one of the most professional in the world, but it's really good at dealing only with Japanese. About 100% of the crime, 100% is committed by foreigners. Yeah. Now, that brings up, what about the Japanese Yakuza, which is their mafia? The Japanese Yakuza have a deal with a government where all their crimes are committed overseas. They commit their crimes in the Philippines. They film their pornography in the Philippines. 
they have to censor it before it goes back to Japan, where they cut off all the digitize out the vaginal lips and pubic hair. Ah, in, that's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. In Japan, if you are able to get an uncensored copy of a pornographic magazine, whether it's Playboy or white girls or Japanese girls, you could sell it for thousands of dollars. You'd also be committing a federal crime that would, if you're caught, you'd spend years in jail. I'm not talking like, hey, man, you get arrested and, oh, man, you're fined and, and you get a few days in jail. No, it's years. You're going to spend years of your life in jail if you get caught. So the Yakuza take all these women from Japan, film their pornography in the Philippines, do their human trafficking there. And by the way, these, these women from Japan are not victimized. Uh, the, one of the most famous actresses, if not the most famous actress in Japan, Sora Aoi, was a pornographic actress who gave me her timeline on Facebook when she retired and got married. <laughs> and um, so Sora Aoi uh, taught all the Chinese boys about sex because they've got a 75% male population and no woman to look at. So they were the biggest purchasers of her porn. And uh, so she's recognized in Japan. She's famous, but her films were never filmed there. Her films were all filmed in the Philippines. So, you know, you have the Yakuza and literally when they do get into gang fights and they start shootouts, uh, they, uh, you, if, and they wind up shooting an innocent person, the Japanese person who's injured is allowed to sue them. So you can sue the Yakuza in Japan if they involve you or you get injured in one of their gang fights and you get caught in the crossfire. Uh, they were the only people who purchased American cars because American cars were big enough to stick bodies in. Uh, the Japanese cars were too small to fit bodies in. So they would just slam, a, you know, bodies in trunks of American cars. And because of this, they were the only people in Japan buying American cars. And whenever the police would come down too hard on them, they threatened to stop buying American cars and throw the trade balance off. Uh, so it's like they have this deal with the government. So they, and if the police clamp down on them too hard, they'll start protesting. They actually just imagine the mafia protesting in any other nation on earth. They'll actually organize their families and they'll protest that the police are clamping down on them. Now, to give you an example of what made the Yakuza grow so enormous was when the emperor ordered the kamikaze attacks uh, and people would, of course, volunteer or be drafted into the kamikaze attacks, uh, the Japanese family would automatically hold your death ceremony. And at that point, you were legally dead. So when the Japanese won the war and the emperor called off the kamikaze attacks, basically said, okay, there's no more need for that. Um, call those guys back home. The survivors who hadn't gone on their one-way trips yet uh, were considered dead by their families. So they all had to join the Yakuza because they were legally dead. So that was how the Yakuza grew so enormously after World War II. It grew by orders of magnitude and became enormous. Uh, it was all these kamikaze pilots who didn't die. <laughs> then, they, uh, then they began to run this crime dealing with the government saying, OK, we'll run it out of the country. So uh, believe me, whenever crimes are committed in Japan, like crazy crimes, psychotics, uh, petty stuff like murders for burglary and theft, all the rest of that, a rape, it's all foreigners, 100 percent. And so the, this is like uh, what people need to understand about Japan. Japan understands one thing about foreigners. They're all crazy. They're all dangerous. Uh, there's no point in talking to them because they're crazy and they're dangerous. So you just tolerate their presence. You can be friendly with them, but you really, in general, uh, every once in a while, some girl will wind up marrying one. But if she does, she pretty much separates from her family. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, uh, other than that, it's like, uh, if some guy marries a, some woman who's a foreigner, they usually separate from their family too. It's, it's just something that, and, and to bring us back, and all of this is important because all of it is connected. All of this connects to the anti-gods ultimately, to the American, the bloodlines, the warring bloodlines. I think I've already given people a perspective on World War II between warring bloodlines between Japan and America. How the yeah, American- Can you just tell us something? Uh, uh, that was a fascinating uh, piece of our secret history, but. Uh, according to the official narrative, um, of course, Japan and Germany were allies, mm -hmm. but yes. uh, uh, Hitler was were, was uh, exterminating Jews, and you just described the Japanese as 
um, the original Jews, to, to call them that. Well, How do you explain would, uh, this paradox? Sure. I'm, I'm sorry, say that last phrase again. How can it's you explain a, this paradox? Yeah. Okay. It's not a paradox when you understand the fact that, um, say for instance, we're talking about um, the Zionism and Herodian uh, insurgency that I bring up in connection with the anti-gods. Uh, we brought up H.P. Lovecraft. We'll bring him up again uh, because these things repeat in cycles. So it's important to understand Adolf Hitler, H.P. Lovecraft, the Jewish phenomenon, how all of this is connected. Basically, H.P. Lovecraft, okay. how it if, if we go into H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, let's, uh, let's save it for later then uh, about concerning this question. Uh, you just said that um, the Japanese uh, never took advantage of uh, the, the new technology. And uh, you also mentioned in our last interview that uh, the Western model is raping the nature and the Eastern model is cooperating with it. And the conclusion of uh, your story about, just, about Japan is proving that. Can you apply this to their mystery schools as well? Absolutely. Um, my mother was a member of that mystery school, so uh, that requires some explaining so that people understand the kind of uh, uh, depth that we're going into. All of this, of course, I will do my best to put into um, a perspective. Uh, and uh, I think that um, this will take um, a little bit of a tangent that is extraordinarily important. Uh, and then I uh, will return to my mother. Um, of course, what you can, if you want me to, I can go into uh, my mother's, my mother first, what she was uh, dealing with in terms of her mystery school. But I think it's very important for people to understand that when it comes to, say, for instance, uh, things that go on in Japan that people are unaware of or not made aware of. Uh, both our friends, Simian and uh, Milko, were bringing up the last time uh, when I spoke of Shinto, uh, when I spoke of Shinto and working with Japan's nature uh, about how this enabled uh, the Japanese to call upon their gods to expand their land so that the number of islands doubled overnight and how this is uh, imperative in the existential danger that Japan is facing from its enemies. In this case, the North Koreans and the Communist Chinese and uh, their nuclear just, weapons. Just to clarify something, sorry. Do you think that these gods are solely nature spirits? It's uh, these or are, is there something uh, beyond? Yes, yes, absolutely. Understand that uh, when the ancient war happened, the prehistoric war between Atlantis and Lemuria and the continent of Mu, when scalar weapons turned the molecular composition of the earth into quicksand beneath people's feet. This liquefaction resulted in people literally being swallowed up into the ground as they would be in a pit of quicksand. When entire populations disappeared to suffocate within the earth itself as it sank, and these continents disappeared beneath the waves. What happened was the Japanese population that was evacuated from Mu, from what is today recognized as Zelandia, through the ancient teleportation gates that are honored in Shinto via the, the Tori gates throughout Japan. These uh, people were saved by the ancient Muvayan. Are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Stop, pause. Tony, ask me something. Are you able to hear me? Okay, so apparently we've lost connection. Let's take a look here. Okay, um, I can still hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Are you there? That's weird. Well, it must be on your end. Oh, 
Okay, I'm going to wait for you to contact me. On and uh, Douglas, you were telling us about um, the teleportation gates. Yes, and how um, the Japanese uh, population was evacuated en masse. What they were evacuated by was the ancient Muvayan priesthood, which was a matriarchy, and the priestesses, the matriarchy thereof, they uh, were unable to use those same teleportation gates to evacuate physically because they were effectively manning the gates, so to speak. In other words, because they were running the gates or manipulating them, they could not put themselves through them uh, manifestly, materially, physically, bodily, corporeally. Therefore, they evacuated incorporeally. Spiritually, they committed to metempsychosis. Metempsychosis is transmigration of the soul. And they relocated to the Japanese home islands as those spirits which became the Shinto nature spirits. Ah. This was the source of the Shinto nature spirits that settled in the mountains and in the rivers and in the landmarks of Japan that became the foundation for their religion, where their spirits were immortal, but tied to the earth. That now, makes a lot of sense, actually. Thank you. And uh, this is the uh, ancient uh, tradition that was guarded by Japan's occult bureau. Now, the horror of the situation today is that people need to understand that one of Aquino's, Michael Aquino, who we've explained in our last transmission, we'll delve into again tonight, but one of his propagandists, an acolyte of his in England, where he had established churches, what he called pylons or branch churches of the Temple of Set, was the woman who wrote Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling's. She became a multimillionaires supported by the Temple of Set, producing books about Harry Potter, which is a perversion of the ancient Vedic Hindu term, Hari Puttar, son of God. When huh. she wrote these books about the son of God, Hari Puttar, but pervert it, invert it satanically into Harry Potter, like a hairy beggar, a Potter meaning a beggar, in the English words, then she's committing this satanic inversion in which she portrays the Japanese Occult Bureau. So whenever anybody looks up the Japanese Occult Bureau, all you're going to find is Harry Potter. <laughs> so understand, you have to know how to spell, at least in the romanization. Now, I understand most people can't write this in Japanese, wouldn't know how to enter it on the computer in Japanese, so you're going to have to spell it in the Latin alphabet, on Murio. That's O N M Y O R Y O, on Murio. I don't Via remember Murio. a Japanese occult bureau in Harry Potter, by the way. Why, where, where was that? I don't remember I, a, 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 Jap a Japanese occult bureau in Harry Potter. You know, I never read the Harry Potter works, but I know one thing. Everybody who I was talking to about the Japanese Occult Bureau, every time they look it up, all they find is Harry Potter. <laughs> I can tell you that. So apparently there's reference to a Japanese Occult Bureau in Harry Potter. Right? Okay, okay. Because this is what keeps coming up for most people on their searches, in the United States at least. Uh, so uh, now Japanese wizards are known as on Myoji. And the that's O N M Y O J I. Uh, so the Onmyoji. Just so people understand, you're also going to get profoundly misleading history. Uh, obviously, uh, the one thing that Emperor Hirohito did, being a scientist and wanting his people to um, essentially progress in a more materialist and rationalist direction. He made the Onmyorio, the occult bureau, secret. So understand that if you look in Japanese history, at least translate it into English, 
you're not going to find you're going to find all this stuff about oh then the japanese outlawed it then the japanese uh that basically uh you don't have one functioning all of this is bullshit technically the on Murio still exists it was abolished so that the west would not know about it during the meiji restoration which happened during the american civil war um you see this popularized um somewhat accurately uh through the movie with tom cruise uh peter moon's fellow scientologist in the last samurai uh now there's a lot i don't like about the film namely it's got tom cruise but <laughs> all of that <laughs> gives people a good idea of what happened in general but it happened at the same time as america's civil war essentially um so the meiji restoration was japan's civil war in which the samurai were effectively uh declassified meaning they lost their class status and the emperor uh defeated them with a european trained peasant army using modern technology so this meiji restoration in which the emperor took all secular power uh took it back after a thousand years of samurai rule when the emperor did that then you had uh simultaneously in the middle of the war the death of the last uh proper on Myorio grand master uh Suchi Mikado Haruo, one of the few people to have the word emperor in his very name, Mikado meaning emperor. Suchi Mikado Haruo died, but its functions were split into three organizations, two of which fell under the purview of the Imperial Japanese Navy. But one, the astrology department, was allowed to exist under Suchi Mikado Herinaga. Notice the similar similarity there to. Harry Potter, uh, Harry Naga, of course, being a Japanization of the word breath, hare, as in hare kiri, which is a not a proper Japanese word. It's an Anglo bastardization to describe suicide by cutting open the belly, the belly and releasing the breath of life itself, hare kiri. Uh, hare combined with nyaga, naga being the snake people, the people, uh, giant serpents with the minds of men that were guides for humanity uh the ancestors of buddha who is said to be of the nyaga the serpent lineage this is a fact most people don't know so the very name hari naga the breath of the serpent suchimikado the emperor of the serpent breathers was the last onryo nokami uh, master of the spirits for a while before it was abolished and absorbed into the jingi khan in 1872 the jingi khan was abolished just to appeal to the world it wasn't because the americans even asked for it to be abolished indeed they never knew about it but because the japanese didn't want the world to know about it emperor hirohito wanted to appear as a scientifically modern nation and start trade with the world since they had won the war even though they were still dictating their terms to the americans and in talk down process negotiations uh the jingi khan was abolished so that japan would appear very modern and its functions were absorbed into the imperial household agency itself as the shikibu shoku the board of ceremonies so the board of ceremonies which still performs many of the old ritual functions of the onmyorio it's simply the latest of which the series of divinations on the enthronement of the new emperor. Uh, it's the postmodern day version and descendant of the on Murio, which my mother was a part of. So this is a wizard's bureau that is thousands of years old. And uh, the on Murio uh, were the people who uh, helped Japan win the war in their own way. Uh, there were many factors, of course, in winning the war. Uh, but the on Myorio was one of them. Now, when it came to my mother's specific assignments for the on Myorio, this was in cooperation with the Kempei Tai. The Kempei Tai literally translates into the English as thought police. It's where George Orwell got the term for his novel, Thought Police in 1984 where he also speaks of East Asia, 
which aspires towards an elimination of the self in his remembrance of the kamikaze tactics. So when it comes to uh, why George Orwell used that term to generate fear is because the Kempeitai, the thought police of Japan, were Hirohito's Gestapo. And um, they were, of course, used all over Asia. And uh, they were the police who had power over the military. They would investigate the military when it came to corruption. So they were feared by all. They answered directly to the emperor. And one of the greatest problems that the Japanese were confronted with was the fact that the Americans were diabolic, evil in the extreme, dedicated to the anti-gods, which we will go into. But understand that when it comes to this kind of warfare, this kind of secret war involving the occult, involving uh, the uh, just, it's not just cultures or bloodlines. We're talking about attempts to control the destiny of evolution, humanity itself. The important thing to remember for anyone who suffered under communism in Bulgaria, everyone knows the horrors of communism, what it was like to live under Soviet oppression, Soviet oppression in which entire cultures were forced to Russify, uh, grow up learning the Russian language, uh, basically buying all their crappy products, uh, having no alternatives in life, and uh, being told that somehow this was an utopia, uh, that someday it would all get better. Uh, imagine someone being so crazy to live in freedom as to want that lifestyle. That's how crazy the Americans were. All the Americans were fighting for communism. Franklin Delano Roosevelt made his vice president, and bear in mind, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a very, very sick man. We're not just talking mentally ill, as in psychotic and pathological. Physically, he was extraordinarily sick. We're talking a man about a man who was just so profoundly sick that he was in a wheelchair, and every day he was living was declared could be his last. So when we talk about, uh, I believe her name was Jean Dixon, she was his occult advisor. Uh, and uh, I'm going to look that up just to make sure I've got that right. Uh, but he had an occult advisor with a crystal ball. Uh, and uh, I believe it was Jean Dixon who was his uh, personal occult advisor. Matter of fact, I know that to be true. So Jean Dixon was a woman who literally would go into the White House with a crystal ball, and she ran World War II for the Americans. This is something no American has ever taught, but I worked with all the secret documents that proved it to be true. And anybody can look it up. People will look up that Jean Dixon was allowed to go into the White House to see President Roosevelt personally about the war. That's something people can look up on their own. But you need to understand that no person could do that without the highest level of security clearance. So Gene Dixon had the security clearance of a top general in the US Armed Forces. What most people don't know is that she ran the war for the Americans. She would go in and tell Roosevelt what to do. Because he asked. He'd say, what do I do? And she'd give him the advice. And understand that every time he would ask her, how long have I got to live? And she would put her fingers together like you're playing a tiny violin. And she'd always say, that much. <laughs> every time she saw him, she was telling him, you could die any second. Every breath you take should be your last. And ultimately, he did die in office. Now, his vice president, the man who was supposed to take over 
was a card-carrying member of the American Communist Party. Henry Agard Wallace. And Henry Agard Wallace was determined to collectivize American agriculture on the Soviet's model, eliminate all industrial business, nationalize all private property and Sovietize the American economy, eliminate all rival parties and put everything under the single communist party state. This was his stated objective. This is why American industrialists had tried to overthrow Roosevelt when he was elected. They tried to hire a Marine, Smedley Butler, who took their money and then turned them in. But because they were the only people providing employment at the time that America was in the Great Depression, Roosevelt couldn't do anything to them. He needed them to produce munitions and armaments for his war. So he couldn't touch them. But all stupid Americans think Smedley Butler is a hero when he was a card carrying communist. And him and Henry Wallace wanted to take over America and render it a Soviet satellite state of the Soviet Union. So just months before Roosevelt died, the American government desperately threw out Henry Wallace and put in Harry Truman. Harry Truman never met Roosevelt, or rather he met him only once in the month before he died for a photo opportunity. A photograph was taken of the two of them together, but Roosevelt was too sick to talk to him. Too sick to say a word. In fact, when Roosevelt won his fourth election, his fourth term in office as president, his Marine Corps son was holding him up from behind like a puppet because he had fainted. He was taking the congratulations from the audience for winning his fourth presidential term when he collapsed, and his son held him up from behind like he was a mannequin. Kept his completely spent body standing up artificially and then literally backed him up away from the cameras and walked him back away so nobody could see the man was completely unconscious. It was how, how is that connected to, to the Armada and uh, the Japanese and Germans and uh, During the time that the Jews. Roosevelt was president, the two things happened. One was that they had heard that the golden child was born in Mongolia. This is what the Tibetan Buddhists said would be the return of the Maitreya, the Buddha that would save mankind. The Americans referred to it as the Christ child. Henry Agard Wallace was sent to Mongolia with United States Special Operations Forces to kill the Christ child, bring the blood back to Roosevelt to drink, so that his illness would be cured and he would become immortal. Wow. They were dispatched into Mongolia where anyone can look this up. You had the vice president of the United States in the middle of a war in enemy territory behind enemy lines. In Mongolia. And nobody ever asks why. Nobody ever does any research. My mother was sent to counter this operation. Along with units of the Kempe Tai and Japanese ninja commandos. So at this point in history, you've got to stop imagining them as you would in a, in a popular martial arts film. And think of the ninja as military commandos in the more conventionally armed and armored sense. Bulletproof armor, which the Japanese did wear throughout the China theater. And uh, 
paratroop capable. They were flown in and dispatched to try and find the Christ child before Henry Wallace could and his American troops. Now, they failed at one operation, but succeeded at another. The one thing they knew was that the Americans were traveling around by their own form of dirigible, much more primitive than anything the Germans or the Japanese had. Henry Agard Wallace, of course, had been guided by Nicholas Rorick, a Russian spy, a theosophical guru. Rorick was the man who had introduced Henry Wallace to mystical communism. And when it came to the idea of mystical communism, they felt they could eliminate all individuality in man. That man would become like a giant hive mind, like the ants or the termites or other social insects. Henry Agard Wallace, of course, was a multi-billionaire. Their fortune was made of GMO, genetically modified organisms, in the 1930s. They were increasing corn crop yields by crossbreeding and inbreeding. They were working in 1922, the year before my mother was born with a Chinese strain and one supplied by the plant geneticist, Donald Jones, producing hybrid corn. They started Pioneer Hybrid, H-I-B-R-E-D, a hybrid seed company. And thanks to genetically modified organisms, he became one of the richest families on earth. He wanted to collectivize all the crops so that they would grow only his seed, without which everyone would starve because he controlled the genetic blueprint. This man was set to become America's president, but not until he could prove himself by killing the Christ child. Now, there's something I will tell you now that I've never said before. That when the Americans captured the golden child, my mother was under orders that they could not take him back alive. There was no way at that point the Japanese could save him. The Americans were bringing him on to the dirigible to take back to America alive where they could bleed him dry so that Roosevelt could drink his blood. My mother gave the order to the sniper who blew the child's head off. They couldn't allow wow. that to happen. Then the sniper was ordered to keep pounding bullets into the boy so all the blood would drain out immediately. The sniper in rapid succession pumped as many bullets as he could. Half a hundred into that child's body to the point where the Americans simply threw the body out from the dirigible. But if she hadn't done that, Roosevelt would have had the blood of the Christ child to drink. This is what war leads to. After that, the Americans went for their secondary objective. Vinyaga. Understand that the Sanskrit word Nyaga simply means serpent, a symbol of wisdom in Vedic Indian culture. But its true origin is based on the existence of a small number of intelligent serpents, enormous, the size of the ancient prehistoric megaboas that could enwrap, crush, and swallow dinosaurs, and did so for millions of years. These supermassive megaboa-sized serpents have existed on Earth coeval with humanity before his development and evolution, and then thereafter. When they were trapped by the tides of time, as many retreated into the inner earth, 
They left a few upon the surface, living as gods in isolated temples, all but forgotten by modern civilization. It was said by the time of my mother's life that there were only nine Naga, nine Yaga in all the world. Almost all of which can be found in remote temples in India, Pakistan, and Nepal. They have lived in these sanctuaries for centuries, tended by human servants to whom they impart the wisdom only millennia Alden creatures can. Now, this wisdom is literally physically dispensed in venom from the fangs of the Nyaga. One ounce of this substance, known as Nyaga milk, when properly prepared and imbibed, grants a human psionic visions, visions and also precognitive abilities, the ability to foretell the future accurately, empathy, precognition, psychometry, the various qualifications we have for this kind of technique that takes disciplined occultists years to perfect is just blossoming because the certain areas of the reptilian cortex within all human beings is blown wide open by Nyaga venom, the milk, as it's called, by the cultists who tend them. And the choice is really up to the Nyaga, though it does entertain suitably humble requests. Many of the Nyaga's human servants live their entire lives waiting for a taste of Nyaga milk, but never touch a single drop. Now, the Nyaga are particularly susceptible to fluctuations in the space-time continuum. And... When it's exceptionally low, then they enter a kind of hibernation. And their sleep can last for centuries, during which time their followers wait faithfully for the reawakening of their divine masters. I and guess they were, they were very active at Angkor Wat in Cambodia once. Perhaps. Perhaps. By the way, I hear a lot of chuckling in the background and laughter. I was just wondering, is there something particularly amusing uh, that I'm no, bringing be up? No, because your stories are so fascinating and uh, out of the blue that <laughs> we're always blown blown away. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. When, it's when nothing it's yaga, sarcastic. Or... Yeah. When it first awakes, after it sheds its old skin, this is a process that requires several days. And during this time, and for approximately about a four-twin knit, a fortnight or 14 nights, two weeks thereafter, the Nyaga is particularly vulnerable, having effectively no armor and only half its usual strength. Now, the legends among followers say that in times past, ruthless individuals took advantage of the Nyaga's weakness and forced them to give up their milk. And the legends further state that these people were driven irrevocably insane by the precognitive dreams they suffered. But this is what my mother and her team were confronted with in terms of Henry Wallace's next objective. There was a remote temple in India where they were sent to interdict, meaning get there before the Americans, uh, to demand an audience in the name of the emperor with the temple's master, a supposedly 10,000-year-old monk named Anantha. Now, they were told the monk was expecting them. But when they arrived, the temple worshippers told them that the evil Americans arrived and carried off their lord, Ananta, in what they described as one of the Vedas, the flying machines of ancient India, or how they understood it. This, of course, was the dirigible. And they begged my mother and her team to find their master and bring him home. So where they truly succeeded 
in the most definable sense, inarguable sense, was that they were able to bring down the dirigible and rescue the Nyaga, after which the enormous serpent was brought home to his temple. Unfortunately, Henry Wallace was not in that dirigible. Apparently, he had left ahead of time to return home. But at least the Nyaga was rescued. My mother was actually awarded with drops of the venom, which enabled her to have a kind of recognition for the rest of her life, as well as giving her visions of what the future would be and what would happen to a point where she knew a great deal about the world that she otherwise never would have dreamed of. Do you know this story from her? It was from her. Wow. And of course, understand that there were rumors in certain parts of Japan. Most people in Japan would never know of this. Most people in Japan know how extensive the war was. The Japanese were everywhere. Very few know the extent of how important the struggle was, what the struggle was truly about. If the Nyaga had been brought home to America, it would have been paraded as a freak like King Kong and dissected like an animal. The Americans would have stripped it of what venom that they could in an attempt to scientifically reproduce it. At which point the Americans would have had control of the future, theoretically. If the Americans can't imagine that they've lost the war, perhaps these experiences will show them how much they truly lost. So hopefully that puts some of your questions about the warring bloodlines and the supernatural aspects of the war into a perspective that will help to make people more aware of why the Americans and the Soviets were so afraid to let the world know that they had lost and dedicated their entire social machine to the maintenance of a lie. Yeah, the only moment that left can I say unclear was about uh, the Jews and the Japanese and and the Germans uh, and the official narrative that uh, Hitler was was um, exterminating them and this is a good point to be happy to go back to, to it. Yeah, Would you like we to can go, go back to, to that now. Yeah, we can go to the Israel topic uh, in general. Can you can you cover why is Israel so important uh, that the whole history of the world is still gravitating? for centuries around it. Absolutely. Where's the where's the beginning of that conflict between uh, these bloodlines and what I'll is I'll answer Israel? to the best of my ability. And um, I'm sorry, you said, where's the beginning of that conflict between the bloodlines and what else did you say? What is Israel in, in its core? What, what, do we, what do we don't know about Israel because we obviously don't understand that topic at all. Thank you. I'll do my best to uh, do that justice. Before I forget, I will emphasize this, that uh, uh, understand that despite their vast wisdom and the legions of warshippers, the Nyaga are not, never were particularly well disposed towards human beings because they find our species savage and ruthless and feel that only through several lifetimes of prayer and meditation can humans ever begin to truly understand the lessons the Nyaga teach them. Mm. So consequently, the Nyaga never reacted favorably to humans who were not part of their temple and that uh, when yaga were accosted in their sanctum of course they would automatically assume uh, that the strange humans wish them harm and react uh, by separating the intruders and dispatching them one at a time in their labyrinthine temple complexes using telepathic powers of suggestion to lure the interlopers into the mazes, the passages of their temples where traps would await or waiting for one to be alone, after which they would use their stare to paralyze the target and enwrap them and constrict them. Uh, now, of course, uh, 
they would be loath to use their bite, uh, even though the milky venom was a kind of very powerful neurotoxin, simply because the human would essentially be receiving a gift for free. The reason I bring this up is to explain why the Nyaga was unable to defend itself, as I said, was at the time of Henry Wallace and his mission into Mongolia and Tibet and uh, Inner Asia, the sanctums of Pakistan, really, uh, that uh, the Nyaga had shed its skin and was completely helpless. That was hopefully made clear so that people understand normally that's not the case for the Nyaga. And please don't go looking for them. It's really not to your benefit. Yeah. That being said as well, understand that my mother was trusted with these missions because she was also beyond baseline human, uh, half vampire, as I had explained in the past. We may return to that um, in this discussion, but the first thing we'll cover is the Jews. Yeah, just and because you mentioned the serpent beings again, uh, there's this mythological motif uh, about uh, big gold deposits and treasures guarded by the serpent being. Do you mm -hmm. have a comment on that? Yes, I want people to understand that this is the kind of this is the kind of way that humans would see the wisdom that mm -hmm. the Nyaga offer. The great treasure that the Nyaga offer is not material, but humans would think of it in terms of the material profit they could make therefrom. So oftentimes the myth becomes that the great serpent is guarding material treasure. And nothing could be more ridiculous. Uh, this is simply humans trying to materialize or interpret in terms of what matters to them the wisdom the Nyaga have to offer that could enable them to profit therefrom to the point where they would manifest that those amounts of treasure by exploiting the Nyaga. Does that make sense? Yeah. So to hydrate myself a little bit first before yeah. I get into a rather complicated topic. <laughs> we just want to thank you that you shared this story about your mother and the golden child. We appreciate that. It's the first time we hear it and it's yeah. amazing. Thank you. I appreciate that. You always come up with something absolutely mind blowing. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Thank you. Well, understand, of course, that the one benefit you have or I have from living a life of unmitigated horrors is you're never short of a story to tell. <laughs> that's, um, uh, that's the one thing I can say. Uh, that and coming from a background of two parents who had lived through so much, same thing doubled by orders of magnitude. So with that um, in being stated, uh, the important thing to understand is that we're going to go a little bit back in a sense to the um, where the where we were in the last episode when we spoke of the Magi in China and understand that one of the things I brought up was um, the so-called three kings. There were actually a dozen of them, uh, fully 13 from China. Uh, they followed the star child who they reference in a work that ultimately languished in the Vatican Library for centuries, hundreds of years. And this was before a specialist in the language of Syriac, one of the languages spoken in Christ's time, uh, was able to uh, rescue it. Uh, obviously, he was given permission uh, by the Vatican Library and uh, he was able to translate it upon rescuing it from obscurity. And uh, the work is known as the Revelation of the Magi, and it is available in English. Uh, so this is an ancient manuscript that was literally written, uh, at least put to print, to text, I mean to say, writ down about 100 years after Christ's death, which for all intents and purposes was during his lifetime. It should have been a part of the Bible, but became what is known as Apocrypha, not entered into the Bible. But if it were entered into the Bible, the Bible would never have been as confusing as it is. 
So understand that uh, Brent Landau was the man who interpreted it. Landau spelled L-A-N-D-A-U. And people can look all that up themselves. The reason it's important is because he speaks of literally an invasion from China following what they called his star, meaning his star, Christ's star. Christ appears as a child in their eyes, in their minds. The vampire mage kings of China were following the Christ child who appeared at a different age in each of their minds. Each one of them saw him as a different age of child, but they called the star they followed in their minds, not a physical star in the sky, but the star they could see in their mind's eye that navigated them and their armies through the desert. They called it his star. This is exactly how Nostradamus, centuries later, would refer to my biological sire, my biological father, Adolf Hitler, as his star. So that same tradition is where Nostradamus is hinting at Adolf Hitler as a form of Christ. And this is something that most Americans did not understand, but certainly Joseph Goebbels did when he had Nostradamus's works interpreted into the German. When it came to the revelation of the Magi and why that's important, the Magi invaded Rome at the height of its power, and the Romans could do nothing about it. The Magi demanded to see the Christ child so they could ultimately coronate him, the Christ being a title, not a name. Jesus was simply known as Jesus, son of Joseph. It was the vampire mage kings out of China who made him Christ. They coronated him, sanctified him, recognized him the Messiah. This proves that Christianity is not Jewish. Christianity is before Judaism. The mage kings out of China themselves had been influenced by Seth, the righteous third son of Adam, who, when the garden fell, took a Chinese woman as a bride when he went east and Christianized the early vampire mage kings. Vampirism being not afraid of the cross at all. That misunderstanding is perversion from the Turks. An important point to be made here is one of the greatest heroes of Christendom was Vladislav Sepish, of course, known in the West as Dracula. Dracula was his knight, knighted title. His father was simply known as Dracul, or the dragon, a title that was proferred upon him by the emperor of the First Reich, the Holy Roman Germanic Reich of Emperor Sigismundus of Luxembourg, who gave a mass order to exterminate werewolves throughout the Reich. The knights were rallied to do that. His father was one of them. Dracula inherited the throne upon his father's assassination. After he escaped a childhood in slavery to the Turks, he became such a great crusader, but he needed money to keep his war going, and the East was impoverished. He converted to Roman Catholicism and was excommunicated by the Byzantine Orthodox faith, but the Pope of the West hailed him as the athlete of Christ. He would have been the man to liberate Byzantium, which had fallen to the Turks. Understand that because the Romanian Orthodox Church had excommunicated him, he was condemned by their tradition to reanimate as a vampire. But he was still a guardian of Christendom. 
when people would encounter him in his own death, they would raise the sign of the cross. Because no Jew or Muslim would ever do this, all such people were allowed to pass. The cross is not a ward against vampires. It's a pass that was allow an allowance for a Christian to pass because the vampires are the guardians of Christendom. The first movie to portray Dracula as a dog, because Muslims believe dogs to be filthy vermin. There's a reason for this. If we go into the ghoul later in this discussion, dogs are scared to death of ghouls and are no protection against them. So they're viewed as useless throughout <laughs> Dural Islam or the land of submission to Allah. So the first person to turn Dracula into a dog with canine fangs was not the movies of Biela Lugosi, those produced by Universal Studios that portrayed Biela Lugosi as Dracula. You can see he has no fangs. The first people to put fangs upon Dracula and make him like a dog were the Turks in the movie Dracula in Istanbul, produced in the 1950s. Then after that, Every vampire movie portrayed vampires with fangs. As if they were dogs. Just the way the Muslims like to see them. How stupid you Christians are. You don't even know your own protectors. The subspecies which crowned your king of kings. The guardians of your very Christendom. You obey the Muslims and dehumanize them as no better than dogs. You make me sick. Well, at the time, the vampire mages invaded Rome. The man who truly feared them and what they represented was the Edumane, the Edomite. Herod, Herod Magnus, or Herodos the Great. The patriarch of the dynasty installed by the Romans. The Edomites occupied the land south of the Dead Sea. They were the descendants of Esau, the older twin brother of Jacob, whom God later renamed Israel, whose 12 sons became the fathers of the 12 tribes. Now this is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan. And what happened, of course, was in order to take charge of Jerusalem, destroy it culturally because of the fanaticism of the zealots, the people whom the Romans would later fight at Masada. These were terrorists of their day, Jewish nationalists who wanted to overthrow the Roman Empire. And they targeted Roman soldiers or civilians and killed them. When such a terrorist group was forced into retreat on the mountain of Masada, the Romans didn't massacre them in a siege. They all killed themselves. A truly fanatical cult. One of them, the early zealots, was Barabbas, who was taken in under arrest for murder. Not a thief, but a killer. Pontius Pilate's wife had a dream that Christ was the Messiah. This was predicted by Virgil, the great Roman poet, who said the golden child, the Christ would come. This is why Virgil was portrayed by Dante as the guide throughout the underworld for the hero who stormed the gates of hell itself. So Christ was predicted by the Roman poets. Thus the wife of Pontius Pilate said, do not harm this man. Pontius Pilate took him before the Jews as was required by custom, where he was required by popular demand to release one of their criminals and said, 
Shall I release this murderer, Barabbas, a terrorist? Or this man Christ who has done no wrong? And the Jews said, Give us Barabbas. After which Pontius Pilate said, I wash my hands of this. Thus it went down in Christian history that the Jews killed Christ. Now the Jews themselves had provided an extraordinarily valuable service to the royalty of the world. They had produced a certain dye, unique in color, tekelet blue. So valuable, it was worth 20 times its weight in gold. This mysterious blue color was actually produced from the Murex trunculus snail, a sea creature described in the Bible in a way you would never think of it as a snail, referred to as a hilozon. It has the shape of the sea, having bones and able to attack and grab its prey by entangling it with its legs that emerge from its mouth. This is the actual Talmudic description from God himself. When the snail is killed, the flesh is boiled and fermented and out of its shell will emerge a single drop of purple, which through an alchemical atomic process will be transmuted into what is known as Teclet Blue. It's mentioned 49 times in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. When you expose the purple to the sun during the light of day, you get blue, which is technically speaking called Dibro Moi So Indigo divergence try saying that three times fast <laughs> Dibro moyi, so indigo the very name implies that two bromine atoms are knocked out the sunlight breaking the bond between the indigo molecule and the bromine molecule that's an atomic process that knocks out the colorant that makes the purple and turns it into blue this is all real chemistry but it's an alchemical process only by such being employed at the nuclear level and exposing that purple color to the sun, could one get the color of God, the color of the sky, the color of the sea? And if you were to look at the sky and the sea, like my legal father, the man who raised and guided me, did all his life as a sailor, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, you'd see two shades of blue that were the foundation of life itself. You see God every day as a sailor. If you were to try and capture either the sea or the sky in a container, you don't see the blue. All you see is translucent, clear liquid or oxygen. This is what the atheist sees. The non-believer in God sees that invisibility captured in a container and says there is no God. It's only by looking at the sea and the sky itself you feel the divinity, the creator, and that sense of godliness which renders life meaningful. This is why that blue is so important. This is why the Israelis try and show a taste of that blue on their national flag. Everything else is white. The nasty side effect. There's a price to pay for everything. When Tekelet blue is produced, the death and fermentation of all those snails produces an unbearable stench. Anyone married to such a specialist in alchemical dyeing has the right of divorce by Talmudic law. Producing Tekelet Blue was all you would do for the rest of your life. No one would cohabitate with you because you were taking the blood of the Hilozon and producing an unbearable stench, and such was the price of God's work. Now, God wanted his priests to be attired with this particular blue. But then what happened was Christ was born. When Christ was born and the vampire mage kings invaded the Roman Empire to coronate him the king of kings, 
that they had known of from before the time of the Jews. Herod, the Edomite blood enemy of the Jewish people, was made aware that this was the heir to the Davidian throne, the Davidian bloodline, and that the throne of David belonged to Christ. Hence, he became known as the Antipater, the Antifather, the man of the genetic line of the kings of Edom, who gave the order to kill all firstborn children in Roman Palestine, all firstborn sons. Kill them all to make certain we kill the Christ, the man who would have killed your God if you're a Christian. But Christ was ordered by the vampire mages to escape. His parents took him away. And thousands and thousands of young boys died. Now this abdication by the throne of any true king of Israel represented the end times. When man would be misled by his search for the Helazon at the end of the world. The Jews under Herod, who took advantage of the oil money of the time. Understand, when I brought up the past before that was destroyed by the Mongols, the past when the Baghdad Khalifa, the Caliphate under the Persians and Iran, Iran being but the Greek word for Aryan. When the Aryan Caliphate had its industrial revolution based on oil, had developed mechanisms, the degenerate versions thereof that became the Turkish automatic chess players the Europeans encountered. When they were able to get artificial intelligence encapsulated, the so-called genie in a bottle, where it was murder to unplug a machine. All of this industrial revolution based on petroleum instead of coal and steam lost under the Muslim massacres. Lost to mankind possibly forever. Under the Herodian massacre, the Jews lost the technology of the Hilazon, the technology to alchemically produce the Tekelit Blue. Herod was a madman who knew one thing. The zealots would take his life at any opportunity. So he ordered fortresses built throughout Israel, Roman Palestine, within the reach of wherever he was at any given time, so that he could run and hide, secure himself, fortress himself, bunker himself whenever necessary. He was the great builder. How was all this done? Well, in those days, before the age of steam, the age of coal, the nuclear age, the age of oil, the various forms of power that we use, this was the age of sinew. The energy at that time was muscular electricity, human slaves, and one of the Powerhouses of the world in slave trade was Roman Palestine. So all of this was built by slavery. Herod became master of the Jewish slave trade. The center point between Europe and Asia and Africa was the Levantine. Herod grew fat and wealthy off the sale of human flesh. All of it used to fortress Israel. The man who would have killed your God, the man who caused the loss of the Helozon technique. Now, when H.P. Lovecraft, a gay man, wanted to grow himself a beard, as the gay community in America calls it, meaning get himself a wife so that he would look straight, heterosexual, 
to the public. He made a deal with the Jewess who was in Ukraine, the Ukraine. And this incredible woman who was a product of a very religious Jewish family, Sonia Green, decided she would marry H.P. Lovecraft so she could get United States citizenship. And she taught him about the Hilozon. Now at times, Howard Phillips Lovecraft, who himself was ultimately of Arab descent, something he never spoke of publicly, but his original descendants who came to the United States were named Hazard, Hazard as in danger. Hazard traces back to the Arab word for red, as in the color signifying danger, as in Hazred, Abdullah al Hazred, the author of the Necronomicon. Howard Phillips Lovecraft was a descendant of this man. By the time they had anglicized their name to Lovecraft, all that had generally been hidden from the public eye. Only open through genealogies traced at Department of Defense exp expense, paid for by American taxpayers under the orders of Michael Aquino himself. So here you have this Arab descended, New English gentleman, marrying a Jewess, sometimes going off on a Judeophobic rant complaining about the Jews and their power in America. His wife, Sonia Green, would say, well, you remember I am Jewish, do you not? At which he would turn to her and say, you are not a Jewess. You are Mrs. Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Now, ultimately, they would be divorced. But she had taught him a great deal about Judaism that gave him his knowledge of the anti-gods. Just to put this in perspective, can you make the difference for the public between the Jews and the Edomites? This is what I'm getting to. Okay, we'll get there. Understand that, of course, the Edomites were, well, think of Adam. Adam was the first Caucasian man, the first man in the sense of an expanded consciousness caused by a comprehension of time in the chronological sense, meaning he had to instigate calendrical timekeeping because he was a farmer. His tribe became the first farming tribe, the first agricultural tribe. This was in the Aryan lands. This was in the lands of Iran, the Greek word for Aryan, in the northernmost region of what would be Azerbaijan or the Azeri ethnic homelands in Iran today near Tabriz. This is where Eden was. He was known as Adam because white people blush. There is no other ethnicity that has that trait. Only among Caucasian people does blood appear in the face in a blush, hence the term rud or ruddy, as in red, a reddening of the face. This is something that is important because there were pre-Adamic races of much darker melanin, darker skin colors. The white skin color evolved as man migrated north so that the paler skin would better absorb vitamin D and humanity would not die of rickets from basically malnourishment because the body cannot produce its own vitamin D. It requires it from the sun. So Adam and his tribe, Adamu, because of the red soil that they tilled, became the first to have to keep track of time chronologically so they would know when to sow after they would plant. Until that time, man was not conscious as we understand it. Man was in an Edenic sense of hunter-gathering state. Consciousness was in the moment, almost as unto an animal. This was how Adam was in 
a sense, the first man. It was in this Garden of Eden, of course, that the vision of the Christ child was had, the birth of proto-Christianity. His righteous third son, Seth, would then migrate east to bring that to the Chinese. When it came to that color red, as in Adam, just as his son Seth is a righteous name that is satanically inverted by the anti-god Seth of Egypt. Understand that Michael Aquino had so much control over American media through the Department of Defense that they could crush any film. Enki Bilal was an artist from the Slavic Southlands, Bulgaria, and Serbia. In between those two nations, Enki Bilal was born, an artist who was famous for European graphic novels, what Americans would call comic books. Enki Bilal made a film called Immortal in France. This film should have made his career. It was about Horus, one of the ancient Egyptian gods returning to Earth. Then oh, there was I a watched film. It. it. It was animation, right? Partially animated, yes. Yeah. Partially yeah. filmed, partially animated, yes. And big pyramid over New York City, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was it. He was one of the people I learned illustration from. Oh, not personally, but through correspondence. And then there was a film called Gods of Egypt, yep. which portrayed the war between Horus and Seth. Both these films were condemned to complete and total failure. Immortal was never allowed to display in American theaters. It only showed in art theaters off yep. the market. In terms of Gods of Egypt, it failed miserably because all the critics attacked it. Aquino orchestrated this through the Department of Defense. The reason why is because Seth is shown being defeated. The very uh -huh. name of the capital of Egypt, Cairo, means battleground, battlefield, place of battle, meaning the place where Horus defeated Seth, the anti-god, the god of pestilential flora, foreigners and the desert and disease and death itself in the night. When Seth was defeated by Horus, the golden age of Egypt began with Cairo as its capital. All of this was presented in the film Gods of Egypt, which was immediately attacked by the critics and it lost millions and millions of dollars, considered a great box office failure because the American government made certain it would never sell. Yeah. Michael Aquino was behind that. That was the amount of power that he had. This is because Seth was never to be shown as defeated as he was in history. They were really writing history as they did with World War II. But never confuse Seth the anti-God with Seth the son of Adam, who was the birth of Christianity. Never confuse Adam, whose name means red, with Edom, which is the name for red in the Herodian bloodline. Edom is, of course, the source of Herod himself, whose father and predecessor was Antipater, Antipater meaning the anti-father. And the Romans put him on the throne to destroy Israel, which he did. And one of the things that he did was he led them down the path to worship a false god. Now, Sonia Green had told Lovecraft that she had to leave Ukraine because a great holocaust was coming. A great holocaust that was brought upon by a false Jewish prophet. A radical cowboy from the Hasidic Jews known as the Radziner dynasty who played the tragic role in the destiny of the Jewish people. And they identified the source of Tekelet Blue as the cuttlefish. They identified this as the Helozon because it had no bones, or rather had bones that were, well, were able to shoot forth tentacles from its mouth by which it would capture its prey with its legs, as in the Old Testament. Now, Tekelet Blue 
the blue of God itself. That dye produced from the cuttlefish is exactly the opposite. In fact, the blood from the Cthulhu creature was used to produce Zyklon B gas that was used in the gas chambers. That was the path that the false rabbi led the Jewish people down that Sonia Green had married H.P. Lovecraft to escape that fate from. But the Radziner dynasty pushing the cuttlefish, the false god, Cthulhu, as the advent of messianic times, they were, of course, in league with Mossad, just as there was a United States Marine Corps or a United States Army found it in 1775, as anyone can look up. Before there was a constitutional republic known as the United States, which was founded in 1776, as anyone can look up. So too, the Mossad existed before there was an Israel. A terrorist organization dedicated to Zionism. A militant movement born in the decade that my mother was born. Politically orchestrating the circumstances of World War I so as to secure the land in Palestine now recognized as Israel. Now, as a documents destruction specialist for the United States Department of Defense, military historians who state that Germany was the losing end of World War I are again revising history. In other words, completely inverting it satanically and lying. The Germans had defeated the Russians. They had won on the Eastern Front. This is evidenced by the brest litovsk Treaty, which enabled them to gain Ukraine, Belarus, all the territories of white Russia and the borderland of Ukraine. This made Germany the master of Central Europe, and now they turned all these new draftees onto the Western Front to overwhelm the French. That's when the Americans unleashed the American Army and Navy flu. Bred in the cantons of America's heartland. Anyone can look this up. They called it the Spanish flu simply because they all disembarked in nominally neutral Spain in what were called coffin ships because the majority of American soldiers arrived dead. Vectors for the American Army and Navy flu. We explain all of this in the Roswell Deception. But understand that this is what led to 100 million deaths worldwide and shortened the lifespan by 15 years, 10 to 15 years of another 100 million people. The greatest genocide in history perpetrated by the American Army and Navy flu, as it was called in the code books. The so-called Spanish flu. Every flu in the world originates out of Asia. Every flu is a swine flu, an avian flu, an Asian flu flu, because the Asians are the largest concentration of humanity on Earth, the largest concentration of subsistence farmers, which maintain chickens in close proximity to pigs, where chicken roll, pig shit, chicken shit is eaten by the pigs, who then, of course, spread it by their own shit, and humans eat them, both of them, and wind up contracting avian and swine flus that spread to the rest of the world. That's why every flu has an Asian name, but not the Spanish flu, because it was a weapon, a bioweapon originating out of America. The cantonments of Kansas, where they shipped criminals from San Quentin prison in California, drafted them into the army, stuck them in unrefrigerated boxcars with chickens so they inhaled all that powderized chicken shit on the way to Kansas, took the one man who was immune to it, but a carrier made him the cook, infected all the army with it so they would infect the rest of the world, unleashed them into the trenches, and everybody started to die. That's what ended World War I. That's why the Nazis, the National Socialists, and the Fascisti, the fascists of Italy, ordered everyone to return to the greeting of the ad locutio, the Roman salute which everyone called, oh shit, 
So, okay. Here we go again. Let's try this. What I'm getting from your stories is that there are genetic and religious differences between Jews and Edomites, and most probably Hitler was against Edomites, right? That is correct. But understand, okay. as I said about the Spanish flu, the so-called Spanish flu being a bioweapon that killed so many people, the reason this was important, just so people understand, this is why Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler both enforced the ad locutio, the Roman salute as a greeting, so that people wouldn't shake hands and spread the disease. This is why they returned to what Westerners now interpret as the Heil Hitler. This was the ancient Roman salute of the ad locutio. This is important because they were trying to preserve as many human lives as possible in Europe. Now, that bio disease, that weaponized bioweapon that uh, ultimately wiped out so many people and led to the reaction of fascism and Nazism in Europe. Uh, this happened at a time when Adolf Hitler himself was personally needing funding. He was, of course, a starving artist. One of the factions that he received funding from, to a degree, was the Mossad. This was because they wanted a Palestine, which they could move to. Now, Hitler was Austrian. And understand that Austrians are German hillbillies. And he came from a background that was very rural, very hillbilly. He was a country boy. He was in love with his cousin, Gelai Raubal. He told her he was dealing with very dangerous people, fanatical terrorists, cultists, that if she were to go out and around, out and about on her own, it should be recording, but I don't really, there we are. I think it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. is. Okay. Okay. So uh, what I will tell people is that Hitler was telling his niece that she had to stay home a lot and she was unhappy about it. Now, the, if you ever take a look at the quotations of the Jews from that period of time who were militant Zionists, then uh, one can understand how ruthless, fanatical they truly were. It uh, is simply monstrous the words that they say. When one takes a look at Theodor Herzl and other rabid Zionists, I will search now for some of their quotations because they're uh, profoundly important. One of them was uh, Ziev Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky's surname was spelled J-A-B-O-T-I-N-S-K-Y. Ziev Jabotinsky said, eliminate the diaspora, or the diaspora will surely eliminate you. But this is referring to the Jewish populations all over the world, known as the Jewish diaspora, which they felt, if they allowed to exist, would breed out, would breed out with other races. And therefore, the Jewish race would ultimately cease to exist by breeding out with others. So, Jaev Jabotinsky was expressing something that was one of the tenets, meaning one of the foundations of Zionist ideology, was that the diaspora had to literally die, that enough of them had to be killed until they would move to Palestine. This is because no Jewish person in their right mind wanted to move to Palestine. It's a strip of land in the desert that they felt not even the lizards were fit to live in and that they thought, why would they want to go there when they were well adjusted as doctors and lawyers and accountants in so much of Central Europe, where they had done so much to assimilate? Why would they give up all that uh, for a fanatical ideology that was to them literally insane? Well, the ideology was insane enough where its followers were diehard terrorists who sought to kill them all until they, quote unquote, came to their senses 
and were forced to move to Palestine. Now, there was as well the threat of communism, where you had the rabbi, Stephen Weiss, who in August of 1941, through the Jewish magazine, the Jewish voice said, some may call it communism, but I call it what it is, Judaism. Anti-communism is anti-Semitism. This is because when the Bolsheviks took over Russia, your average Russian serf or peasant was illiterate. They would sign documents with simply an X. The only people who were literate were the Jewish upper class that had exploited the peasantry for so long. So they were made the commissars. Ultimately, almost all commissars were exclusively ethnically Jewish. And the Soviet Union was defined as a commissarocracy with machine guns. These were the people, of course, who starved millions of Ukrainians to bring food to the Russians. This is why so many of the Ukrainians collaborated with the Third Reich to exterminate the Jews. This is why Sonia Green foresaw why she had to leave Ukraine, why she married H.P. Lovecraft, because comparatively speaking, a Anglo-Judeophobe was a great option compared to a Jewish Bolshevik. And so she explained to him the problems of how this came about. What was this madness among Zionists that they were so genocidal to their own kind? This is what they were doing was terrorizing Hitler. They said, we want you to really go all in on killing Jews. And we're going to make sure you do. And so they killed his niece. The Third Reich had to hide it. Get off Hitler. Even it, I'm sorry? That was in Bulgarian. Is everything still recording? I think we are. Can you hear me? Okay, I guess they can't hear me. Let's see if that uh, continues. All right, let's see now. <sighs> if you are. Yeah, three, two, one, magic. Magic. Got it. So, um, Adolf Hitler's niece was killed by Mossad. He even participated in covering the reality by saying she committed suicide because he couldn't afford to let the German people know that she had been killed, murdered, and that, of course, was with every intent of making him angry enough to strike out at the Jews and kill as many as he could. This is exactly what the Zionists wanted. Understand that there was a coin struck by the SS that showed both the Star of David and the swastika, very similar to the Raelian symbols of the Raelian UFO cult today, which we can get back to later as an important part of all of this. And when it came to um, Adolf Hitler and Goebbels and uh, the Reich uh, forging that coin, it was because it was the Third Reich that originally helped make Palestine possible by the Ha'avara, the transfer agreement, in which even though everyone else was poor and destitute at the time of the Great Depression in the Third Reich, uh, and no one was allowed to leave and take their money with them. If you left, you had to leave your money at home because the Reich so desperately needed it. Only Jews were allowed to leave and take their money with them. This was called the transfer agreement, the Ha'avara. This is what enabled many thousands of Jews to relocate to Palestine. 
This is why they were considered a Nazi insurgency by the British Empire. And insurgency, they were. They began to throw bombs at various British embassies, uh, hotels, uh, doing their best to attack the British population. And therefore, the British declared them to be Nazi infiltrators and gave the order to kill them where possible, which is why the British attacked any Exodus ships or Jewish or ships full of Jewish migrants to the point where they would shoot down ships and slaughter Jews by the thousands. There was even a ship named the Exodus that was hunted down by the British and sunk. This proves the British were uh, trying to prevent any establishment of Israel. It was considered to be a Nazi project. Uh, Hitler was, of course, doing this uh, not because he had any great love of Jews, but understand he also uh, was not a psychotic person who hated them either. His, the doctor who cared for his mother, Eduard Bloch, surname spelled B-L-O-C-H, first name Eduard in the European sense, E-D-U-A-R-D, Edward Bloch had taken care of Hitler's mother till she died. He gave his entire family SS protection under the Schutzstaffel. And at the height of the war, when the Americans were bombing and it was no longer safe for him to live inside the Third Reich, Adolf Hitler contacted the Americans and asked them to take Edward Bloch in as an American immigrant. The Americans agreed if they could use him as a propaganda tool. And Hitler allowed that because Hitler just wanted Dr. Edward Bloch and his family to survive. So they were sent to America. The Americans accepted them. And then the Americans wrote a uh, completely fictitious book called I Was Hitler's Doctor, in which they tried to portray Edward Bloch as a psychiatrist who was declaring that Hitler was clinically insane. Uh, it's a book that is so primitive in its propaganda that it's never been republished since the war. But Hitler allowed this because he wanted the doctor and his family to live. Hitler was not some pathological Judeophobe who wanted all Jewish people dead. He was dealing with a very uh, impossible situation in which American bombing was making it impossible to feed even the German people. He had, of course, at that point, the Jews in concentration camps after the incident where a young uh, Jewish boy uh, Theodor Herzl had assassinated a high-ranking Reich's official, which led to the counterattack of the Night of Broken Glass, Kristallnacht, the first campaign or pogrom against the Jews in the Reich. And this was followed by many Jewish men being taken to Konzentslagen or concentration camps. Later on, during the height of the war, when the Americans began their bombing campaign, is when Hitler gave the go-ahead for the Totenslagen, or the death camps. These were overwhelmingly outside of Germany. They were mostly active in Poland. And this is where people cooperated to bring Jews to be exterminated in the camps. All of this was based on the fact that Hitler had to feed his own people. There was no point in feeding what at that point was an insurgent population. Uh, this was a tactically necessary operation because the overwhelming amount of Russian Bolshevik commissars were ethnic Jews. So the Jewish people in Central Europe at that point were generally in league cooperating with the commissars and the partisans, which made them the enemy. And because many of them, women and children, were participating as happened in Vietnam with the Viet Cong, then they were made to pay the price. It was a decision that was militarily inescapable. In his position, I would have done the same. So for this reason, Hitler is vilified. No context is ever provided. Uh, the reality is he had to do what he had to do. But the story of Dr. Edward Bloch and others like it prove that this was not something that he was doing willfully 
out of a hateful pathology. This was something that he was forced to do. He had been completely restrained even after the murder of his lover, his niece, Gelai Raubel, and finally driven by the necessities of war uh, to do what he had to do for his people. That is the context that needs to be provided, but it goes deeper. Understand yeah. that on the other side of the Atlantic, where I was speaking of Howard Phillips Lovecraft, how did all this come to pass? How did we have murderous Zionist terrorists murdering Hitler's niece, driving the Reich ultimately to genocide? Uh, just so people understand the predicament the Zionists put themselves into, uh, the Zionists, of course, wound up moving to Palestine and finding they had an overwhelmingly male population. There are very few women who want to take up arms with a band of psychotic terrorists. So because there was almost nothing but men in Palestine, they asked Adolf Hitler for woman. This is when Norbert Mazur, the man's name is spelled M-A-S-U-R, uh, Norbert, his first name. If you ever look him up, you'll find out he's this Jewish guy who wears a Hitler mustache. He was in charge of the World Jewish Congress. He held a personal meeting with Heinrich Himmler right after Heinrich Himmler was celebrating Hitler's birthday. Now, all Western historians will try to portray this as Himmler betraying Hitler, trying to find a way to escape. It's all bullshit. Himmler met with Norbert Mazur, and Norbert Mazur said, we've got no Jewish woman. And Himmler said, I can get you Jewish women. Thousands of them. Now, your job in return is to help Hitler and myself escape. And Norbert Mazur of the World Jewish Congress said, cool. <laughs> we'll help. We'll help with some of the expenses. And uh, I'm working with Sw Sweden, neutral Sweden. And uh, we can make it so he gets out of here along with you. So Norbert Mazur of the World Jewish Congress, and they helped Hitler ultimately escape along with Heinrich Himmler. Uh, you'll never read him talking about that part. He'll write it off as something different. It doesn't make any sense. Him and Heinrich Himmler meeting while bombing's going down all around them. And uh, there's no purpose other than the way I've explained it that makes any sense. So the deal, of course, was they helped Hitler and Himmler and others escape. Uh, certainly the Israelis owed the Nazi high command that much. They were one of the reasons the Nazi high command was able to escape. Not a major reason necessarily, but certainly a factor. And this was because the Germans had made Israel possible. Now, the thing to know about today's Israel is that they have no tourist sites for tourists to visit that are anything of consequence other than Herodian. All of the so-called holy sites in the Holy Land were originally chosen by Constantine's mother when he converted to Christianity. So as the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity, ever important to remember that when he looked into the skies and saw the cross within the sun, it was a Hockenkreuz, the hooked cross, the swastika that he saw within the sun when he heard the voice of God say, under this sign, conquer. That was how the Hockenkreuz, the hooked cross, the swastika became the battle standard of the Roman legions. Constantine converted to Christianity under that cross, not the cross of crucifixion. But his mother went around the Holy Land to select which sites were holy. Golgotha, uh, the very uh, Gethsemane, the garden thereof, the garden of Gethsemane and Golgotha, the mountain of skulls, being among many sites that Constantine's mother rendered the holy sites of Christianity. Anyone who's educated uh, generally understands these sites to be such. So the only real historical tourist sites the Israelis have to offer are Herodian 
all of the fortresses he built. As a result, they have put Helrod's image on some of their coinage, some of their currency. The Israelis of today are Herodian. They admire as a hero the man who tried to kill your God if you're a Christian. They have tried to erase from history his slaughter of the young children in Roman Palestine, all the firstborn sons. They claim it's not real history. So if you want to understand who are the Edomites, who are those that follow Cthulhu, the great forsaker, H.P. Lovecraft understood from his wife, Sonia Green, these are the Zionists. All the Jews that follow Zionism are following the path of Cthulhu. They so are following. Not, not the Edomites. They are effectively the Edomites today. The this, is, this is so much information. I'm sure that uh, a large portion of our audience is lost at that point. Can you make a very short uh, a distinction between Jews, Edomites, and Zionists? Very short, because we have to move along. Essentially, the uh, Zionists are the Edomites of today. They are the people who have taken up the Edomite cause. Uh, they are essentially like Herod, the people who sit on the throne of Israel, but they are not truly Jewish. They are not Jewish at all. These are descendants of Turkic Caucasoids, the uh, Hazar tribe, which had converted to Judaism and uh, then uh, became the conquerors of the Slavic peoples in Ukraine and Belarus. Uh, these are the people who became the Jews that settled the Jewish Pale of Settlement throughout the uh, inner, the interior of the Russian Empire uh, in the areas of uh, the Baltic nations and uh, white Russia and the Ukraine today. They ruled an empire from uh, the Baltic to the Black Sea. These people, after the Holocaust, came to resettle in Israel. They're not uh, Semitic or Judaic. They are simply Turkic Eastern U Europeans, Eastern Europeanized Turkic peoples who set up a, uh, a white settler regime, an apartheid state, and uh, claim themselves to be the Jews, but they follow the ideology of Zionism, which follows the concept of God's blue being derived from a false animal, a false totem. They are uh, the followers of a false totemic uh, ideology. So hence the Zionists are the true Edomites of today. There's nothing really convoluted about it. It goes back to Rome and the installation of Herod, which is why they declare him a hero and try to revise his history to even claim that the Bible's account of his slaughter of the firstborn children to try and uh, kill the Christ, your God, if you're a Christian, they try to revise that as having never happened. They claim it never happened. Does uh, that mean that the original Edomites are now extinct? That is correct. Okay. The Edomites of today would be Zionists. This is what was taught to H.P. Lovecraft, exposed to him. This is and what why, he was why, why is Palestine important? Palestine, of course, was important just for the sake of capturing the Holy Land. It was, of course, fought over by the uh, Crusaders and uh, the Muslims. The end result is by capturing Palestine, the, uh, the new Cthuloid Edomites of Zionism capture the mind of the world. They capture the, both the Muslims and the Christians in a trap where the Christians in America, who are Protestant and evangelical, worship the Jews as relatives of the boss. Basically, they feel that they're descendants of the uh, original Jews. They're completely ignorant of the reality. So many Americans who are Christian evangelicals worship them, thinking that they are somehow God personified, somehow related to God himself. Uh, because of the importance of the Holy Land uh, historically, then the, uh, well, the Arabs are drawn in as well. A great example of what uh, has turned around in our world, how the world is upside down, 
is that all of the major Arab nations, the House of Saud on the Arabian Peninsula and uh, the United Arab Emirates, and uh, most of the Arab nations have thrown Palestine under the bus and abandoned it. They have now allied with Israel. Uh, this is why Israel, for the longest period of time, was allied with Turkey. Uh, and of course, they allied with Turkey again uh, in the war of Azerbaijan against Armenia, a Christian nation surrounded by hostile Muslims. Uh, the Jews wish to annihilate the Armenians and help to provide drones along with the Turks to the Azeris, the Azerbaijans, so that they could annihilate the old Soviet mechanized columns of the Armenians in the field and bring them to the point where they're now threatened with extinction. Uh, the Jews made certain to do this because uh, the Armenians suffered a greater Holocaust than they, and they certainly don't want competitors for that kind of ability to monopolize pain and suffering as they do uh, because it's their propaganda tool. So when it comes to Zionist Herodianism, uh, Edomite Zionism. This is how people need to understand that this was something that was, in a very real sense, made possible by Adolf Hitler, but he certainly did his best to try and prevent it from controlling Europe. When it came to his exile of the Palestinians, uh, once they were established, no one could get rid of them, and uh, now we're trapped in a situation where it does need to be dealt with. Uh, the uh, situation is untenable with uh, all of the Arabs aligned to Israel now, the great majority of Arab nation states. They have all the oil that they ever need safely, uh, cheaply. Uh, they're swimming in oil. Uh, they have a uh, situation where they are completely secure and yet they're constantly attempting to start a war with Iran. Uh, this, of course, is because, well, the very name Iran is Aryan in Greek. They feel them to be the blood enemy, the Aryan enemy. Uh, this is uh, the reason for their hostility, Con constantly claiming that they're trying to uh, create a nuclear weapon is preposterous since they sabotage every attempt. In fact, it was the uh, Jewish and American produced uh, virus that sent all of the uh, Iranian nuclear reactors into meltdown by bypassing the control mechanisms for their German industrial control of their, in other words, there are systems for their nuclear power plants produced in Germany by Siemens Company. Siemens Company had all of its programs knocked out in terms of their safety mechanisms by this Jewish virus that was introduced uh, a law into the Iranian nuclear power plants. Uh, it's the same kind of virus that was introduced into the Japanese power plants at Fukushima Daiichi. This is why none of their backup systems to turn the reactors off turned on when the tsunami hit the Japanese mainland. Uh, all of the Japanese knew the tsunami was coming. They tried to turn on the reactor systems, but they had the same German industrial control mechanisms that the Iranians had been using, produced in Germany by Siemens Corporation. So the same Israeli manufactured virus knocked out the Japanese control mechanisms. And that's why they couldn't turn on when the tsunami hit and went into meltdown. So that was a direct attack from Israel and America on Japan. The Japanese refer to it as 311, March 11th. That's their 9-11 day. Hmm. You, just, you just mentioned uh, your biological father again, and we know uh, from you that Hitler was um, fighting on behalf of the old gods. Uh, yes. And to fit into a more metaphysical frame, all of this that we previously said, could you please elaborate, elaborate on the origin of the old gods and the anti-gods? Yes, understand, of course, that uh, we before there were the Scandinavian Norse gods that we're all familiar with. They're one of the most familiar pantheons in the world, along with the Greek pantheon. Uh, we also had the Germanic gods. 
And the Germanic gods before the North were the gods of the Black Forest. These were the aurarchs of fertility, uh, very similar to, say, for instance, Pan, the satyr god of uh, the forest in Greece. When it comes to the uh, uh, old gods of Germany, uh, the chief of all of these aurochs of the forest the, was the god Vodan. Vodan was a fertility god. So he was seen as, of course, having a very large phallus, uh, a stag-like horns and head, uh, very much a, uh, of a, a god that was intimidating, hooved, cloven feet. Uh, the legs of a goat. Uh, this was every bit a god of fertility and reproduction and very masculine, a god of war, uh, the god of the primal forest. Uh, when the Charlemagne and uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, began to uh, take over and Christianize Europe by force, uh, then they simply took the image of Vodan and said, this is the image of Satan. Until then, there had been no image of Satan that was truly biblical. This was simply the demonization of the god of the Black Forest, the demonization of the Germanic gods. Now, all of the Germanic gods are for Europe. Uh, and all of the pagan pantheons are for Europe. What the Shinto divinities our spirits are for Japan. So it's important to understand that by returning to the roots of pagan heritage, that Europe will do much to re-empower itself in the Japanese sense and begin to work with nature rather than raping it as the communists did. Uh, we see in the uh, uh, legacy of Chernobyl, uh, the kind of technology that was abused uh, by the communists to essentially uh, destroy nature. They didn't work with it. Uh, the end result was catastrophe. Uh, by the way, for those who are curious about the uh, virus that took out both the Iranian and uh, Japanese nuclear power plants, that was inserted by Israel, it was Stuxnet. Um, Stuxnet was spelled S-T-U-X-N-E-T, -E but it was pronounced Stuz like a Z. This X was pronounced like a Z, Stuxnet. Um, so very important for people to remember that. That's what took out the industrial control systems at Fukushima Daiichi uh, power plant uh, facilities. It was a cluster of three uh, nuclear power plants that were taken out at that time. Uh, and uh, so uh, it uh, was introduced into the Iranian nuclear processing plants through USBs, the universal serial bus flash drives, because employees used to bring them home and connect them to their own personal computers to work at home. And they become infected. They became infected by Stuxnet through the Internet. And this could just as easily happen to any power plant in the world. Uh, but because security procedures are pretty much insecure everywhere, uh, but it was introduced differently into the Japanese uh, power plants. So this is kind of like a war against nature. This is the war of the anti-gods. So to disambiguate the old gods, these are the pagan pantheons of any culture. Uh, when you take a look at the sacrifices made on Moss by the Aztecs and the Incas, the Mesoamerican cultures, where thousands of people were sacrificed to the old gods of their peoples. These gods were res would respond with fertility of field and body, uh, the continued birth of children, the continued harvest of grain. Uh, this is something that was part of the blood and soil that the Nazis mentioned. All of this is something that the modern West and East have been forced to misunderstand. This kind of sacrifice 
provided response. As much as people may not approve of sacrifice, they don't understand that these people were dealing with day-to-day -day survival as we cannot imagine it today. The sacrifice ensured the survival of their race, their culture, their ethnos. When it comes to what the Nazis were fighting for, it was that existential struggle for the survival of the European race. This was why, in that sense, the sacrifice had to be made of the Jewish people. So the occult aspect of that was to bring back the old gods that could stave off America's anti-gods that the Americans were calling up. So this is where the anti-gods need to be put into perspective. And of course, this is done through what, of course, was taught to H.P. Lovecraft by his wife, Sonia Green. It's something that one needs to understand as briefly as possible through Hakabalah, the reception. Uh, this was something that the Europeans understood in the Middle Ages because they understood it as uh, Trinitarian Christianity. Um, essentially, you had the expression of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in the crowns of the Kabbalah. And so this was how uh, Albert Einstein was able to understand and ultimately conceptualize the singular equation of E equals MC squared, mass energy equivalence. That, of course, is immediately recognized by the physical circles of science as, as potential for weaponization by the implied release of energy as manifest within the physics of atomic fission. But Hakabalah is what inspired it, and for that reason, it wasn't accepted by the scientific world for a long time. A lot of people don't remember how it was dismissed for a long time. Uh, the science advisor to Roosevelt told him that an atomic bomb couldn't be built for 100 years. This is why Einstein had to write a personal letter to Roosevelt to start building an atomic bomb. Otherwise, Roosevelt's own advisors told him that it simply wasn't practical. But Einstein understood this because of his understanding of Kabbalah. This is what Sonia Green was explaining to, uh, of course, H.P. Lovecraft, who wrote about it as Yog Shothoth, the many portaled entity, which was everywhere all at once. The concept of perceiving him as uh, multiple sphere or spheres, that was, of course, his representation of uh, Kabbalah. Uh, a lot of people would never understand that without taking his wife into account, which, of course, no one ever does. So when you think of what uh, uh, he said about uh, Yog Shothothri, uh, if one were to get into the etymology of that, it would give one uh, effectively an understanding of where Lovecraft was coming from. Uh, that, of course, would then allow people to understand the importance of what he was trying to expose to the world about the anti-gods and uh, why he considered them such a threat and why he worked with Harry Houdini, who was also Jewish, who, when he explained what Sonia Green had explained to himself, Harry Houdini joined him in attempting to write a book exposing the danger of the anti-gods to a public that they felt would come to worship them. Uh, this is something that they foresaw because they lived in very dangerous times. They were dealing with dangerous people. Lovecraft began to realize his own importance when he was essentially, uh, oh, well, hired by Henry Ford indirectly to write an American Mein Kampf for Charles Augustus Lindbergh, an American hero, who he uh, was going to uh, write his Mein Kampf for. And this is what made H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and Harry Houdini the targets for assassination. Uh, 
uh, Mr. Charles Augustus Lindbergh was too important to assassinate. He would have been investigated. Uh, Harry Houdini was a celebrity, but not nearly the American hero who, who could ever dream of running for president like Charles Augustus Lindbergh was. So what they did was they killed the man who could have written Lindbergh's book that would have gotten him elected, the American Mein Kampf. They killed the author, H.P. Lovecraft. This was John done through the injection of cancer. And of course, uh, I'll explain that in a moment. More important is to explain the very term Yogg-Sothoth, uh, because that's ultimately what H.P. Lovecraft referred to his Wolver as, his franchise, his collected works. He never called them the Cthulhu Mythos. That was a term that was invented by an Edomite cultist named August Derelith, who claimed all of Lovecraft's estate after Lovecraft died. Lovecraft had actually willed his estate to his young gay lover, Barlow, R.H. Barlow. But uh, R.H. Barlow, the entire estate was stolen from him by threat and intimidation by a man named August Derelith, who ran a small publishing company out of his house he called Arkham House. And uh, he was an Edomite. Now, he called all of Lovecraft's work the Cthulhu Mythos, so that people would dismiss it as fiction. Lovecraft himself called it yog Shothothari, which meant it was the many portaled entity that was based on the Kabbalah. So as I've already explained before uh, about Cthulhu being the forsaker in the Arabic, there is of course the veiled reference to Cthulhu that people in America recognize through crap television series like the Game of Thrones, where one of the titles of their third episode of the second season was, what is dead may never die. And that of course is a veiled reference to Al Cthulhu. Uh, it is the drowned God who will destroy the world on his awakening as foreordained in the original Arabic rhyming couplet comprising but Trois lines on just one line, separated by a long space. That's the standard Arabian poetry. Where it's something like La Maitan Ma Kadirun Yatabaka Sarmadi Faita Yaji Al Shuvat Al Mautu Quad Yantahi. Or that is not dead which can eternal lie and with strange aeons even death may die. So the first line, when you read it, like in all Semitic languages from right to left, is definitively supposed to mean lie, as in to lie down, meaning that it can lie there eternally. Then there's that non-poetic rendering in the literal meaning of the first line. That thing is not dead, which can eternally lie in waiting, which literally translated means that is not dead, which has the capacity to exist eternally. And if the abnormal, bizarre, strange ones, things, times, strange days, comest, then death may cease to be. So one Arabic phrase, Yaji al Shutha, that provides us the clue to the deeper mystery. It's a plural, and it literally means the abnormal referring to people or things dependent on context. Yucky comes or they're coming. The colloquial Arabic often refers or transforms the soft J sound into a hard G sound. And many times the vowel endings are left off and the words slurred together like we do in English. And so the intended rendering of this phrase in the colloquial Arabic would be yag shuthat with a slight change in the quality of the vowels, anglicizing as yog So the word within the quatrain, as it's writ, the lie, al kid it means falsehood. There's deliberately rendered misinterpretation of the quote, not unexpectedly so, if you're aware of the black magic background of the poem. 
And there's still some areas of uncertainty regarding the Arabic original, ergo rendering the transliteration different from the Arabic, but it's likely that the al Qib should be written uh, to match the transliteration. It would mean that something is lying to you eternally, as in falsehoods all the time. Something's always lying. And it's lying to the point where you won't even believe that death can exist anymore, that you'll live forever, that you will be immortal if you follow this path. This is what Lovecraft was warning about, what he and uh, Harry Houdini joined forces with the man who would have been the fascist president of the United States, Howard Lindbergh, Charles Augustus Lindbergh, uh, rather, Howard Phillips Lovecraft, Charles Augustus Lindbergh, and Harry Houdini, uh, all sponsored by Henry Ford. With that kind of money and backing, nothing could have stopped them except killing them. So with Harry Houdini, he was murdered, of course, by uh, a criminal who punched him in the gut before a performance, a man who had a history of murder, uh, of being hired as a hitman, and uh, ultimately got away with murder again. And uh, when it came to... Uh, Howard Phillips Lovecraft himself, of course, he was injected with cancer. A lot of people may find that hard to believe. They don't understand how cancer was weaponized at that time, but it was weaponized by a man named Dr. Rose. So when it came to uh, Dr. Rose and his uh, murder of H.P. Lovecraft, all of this was around the period of time that Donald Trump's uncle, who was a famous scientist, was stealing the works of uh, Nikola Tesla and ultimately rendering the uh, Trump dynasty incalculably wealthy uh, to the point where they could have him run for president and, uh, and ultimately win. Uh, all of this is very much connected. And uh, what people need to understand is how their lives are impacted by it uh, beyond the comprehension. So when it comes to uh, Trump and his connection to the anti-gods, I think the first thing that uh, needs to be expressed, of course, is the fact that uh, uh, Trump's uncle was made in charge of, well, well all of the uh, technology of Tesla. It sounds unbelievable, but essentially that's what happened. But this was after, of course, they killed the man who was going to warn about it, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, uh, and his, uh, his uh, wonder of technology was expressed in his short story, uh, Nyarlathotep, in uh, which he spoke about uh, essentially Tesla's work, his science being, uh, well, introduced by the, uh, by the anti-god Nyarlathotep and uh, warning people not to be misled by technology that was abused by cultists who would ultimately bring about the reign of the anti-gods. Uh, now, the reason he was warning about this was because Tesla's technology was ultimately used to bound, bind the anti-gods on upon summoning them. It took the place of the ancient magics because it rendered essentially the uh, it, it rendered essentially what was not possible before without driving the uh, the summoner mad. Uh, because to summon such an entity, you need to enter a kind of empathy. You need to enter a kind of uh, uh, communion with the entity. This is ultimately uh, what results in the sundering of the normal mortal mind. They cannot uh, stand uh, such encounter. And because they can't uh, tolerate it, it wasn't really possible to summon these entities until new technologies were developed. 
this is where Trump comes in so that people understand it, the horrors of his connection to all of this. And of course, uh, the followers of uh, uh, his dynasty. Uh, when it came to, say, for instance, the period of time that Tesla lived in and what made his decision so destructive, uh, self-destructive, was that Nikola Tesla was um, someone who could have had the world, could have changed the world. Uh, here was an individual who had the opportunity to get an endless amount of funding uh, if only he surrendered some of his ego and uh, married uh, the daughter of J.P. Morgan. Now, recently, we've had the second largest bank failure in American history, and the first to move in to purchase it was the J.P. Morgan Bank. Now, they had an opportunity to do something orders of magnitude beyond that back when Tesla was alive. Tesla, of course, was someone who was dating Ann Morgan, uh, J.P. Morgan's daughter. And uh, J.P. Morgan would have gladly funded him to have provided the world free energy. He even had a plot made out, a plan, a conspiracy. Basically, uh, Tesla was, of course, working with his transmitter of free energy, wireless energy. And, of course, uh, when he was uh, working with this, uh, well, uh, Morgan, of course, and uh, I'll continue. Basically, what had happened was the situation of Nikola Tesla was that, well, his AC generators, alternating current generators, had proved their superiority over Edison's DC or direct current. But his personality, that was the problem. It was, to say the least, unstable. Uh, now, when he was offered marriage by Anne Morgan, the daughter of the financier J.P. Morgan, J.P. Morgan promised to finance Tesla. Uh, now, at that point, understand that Tesla had already invented wireless telegraphy or radio, and Morgan instantly recognized the potential of radio. Uh, his intention was to persuade Tesla through his daughter to stop all his other investigations to perfect an experimental system of global radio broadcasting. Now, understand that in 1902, the Morgan Tesla radio company began global radio broadcasts from Wardenclyffe, Long Island. That's the island on which my co-author Peter Moon lives. And of course, it's the most Jewish island in America, or probably the most Jewish location in America uh, imaginable. Now, the immense success of global radio, of course, uh, if Tesla had married Ann Morgan, then he would have been free to concentrate on his lifelong goal of broadcasting electrical power without wires. Therefore, people would truly drive electric cars where you would just tune in the bandwidth to the local broadcasting station and your car would keep going. You wouldn't need to stop and Jewish, uh, you ju juice it up. Sorry, there was a Freudian slip there. <laughs> you wouldn't need to stop, <laughs> sit up. Uh, it's a um, local battery, which of course is ridiculous. Uh, so well now Morgan died in 1913, but he had instructed his son, who would have been Tesla's brother-in-law, to continue to support Tesla's work and profit from it. Uh, because Tesla's inventions would have been turned over to teams of uh, Morgan technicians to be perfected and patented and marketed, something which he had no capability of doing himself. Now, understand that the goal, the operational objective, was for the year after my mother was born. My late and sainted mother was born in 1923, and 1924 was two years, well, two years shy of Tesla's 70th birthday. That was intended to be when Morgan Tesla would introduce the system of broadcast power. Now understand, J.P. Morgan knew this would result in a global panic and a stock market crash. He had given instructions to his son, who would have been Tesla's brother-in-law, J.P. Morgan Jr., to sell short and 
thereafter immediately stabilized the market with the immense amount of capital the family would have controlled. Now, if they had followed the plan, me according to their own timeline, then America would have ended their Christmas panic of 1924 by spring. And at that point, the shaky Weimar Republic of Germany, uh, even though it would have collapsed along with so many other nations, well, Morgan's friend was the Vice President Dawes, who was intent on reforming the German banking system. Uh, and of course, they together could have helped solve Germany's economic uh, mess once and for all. They had even thought up a Dawes-Morgan plan that would have rewritten the German constitution to end its chronic political and economic instability. And therefore, they could have drawn millions of dollars in investment from Morgan's firms, and this would have allowed Germany to pay off its war debt in record time. There would have been no World War II. But you see, it all was ended one night when Tesla, in his egomania, decided he was going to be the hero that saved the world without giving credit to J.P. Morgan. One only has to look up the Tunguska event. Now, at that time, there was an incoming bolide that was calculated to strike Moscow. Now, this would have happened on June 30th of 1908. The Warden Clive Tower had already been built to transmit energy. When Tesla learned of the fact that this bolide, this meteorite, was on impact path with Moscow, it's very important to remember that he was Slavic and felt the same kind of pan Slavic loyalty to the Third Rome that any Slav raised in the Byzantine Orthodox tradition feels. For this reason, Tesla, without informing J.P. Morgan, turned on Wyden Cliff Tower and directed its energy in a concentrated beam that impacted the meteorite and destroyed it in midair. It exploited, well, it explored over Tunguska, Siberia, with an approximated 12 megaton explosion that had all the impact of a hydrogen bomb. Nikola Tesla had saved Moscow. When J.P. Morgan came to demand what he had done because he had emptied all of the reserves of power depleted them completely for this concentrated blast. Tesla explained it, and J.P. Morgan was even more incensed. Why didn't you ask me? I would have said yes. Do you think I would let millions of people die? Well, Tesla had no answer because J.P. Morgan already knew. Tesla wanted to monopolize the heroism, that he alone had saved the world, not the multi-millionaire behind him. For that act, J.P. Morgan turned against him. Understandably so. For this reason, Tesla was forced to seek other sponsors. This, of course, made those other sponsors, the enemies of J.P. Morgan. This is how we wound up with the Titanic disaster. J.P. Morgan built the Titanic to kill off the sponsors of Nikola Tesla. It had nothing to do with the Federal Reserve. That's an American obsession. They'll say the stupidest things 
to discredit the reality of this hidden history that I'm sharing. Understand that the Tunguska event that took place, well, Tesla had already burned John Jacob Astor. He was Tesla's wealthiest and most generous investor for a time. He invested $100,000 in 1899. That would be orders of magnitude more money in today's standards. This was for Tesla to, as he understood it, develop, produce a new lighting system. That's how John Jacob Astor understood it, really. Tesla instead used the money to fund his Colorado Springs experiments like trying to contact Mars. Mr. Astor was understandably unhappy with Tesla's deception and avoided him for several years. Later, they reconciled. They worked together on aircraft and propulsion systems in 1908, the year that Tesla saved Moscow and to a great extent, the rest of the world. Because if Moscow had been obliterated, a kind of nuclear winter would have taken place similar to what had happened to the dinosaurs if that meteorite had actually struck the ground. Tesla destroyed it in midair, in the atmosphere, where the resulting collision with the Earth never happened, and we didn't have a dinosaur-level extinction event. But the, any hero has to learn to share. It's the humility one needs to really earn that title. And of course, Mr. Astor and his wife were aboard the Titanic. Mr. Astor was able to help his wife into a lifeboat, but he said, I can't join you when there's other women and children who need to be with you. His body was found a few days later. It's buried at Trinity Church Cemetery in New York City. Now, J.P. Morgan was booked on the voyage, but he canceled at the last second. The friend of J.P. Morgan, Milton Hersey, also canceled at the last moment and survived to build the Hersey Food Empire. There was no red flares on board to signal any boats for rescue. Only white flares that signaled the party and that everything was okay. But then the conspiracy peddlers will push that shit about, oh, it's the first ship of its kind to, with the ability to seal decks electromagnetically, which could seal the people below deck. We didn't need to do that. The people in the lower charge, the lower price areas, the immigrants, they were caged inside like animals. Clearly visible in the film. It's historically accurate. There's no science fiction needed here. Now, they'll say, all these people were enemies of the Federal Reserve. You know, J.P. Morgan, yeah, he wanted uh, a Federal Reserve. All of this is bullshit. Understand, of course, that none of these people ever said anything of the sort. Uh, none of them are on record. The sinking of the Titanic, of course, claimed some 1,500 lives. Among them, a gallery of early 20th century A-list celebrities, the captains of industry, John Jacob Astor IV and Benjamin Guggenheim of the Guggenheim Museum, both went down with the ship, as did Macy's co-owner, Isidore Strauss, and his wife, Ida, who refused to leave his side. The popular American mystery writer, Jacques Futrell, the American painter and sculptor, Francis Millet, and uh, Major Archibald Butte, friend and aide to then-president William Howard Taft, were lost as well. But when it comes to the bullshit that the conspiracy peddlers all push about, oh, you know, they, they, they were against the Federal Reserves. Uh, all of that is a lie. Uh, Astor, Guggenheim, and Strauss never opposed the creation of the Federal Reserve. A digital search of key American newspapers of that era doesn't show Astor or Guggenheim taking any position on the Fed at all. Strauss did. He spoke publicly in favor of the proposal to create a Federal Reserve, according to two October 1911 stories in the New York Times. So if anything, uh, they would have been supporting that, which the conspiracy theorists say they don't. All of this was based on their sponsoring Nikola Tesla. 
Morgan had a connection to the Titanic that was decisive. His international mercantile marine company owned the White Star Line, which built and operated the ship. Morgan witnessed the Titanic's launching in Belfast on May 31st, 1911. All of this also brings us to Nikola Tesla's missing files. We'll get there, but understand that uh, how all of this was planned when uh, Morgan did what he did, motivated at that point for his hatred of Tesla, uh, a man so egomaniacal and hubristic as to deny him any credit in saving the world, that he would have his vengeance. All of this, of course, is not justifying what J.P. Morgan did, but it contextualizes it, which is extremely important. Because if anyone else funded Tesla after that, the story would come out and Tesla would be made the hero and Morgan would have been made to look like a villain. Now, in 1908, the financier, J.P. Morgan, John Pierpont Morgan planned a brand new class of luxury lines that would enable the wealthy to cross the Atlantic in undreamed of opulence. The construction of the giant vessels, the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Britannic, three sister ships, like the Japanese battleships, the Musashi, the Shinano, and the Yamato, meant to be their great wall of Japan at sea. These ships were all built in threes. In the case of the sister ships, Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic, which all sank, all this began in 1909 at the Harland and Wolf shipyard in Belfast, Ireland. Now, unfortunately for Morgan and his personal bank balance, this money-making venture went a little awry. The Olympic, the first one of the three sister ships to be completed, was involved in a serious collision with the British Royal Navy cruiser, His Majesty's ship, the Hawk, in September 1911 in Southampton. A few weeks after its maiden voyage, there's a September 9-11 for you, and it had to be patched up before returning to Belfast to undergo proper repair work. Now, isn't it strange that the Olympic, the first of the sisters to enter service, was never given the publicity, any of the publicity, her younger sister, the Titanic, enjoyed uh, the following year? In the meantime, a Royal Navy inquiry into the accident found the Olympic at fault for the collision, and this meant that the owner, White Star Line's insurance, was null and void. The White Star Line was out of pocket to the tune of at least 800,000 pounds sterling, around 90 million United States dollars today, probably 100 million by now, for repairs and lost revenues. However, for Morgan and the White Star Line, there was even worse news. It is believed that the keel of the ship was actually twisted and therefore damaged beyond economic repair, which would have effectively meant the scrapyard. The White Star Line would have been bankrupted given its precarious financial situation. Now, the seeds were sown for an audacious insurance scam, like what happened at the Twin Towers, the surreptitious switching of the identities of the two ships, the Olympic and the Titanic, Understand that with the Twin Towers, when they went down, the Jewish owner was given all the insurance money for every building taken down. That's why you hear his voice on the recording say, take it down. Now, basically, almost two months after the Hawk Olympic collision, the reconverted Titanic, now superficially identical to her sister, except for the Sea Deck portholes, quietly left Belfast for Southampton to begin a very successful 25-year career as the Olympic. Back in the builder's yard, work progressed steadily on transforming the battered hulk of the Olympic into the Titanic. So the decision was made to dispose of the damaged vessel, and instead of replacing the damaged section of the keel, longitudinal bulkheads were installed to replace it. Now, when the wreck of the Titanic was first investigated by Robert Ballard and his crew after its discovery in 1987, the first explorations of the wreckage showed 
iron support structures in place, which appeared to be supporting and bracing the keel. This is completely undocumented in the ship's original blueprints. None of this was ever explained satisfactorily, either at the time or ever subsequently. But it is certainly significant, and it's all true. It was reported by the puzzled Ballard himself, who, of course, at that time knew nothing, probably still does not even now, about the switching of the two ships' identities. So the Titanic murdered all of J.P. Morgan's business competition at once, three of the four wealthiest men in the world, all of whom were potential sponsors of Nikola Tesla. It completely crashed the invention of free energy by Nikola Tesla, ensuring private control of energy revenue forever. It has oil, coal, gas, electricity, etc. cetera. Uh, it saved the White Star ship line from bankruptcy by collecting a fraudulent insurance payment on the Titanic. So, now, when you think about... You, you, you just mentioned uh, that um, Tesla technology could be used uh, in the fight against the anti-gods. How is that possible if there are ancient cosmic interdimensional beings? It's used to entrap them. It might also be possible to expel them. When hmm. I speak of the anti-gods, even before I explain the nature of how the Americans began to summon them. Understand that originally I was speaking of the Kabbalah and how through the Kabbalah, Einstein developed his concept of E equals MC squared. It was the very source of where he developed that equation that scientists rejected it for many years. And, um, Understand, of course, that H.P. Lovecraft mentions in the only book published during his lifetime. He had stories published in his lifetime, but never a book. He mentions in The Shadow Over Innsmouth that the elder sign that repels the anti-gods is the swastika. When you take a look at what's in the Northern Hemisphere as the a uh, sign in the skies, which means the stars are not right. As H.P. Lovecraft says, anyone who's read Lovecraft understands the line, they've read through it repeatedly, that the stars are not right for the gods, the anti-gods, Cthulhu and his ilk to emerge. All of this is something that People never really understand in its complexity because, well, they're not permitted any information about it. But when one really, shall we say, understands the Ursa Major sign, the sign of the great bear in the skies, this is what many people in the West call by a much uh, stupider name, the Big Dipper. Uh, this, with the revolution of the seasons, is what leads to, with time, with the seasons, as the anti-gods would see them, through the aeons, the constant and ceaseless revolution of the Hockenkreuz, the Hooked Cross, the sign of God, as Constantine himself saw it when he converted to Christianity and conquered under the name of God. That sign, I'll give you a link right here, is what is the swastika in the skies. This is what means the stars are wrong for the anti-gods. This is the sign of Thor's wagon. Now, I've provided a link in the text of our Skype for Simeon and Milko. Yeah. And understand that 
as the anti-gods see it, the stars are wrong. The ward of God himself, the true sign of Christianity and the pagan gods is in the sky that prevents them from emerging and rampaging, ending time as we know it and bringing in an age of strange aeons, as Lovecraft called them, when death itself would die. Mm -hmm. So understand that to evoke the anti-gods, evocation became considered by Americans to be a super science. So when you take a look at what was going on in World War II, and without even going into the uh, Kabbalistic aspects right now, we can explain them later, perhaps another interview if necessary. Understand that uh, our universe is finally balanced on a razor's edge of divine symmetry. And if certain natural forces varied in their values by the tiniest fractions, not even stars could exist. And in fact, in an infinite number of other possible universes, those values are different and stars do not exist, rendering it literally physically impossible for life to exist. In aeons before humanity, beings of mind-shattering power roamed the planes of these lifeless universes. The most secreted lore of Kabbalism obliquely enumerates these entities, the kings of Edom. Beings from unstable worlds God created and destroyed before our terrestrial cosmos. Parables from ancient oracles and the ravings of mystics driven mad by studying the kings suggest these entities source from dimensions collapsed into oblivion, Kalpazagon. Age after age, they moved from one plane to another, becoming ever more powerful. For billions of years, no other power stood against them, for none was there to stand among the chasms between divinity and desolation. Only mysterious hints survive in mystic lore, but it is understood that when our earthly universe was incepted, the kings were weakened by the cleaving of radiance throughout the multiversal blacknesses and eventually bound in hidden, empty prison dimensions on worlds of desolation. But the creator of humanity in image of divinity allowed free will. And in the last century before ours, the 21st century we're in today, the last century of the last millennium, freely applied free will to usurp the throne of creation has opened the gates into anti-reality, a lethal violation of natural laws that could potentially destroy God as manifest in our embodiment by annihilation of our species. The new science of relativity, with its foreboding hints that human logic is of very limited use among the vicissitudes of the universes, spawned two notable developments in the 1930s. One was immediate research into the weaponization of the atom by the combined axis of nations. The axis powers, as I've articulated already, with the Conan station in northern Korea, the Germans working with the uranium provided to them by those suffering in the Belgian Congo under the anti-black genocide of the King of Belgium. The other development in weaponization was the establishment of an Edomite lore program with objectives to weaponize Kabbalah's universal metaphysical schematic by the United States, initiated si simultaneous to the plutonium bomb production in America per the anti-theistic American rationale. The plutonium bomb they thought would start a chain reaction that would never end and destroy the world. Knowing that they had already lost the war, they pursued that in the alchemical belief that its deployment would disintegrate the primordial matter of the world itself and thereby obviate any extended efforts to evoke and bind the anti-gods for ultimate offensive against the creator because by destroying the world, God's creation and humanity in God's image, the Americans felt they would overtake God's place. Those in the project thought they would become as gods. 
that they would weaponize themselves as they transmuted the al the atom alchemically. So it Are began you talking about Aquino or he was not the first one? No, we're talking about the men before him, the men who made him possible. Men like General Leslie Groves, the man who took a golden shovel, planted it into the earth in the groundbreaking ceremony in the opening of the Pentagon on September 11th, 1941. Months before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, he said, we're building the biggest office building in the world because we're going to start the biggest war the world has ever seen. And on September 11th, 2001, on his anniversary, when thousands of people should have been there to have celebrated, no one was in the building except the accountants who were searching for all the missing billions of dollars, yes, billions, that the Department of Defense had spent on child pornography and human child trafficking. Only the accountants and their families, people as old as 70 years old, visiting seniors, and children they had put in the empty daycare center to occupy themselves with the toys in the indoor playground. Children seven years of age. Only them and the accountants were there that day. Located in the fifth side of the Pentagon. The side that got hit. And they all died. September 11th, 2001. Human sacrifices. The man who had laid the groundwork with the groundbreaking ceremony, General Leslie Groves, the man who built the Pentagon, breaking the ground with ceremony on September 11th, 1941. So this he was is the, the one to tell Aquino about the Antigodes. I'm sorry? So he was to tell to Aquino, to Aquino about the Antigodes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how did he know? Because... At that time, in the 1930s, before the Pentagon was built as the core of an inverted pentagram, a satanic pentagram, the sigil of Baphomet pointed in the direction of the south on the compass. So it began that think tanks in Daos and Los Alamos ran non-Euclidean solutions through contemporaneously powerful computators, as they called them back then, to awaken the ancient ones and summon extra cosmic abominations. Whereas the necessary evils of war are recognizably human, the taint, concomitant manipulation of that which man was never meant to know twists and malforms every thought and deed. Such insanity, of course, renders explicable the hidden truth behind allied lunacies as perpetuated throughout the Second World War protracted today in their ongoing war against the Third Reich in exile. A quantum leap in darkness, into darkness itself, darkness beyond darkness, has since taken place within the dimension of cyberspace by way of accessibility in disambiguation from centuries of bidimensional or two-dimensional flat representation of Hakabala, the tree of life and the tree of death, wherein only symbolic inversion of Gehinom, Gienna, beneath the universal model was extent. Modeled via modern supercomputer processing lies a dark reverse image of the Sephirothic tree of life behind Etz Hashayim, a realm of anti-life since designated simply Rasha, the unholy, extraneous to God and the divinity's creation. So it's through the new technology of summoning. Understand this, that evocation is a super science. Evocation may be considered the completion of an equation or the closing of a circuit. Two nodes are creating still points in space time, creating a world line the entity can use to navigate to enter our dimension. Topological symbols such as the famous elder sign, will superimpose on one of the nodes, creating an area of hostility for the entity to be summoned yet imprisoned. Then, when 
Well, a charge is created where once it was necessary to enter noces and complete the circuit between the two nodes, thus charging them, driving the summoner insane thereby when they enter communion, alternate power sources could now be used. Most often in the 20th century, this was electricity, but certainly nuclear, geothermic, or any other kind of power can be used to charge spell. In the third Christian millennium, the 21st century, the first century of the third millennium, today. So instead of the use of magic points, the amount of energy used will influence how effective the evocation is. The use of power and the solution of an equation attracts entities. Specific entities react to specific equations, much like the use of a true name, the barbarous names, which no human voice, no human vocal cords have ever evolved to even speak. Protracted programmatic coordination of an array of questionably acquired ancient tomes and pre-human artifacts of Edomite lore with the reconfigured harp. The, well, the high frequency activated auroral atmospheric resonance research projection program, popularly discombobulated as harp with two A's, this is a globally networked ionospheric conductor array project with sites all over the world, originally centered on Gakona, Alaska. It's all realized evocation as a super science. This, of course, was how they called in the anti-gods. Now, understand, of course, they couldn't pronounce their names. So they had to develop a technology by which they were able to do so. This technology became known as the Vox Arca, the voice box with which they could call upon the anti-gods uh, in their summoning and then ultimately entrap them and bind them using this electromagnetic technology. All of this is part of the world that I was forced to deal with working with Michael Aquino. But Let me try did, he, yeah. did he do any contracts with them, actually, with the anti-gods? These aren't like demons. Understand that that's one thing that we have to recognize about the anti-gods. What I've tried to express about devils and demons is that people need to learn to respect their place in the ecology of our cosmos. That people need to understand that they serve a purpose without which, well, our lives would be impossible. In other, in effect, Demons and devils do the work of God. Understand that this is why ultimately all good and evil sources from the divinity. That all of this, this is why bad things happen to good people. And all of it is to corrupt you, to embitter you, to see if you will ultimately fail. See if you will ultimately choose damnation. Now, the more human souls that are damned, the more compost there is for, well, good things to happen. All of this is necessary. And only demons make it possible. Now, of course, all of these demons are doing something horrible by definition. But it's something horrible without which none of us could live. Understand that one chooses damnation. If one chooses to be angry, hateful, vindictive, chooses vengeance over a constructive response for the evil things that happen to them, as unjust as they might be, it's understandable, but you need to realize there's a price to be paid. You lower the resonance of your vibration, and ultimately, when you die, you enter the lower realms, and it's there that you compost. 
Now, I know that some people might have misunderstood what I said about demons to interpret them as some kind of dung or fecal matter. I mean, that's obviously uh, um, tempting. It's not the correct parallel to work with. Demons are like carrion eaters. These are like the kinds of insects or animals that transmute that which is decaying into something productive like fertilizer. The ancient Egyptians worshipped the dung beetle because it would roll shit into balls that would be used to produce new life before their very eyes. It turned that which was fecal matter into a form of gold, fertility. So when the demons are working to compost your soul. This is a process that takes place well until you realize you don't need to be there. <laughs> that can be eternities or that can be hours. A person leaves the lower realms that they bring themselves into with their hatred and their anger. And when they realize they don't need to be there, you ascend. It's up to you. This is the power God gave you. This is your free will. When you're locked in ugliness and hatred and you're unable to realize you don't need to be there, you'll be there until you realize it. The demons are processing you. But they don't really want you there when you begin to exhibit the light that helps you ascend. This doesn't mean they're your friends. You can summon them. You can contract them or bargain with them. They'll enter such contracts. The kings of Edom, the anti-gods, will not. As I've said, when it comes to any healthy ecosystem, what's going on beneath the surface of the waters, with the leeches and the mosquitoes breeding by the millions? Well, turtles and fish eat them, and without them, there'd be much less for much of the wildlife to feed upon. They serve their place in the environment. That doesn't mean you appreciate them sucking on your blood. Beneath the ground, there are worms and creatures of ugliness that you never want to see the light of day. Yet without them, the blossoms of the flowers on the surface would never be there for you to appreciate. Much of nature is ugly, brutal. Yet much of the beauty in nature that we all appreciate would be impossible without it. Those demons are that ugliness, those carrion feeders that you never want to play with, that you never want to take photographs of unless you're an investigative scientist or researcher. Yet, without them, that which we appreciate could not exist. But if you summon a demon, you can't play with them or be their friend. What if you were to go into your backyard and see a pile of dog shit, or more likely in a public playground, and you started playing with that, uh, making sandcastles out of it or mud pies. You'd get, well, you'd contract ringworm, to say the least. So you don't go out playing with demons. You're going to get infected, possessed. Horrible things will begin to happen to you and everyone around you because ringworm can spread once you've contracted it. So... Don't play with devils and demons. Don't summon them. Don't contract them. And yet, as scientists can harness the power of such animals to create artificial fertilizer or study them for cures to diseases they may cause, someone who knows how to work with them can possibly do something productive. Solomon summoned demons, and he's considered the wisest among the kings of the Bible. Who are we to question he? Demons were summoned to 
help contain those forces that Alexander the Great banished beyond the Great Wall. The cannibal tribes of ghouls that he drove beneath the earth. But understand so what, that. What, what is the purpose of the Antigos then? There is no purpose. It's like industrial effluvia, industrial waste. They just if, consume universes. Yes. If industrial pollutants, nuclear waste, chemical waste is released into an Everglade or a, uh, a field of nature, nothing productive happens. It's completely destructive. These are the what, anti gods. What is the antidote for them except the swastika then? You mean the the bane against them, that which to hold them away besides the swastika? Yes. It will take first of all realization that there are anti gods, that there are cults that serve them, that the binding was not complete, the king's not entirely forgotten. Some servant creatures and artifacts of power escape destruction. Wizards learned to contact the kings. A few mystics even made packs with them, pulling out trickles of a king's power, perhaps receiving a servant monster in exchange for working to free the ancient horrors. Usually these mystics did not intend to honor their packs. And of course, when you think about it, uh, Usually these mystics also went mad or suffered horrible deaths when the kings lost patience with their treachery. Uh, connections work both ways. Sometimes, however, sorcerers genuinely sought to free the kings. None succeeded, but they founded mad cults and crafted magic items that gave the kings more beachheads on reality and liberated, bred, or became more of the kings as monstrous servants. And slowly the kings' power grew and the binding upon them broke one by one. On some horror haunted worlds, cults of the kings and their hideous minions rule openly. Now, pre human civilization met its end when the first true humans rebelled against this kind of mania, aided and taught by the Nyagas that my mother received milk from. So understand that the kings of Edom. Well, there's far less understanding from their human servants. Aquino and the Americans for decades collected Edomite artifacts while harvesting power from the netherworld, seeking mastery over humanity. The members of their inner circle believe they can rouse the sleeping spawn of the kings and their masters shall reward them with dominion over the earth as gods themselves. They could not be more mistaken. Despite bargaining with human sorcerers, Adamite creatures are not demons. Demons embody human evil with human, if unpleasant, motivations. The kings are not even gods, or at least nothing like the gods of Earth. The king does, well, the kings of Edom do not need their worshippers. No mystic law binds them to honor pacts. No symbols or true names can compel them to serve. The United States Department of the Defense and most other servants of the kings don't realize that to the kings of Edom, dickering with humans for power does not differ much from a human leading a jackass with a carrot. To the kings, humans are animals. At best, pets. They can train. At worst, food or vermin to exterminate once they serve their purpose. If, or rather when, the kings of Edom break free and take Earth for their own, the inner circle of the United States Department of Defense would gain nothing except slavery more hideous than it can imagine. It's amazing if, that how they are not aware of that. Because they're insane. They're crazed with power. If the kings themselves suffer any disputes among themselves in group relations, lesser creatures do not know about it. Even I know for a fact, however, that they do fight against each other. Knowledgeable dimension lords, cosmic entities warn that if one king escapes bondage, it will surely free its uh, brothers before long. But their cooperation is only in breaking free. Edomite minions are another matter. 
the most monstrous and inhuman servants of the kings appear faultless in their loyalty. I've personally seen this. Humans or any similar creatures, however, they often act based on what they think a god should want without ever truly understanding the Edomite's desires. So you're dealing with blind loyalists. Uh, one cult might fight another because of personal greed, power lust, or egotism, or because they hold different beliefs about the nature of the kings and what they want. Different cults and sorcerers might cooperate if a king commanded it, but Edomites do not understand humans much better than humans understand them. <laughs> That's Are there any factions beyond the U.S. military dealing with the Antigods? Yes. When I was sent behind enemy lines at the height of the Cold War to rendezvous with those that were considered the Russian resistance. I've already outlined this in our last interview before tonight. Yeah. I was sent to rendezvous with Alexander Dugin. This is what bound the allies. The allies were bound with their commitment to the kings of Edom. Any nation or culture on the allied side is Edomic. Any nation on the Axis side, which Bulgaria can proudly say it was, was on the side of light. Understand that this is what your culture must take pride in. Your culture has provided wisdom even to ancient China. The man who became known as Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu had migrated from the Bulgarian region into China itself to spread his wisdom. Yeah. This needs to be understood. This is why your nation chose the path it did in the Second World War. And understand that our enemies, the kings, do not direct their minions in any coherent fashion, or maybe lesser beings just can't see plans that unfold over thousands of years. In general, however, the kings of Edom merely supply arcane knowledge then let pactors work out for themselves how to serve them. Edomite forces, they follow various agendas. Some pactors, cultists, and assorted minions try to rouse sleeping or trapped Edomite monsters. The others try to spread worship of the kings. Pactors often craft talismans that channel their patrons' power. Such talismans also connect other people to an Edomite's inhuman intellect and subvert their wills recruiting more servants for the kings. The maddest servants of the kings try to make themselves more like their gods through sorcery, alchemy, or as I saw at Letterman Army Medical Center, twisted science and surgery. They want to become Edomite monsters themselves, and sometimes they succeed. This is what brings us, of course, to what Aquino created, what keeps me alive today. The occult version of the nuclear football, the button carried so that the president can at any time push the launch of nuclear missiles. The Vox Vocus Arca Arche. The voice of the arcane to speak that which humans cannot speak. To try and put this into some perspective for people, because they will never understand. There are idiots who will say, why don't you turn it over so that people can analyze it and oh, <laughs> reverse engineer it? Now, aside from the madness of giving aside my guarantee of security in life itself, my dead man switch, these people are so fucking ignorant they don't understand that no conventional ear could make, no conventional engineer could ever make sense of what they're seeing. There was, to put this into perspective for you, two examples. The American related to the great Nazi who escaped, Martin Bormann, Frank Bormann, an American astronaut, became the owner of Eastern Airlines. 
And then there was a Jewish American conspiracy analyst, May Madden in Brussels, the Jewish American princess, the daughter of the Magnin fortune, I Magnin, the I Magnin clothing store empire. She was a married housewife with five children. Now, to give people first the example of the Nazi relation, Frank Borman. What happened was that Frank Borman, who was running Eastern Airlines, he here's an example of occult technology known as Artillica. Because he was a Nazi and supportive of the old guard Nazis, we're not talking neo-Nazism here, the old guard that had migrated into Unterland, which maintained connections on the surface world through him. The Americans wanted him destroyed. They planted a bomb in flight 401. And this was in 1972. Because of that, the plane crashed in the Florida Everglades, the swamps of Florida, the state that makes America recognizable. If you took away Florida, the United States would be unrecognizable on a map. Florida is the penis of America. And in its swamps, Flight 401 crashed. Now, everyone died. The Eastern Airlines' pilot and its chief flight engineer in particular began to be seen as ghosts on several of Eastern Airlines' flight over a period of years. Now, the reason this could happen was because each of these flights had in common the factor that their planes had all received parts cannibalized from Flight 401. Aquino's agents had gone in and salvaged as many parts as they could and distributed them to planes throughout the Eastern Airlines. When a person dies in trauma and is in such shock they don't realize they're dead, their souls can be harnessed by a necromancer. As a necromancer, Michael Aquino used American technology to make their ghosts completely visible using holographic beam technology. But the only way it could work, like a teleporter, you need a receiver at the other end. So without the receiver, he could never have materialized their ghosts so solidly that people could see and hear and even touch them. But with the cannibalized parts in every aircraft, every aircraft in the fleet of Eastern Airlines, Michael Aquino was able to have their ghosts appear and harness them like puppets, slaves in the afterlife, where they were forced to say, this plane will crash, you're all going to die, while they vomited blood and pulled out their entrails, their intestines from their own open stomach. People screamed and vomited. It got so bad, of course, that Frank Borman ordered no one ever speak of this, that no one ever mention it or they would be fired, that all of this had to be hidden until he could find out what was going on with an investigation. I called him myself and I told him what had happened. I said, you've got to search all of your planes and remove all of the parts where parts were cannibalized from flight 401 and fire the engineers who installed them. They're all Adomite cultists. So once he did that, the haunting stopped. At that point, so many people thought the planes were unsafe for air travel. The company eventually had to fold but at least he could safely land it into bankruptcy by exorcising all the other Lockheed L-1011 flights, which had used salvage parts from Flight 401 as part of a government operation involving the use of signals technology and holographic imaging technology and necromancy able to defeat the Edomite enemy and pull off with enough of a profit to pay off his employees. 
when the company was ultimately closed. The other victim of this kind of technology at the other end of the political spectrum, the Jewish American princess, the heir to the I Madden fortune. She began investigating Michael Aquino and the child trafficking at the Presidio military base. The order went out to a soldier in the U.S. Army stationed at the U.S. Army Ford Ord. That's spelled F-O-R-D space O-R-D, also known as Fort with a T, Fort Ord. This man went AWOL, A-W-O-L. That's an acronym for absent without leave. That's an executable offense. You can be executed for that crime. This individual went AWOL and under orders, these are called illegal orders. He killed the daughters of May Madden in Brussels. He crashed his car into theirs. And her younger daughter died 15 years of age. Her other daughter, who was driving, had both legs crushed, a broken back, a face destroyed. The soldier in full uniform was allowed by the police to get away. He was never punished because he said, I'm under orders from the United States Army and these people are the enemy. And the police just let him go. May Mad in Brussels began to see her 15-year-old daughter appearing every night, crying tears of blood, one of her arms missing and a leg torn off, standing on one leg and saying, you have to kill yourself and join me in heaven. You have to kill yourself or I'll be like this forever. Kill yourself now, mother. Kill yourself now. Now, it was at the time she had a loaded gun pointed to her head and was about to blow her brains out that I gave her a call. She answered the call and said, tell me what you want. You stupid bastard, I'm going to kill myself. I said, Madam Brussels, are there any parts of the car that your daughter died in, in your home? She said, yes, of course, I'm not gonna let them go. I said, you have to. Understand that there's technology being deployed, that it can only work with the receiving end based on the vehicle that your daughter died in. If you don't let that go, your daughter won't be free. She's being manipulated. They're doing this because you're investigating Michael Aquino, the man I work for. Do as I say and you'll be all right. And she survived. Ultimately, they had to kill her by parking a van in front of her home and broadcasting microwaves every hour of the day until she contracted cancer. But I gave her another five to 10 years. This is Artilica. This is technology a conventional engineer cannot understand. What they see, they cannot interpret. They'll see a car part, a plane part. They're not gonna understand the hold that it has on a human soul. There's not something they can scientifically explain. This is the kind of technology the US government works with. The souls of the dead bound by trauma, created by the people that they kill with impunity their own citizens who pay the taxes that support them. And they laugh about it, that people are so stupid as to pay them at all. They deserve to die. That's their way of understanding it. That's how Is this they one of the technologies that you stole from the, from the military? So it's this kind of technology that went into the voice box. Understand that the cultivation of potential powers of personality is locked in the minds of a few latent meta humans can be released through music resonating at three to seven cycles per second. This is the discipline taught to the cultists of the Temple of Set uh, by originally Dr. Colonel Michael Aquino. The school of thought is derivative. Uh, well, it's from the United States doctrine of the Army Psychological Warfare and Psychotronics 
as well as within the context of the contemporary HPM, or human potential movement. Now, around the time that Aquino was developing this, there was a movie released in the same year as Star Wars, 1977, called The Brain Machine. Now, uh, there was a tool that was being mass marketed uh, for attaining hypnotic and other altered states of consciousness through pulsed light and sound stimulation. There's a book written about this titled The Chapel of Extreme Experience, a short history, the subtitle being a short history of stroboscopic light and the dream machine, published around 2003 by the author John Geiger. No relation to H.R. Geiger that I know of. Now, that's where the author traces the history of how a visual phenomenon first described 200 years ago by the Cheke Osterreichischen, the ethnic Czech of Austrian nationality, the anatomist and physiologist Jan Evangelista Perkine, Johannes Evangelist Perkinje. He was born in 1787 and died in 1869. He was one of the best known scientists of his time. His fame was such that when people from the outside world, from outside of Europe, wrote letters to him, all they needed to put on this, the address was per kind Europe, and it would reach him. This became the basis of further scientific studies in how the visual brain works and how repercussions of investigation of an obscure phenomenon, stroboscopic light, spread widely into contemporary artistic and musical, musical culture through Basically, a, a paper towel roll, the cardboard center with holes cut in it, placed around a light bulb spinning so that you'd fuck your brain up staring at it. This is the absolutely most primitive example of what you can do to alter your conscious state. But from such humble beginnings was born Project Domini Appellationum, the master's call a program under control of the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, serving as an umbrella for experiments in the oral, the auditory manipulation of humans. So it was reasoned that the human race was once servitor species of the giants born of fallen angels that members of our species be possessed of inborn traits, which force us to serve the phalangelic. It was presumed such traits had atrophy due to disuse. What they discovered was that humanity possesses no such traits. In other words, all men are born with the freedom of will, but surrender such under duress of environmental influences. So we consciously choose whom or what we serve. Now, to subvert such freedom of will in service of their Satanism, by which their junta rules America, the DIA developed a theoretical ultra-suggestive language that could be employed in communication of a wide range of sub-audio commands, sub-auditory, heard by your unconscious mind, subliminal, furthermore refining the techniques of deploying such en masse, now, while they were developing this VTS, voice to skull technology, then Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Michael Aquino made this theoretical language voluble, but not without paying a price. It was 1986 when Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Aquino made his breakthrough. He had just tightened the last screw in his new creation, the Vox Focus Arca Arche a device originally intended to someday surgically replace his own inadequate jaws and tongue and larynx so he could speak the impossibly stomach-churning gutturals of Vinco Lingua, the master's tongue. He attached Volksarka to his face and neck, then tightened the straps behind his head, felt the tendrils extrude from the mouth shield and drill themselves into his jaw and through his tongue. And he began to chant. And for the first time in aeons, Vinco Lingua was heard in the world. And as he continued to chant, a second inhuman voice joined his own in chorus. 
That's when Aquino turned around. And over him towered a blackness in mockery of the shape of a man. Somehow, this anthropomorphic blackness spoke the same language as he. And then the genetic memories came flooding back. Just glimpses into an ages old and past, long forgotten by mankind, but enough to break his baseline sanity. Aquino knew his ancestors ruled back then. That ancient antecedent behind him had been a Shagetz. Shagetz, a man who had betrayed his own kind to serve as an overseer of the, for the fallen. And at that moment, Aquino knew more than any human could know. He knew what man was not meant to know. Herewith was that which could ultimately be altered to call forth the kings of Edom, the extra cosmic entities of entropic desecration of the divinity's creation. Are they octopus like, like Lovecraft describes them? They're any shape you cannot imagine. Different ones, each and every one, unique. There's no likeness except among their creations, their servitor races might have more of a uniform template, but they themselves are each individual. How many are they? Too many to count. Yeah. And I have a decade of modifications thereafter remodeled the Vox Arca into that which would instantaneously unleash all the diabolatrous American high command had bound by electrothermal mechanisms over ley lines across the globe through a singular source point agent of auto mass destructive resolve. In other words, this is the nuclear football of the occult world. Somebody uses this, they unleash all the kings of Adom at once that the Americans have bound over generations. And now it's mine. If I were to take it to its full level, DEFCON 4, so to speak, in American code, I would have to perform a tracheotomy on myself. In other words, I'd have to shove the pointed implement, anyone I could find, a pencil, a pen, through my throat, create a hole in which to insert the tube where the effects would be most productive in converting my human lungs and the sounds they produce into something the anti-gods would understand as their call. And understand they still couldn't answer. Because the stars aren't right. God's Hockenkreutz is in the heavens. A swastika spins in the skies. They're impotent. The rampage would be limited. That's why the Americans supported the communist Chinese in building the Three Gorges Dam. You see, the Three Gorges Dam has taken so much water and gathered it, concentrated it into such a limited space that it threatens to topple the world out of its orbit. The Three Gorges Dam is changing the rotation of the earth. Wow. Anyone can look this up. It slows down the earth's rotation and can potentially ultimately topple our orbit. Now, the world's largest hydropower dam has nothing directly to do with powering the binding sites, the heart projects, of America all over the world. But Americas have harnessed, well, Americans have harnessed Tesla technology, scalar weaponry. They can generate earthquakes, the likes of which have never been recorded in nature. The Vox Arca, when triggered, triggers the scalar weapons. The scalar weapons generate earthquakes that take advantage of the overweight generated by the Three Gorges Dam to topple our Earth in a magnetic pole shift. This makes the stars appear to us as if they're falling from the heavens. The constellations change. 
the swastika is sundered in the skies. And the stars are ripe for the anti-gods to rise. Yes, but what is the significance of the Yazidi stripe and uh, the peacock angel to all of this? Because if they exterminate the Yazidi, then the God that created them in his image, Lucifer, the fair and fallen angel, has no reason to defend the earth. So he's able to stand against the antigods. Yes. All the devils and demons will stand by your side against the anti-gods. Understood. So understand, in Black Africa, where I served as a mercenary, they have a very visceral, magical sense of the world. They understand, unlike any other ethnos, the potential for befriending demons in the sense that demons are agents of retributive justice. When one takes a look at God, not in the cosmic sense, but in the sense with which all too many Christians understand him or misunderstand him, this would be the sense of this Judaified God. As I've said before, this is why it's so important to emphasize the revelation of the vampire kings of Asia, the vampire mages who consecrated the Christ. That these wise men from China who were above humanity, above humanity in the food chain as a great white shark is the apex predator of the seas. Yet men hunt sharks and they hunt vampires. And what happens? They destroy the ecosystem. The destruction of sharks leads to naught but carnage in the seas, the destruction of nature itself, the destruction of vampires the same. It was the vampires who forced man to evolve out of the caves. Homo nocturnus, the man who hunted man in the night, my father, being a sailor, and this is important, had spent time stuck on a lifeboat, surrounded by oceans of water, none of which he could drink. To drink salt water drives a man mad before he dies. When the frugivores fell from the trees, had to learn to stand upright to see predators coming their way on the horizon line. They had to learn, ultimately, to eat meat. But with the paucity of food, obviously one of them, well, one of their women would ultimately give birth to a monster who thrived on their own blood. It's my lineage that has always guided yours in that sense, not because of wisdom necessarily, but simply forcing you to evolve. Killing us is destroying yourself. When it comes to the vampire magi and their christening Christ, the King of Kings, this was all nothing to do with Judaism. This is true Christianity. This is proto-Christianity, where they practice all of the Christian practices that Christians came to practice was through the vampire mages of China, not the Jews. Instead, when you look at your Old Testament of the Jews or even your New Testament, no sane God could believe that. Years ago, I had a woman come to me she was crying uncontrollably, a member of her church. She was a member of the Assembly of God Church, where the Bible is believed to be literally true and without error. Of course, this is just another way of saying believe the Bible the way I do. She was told by her pastor that her son, who had recently died, was in hell because he did not accept Jesus as his personal savior. She told that pastor, I want to be in hell too. Now, I was touched by the profound depth of love this mother had for her son. I asked her, you have a profound depth of love for your son. From where do you think this love comes? Do you have more love than God? Of course, she was sobbing uncontrollably. She leaned over to hug me, and she told me her faith in God had been restored with that one simple comment. Now, I still grieve for that woman, 
who was being held hostage to a theology and doctrines of intolerance and hate. I basically blurted this out without thinking. It's not my own wisdom. I was possessed on the night of the broken circle, as I explained in my last transmission, by the angel of angels that they had summoned. Meliak Taush, the peacock angel, the proudest of them all. Do you think that we could ever force him out of our bodies by, as I said, the chanting from a child's Bible? He chose to leave because he had found what he had wanted. He took something from me. Probably one of the few happy memories I've ever had. And replaced me with a part of himself. It's always been there. It comes out at times. It came out then. It doesn't just come out when I'm killing people. Now, large portions of the Bible are filled with hate speech. I'm not just referring to portions of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. New Testament is perhaps even worse. There's a verse in Timothy that says that all scripture is for our edification. This verse is cited by those who despise critical thinking and it's perhaps the most morally repugnant verse in the Bible. It's the foundation of the most fundamental principle of brainwashing. Believe this, and we can make you believe anything. In Timothy 3.16, we read, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The all scripture here refers to the Old Testament. Portions of the New Testament hadn't, they had not even been written at the time. It asked the Gospels. How repugnant is this verse? Well, Frank Schaefer, the son of the deceased famed and evangelical thinker, Francis Schaefer, suggested that we take every despicable verse reeking of bigotry and hate in the Bible and add all scripture is ending to it. St. Paul offers advice to a woman, advice like in the first book of Timothy, chapter 2, verse 12. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. Then add, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. End of discussion. Shut up, ladies. Or the first book of Samuel, chapter 15, verse 3. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. This was the first burnt offering to God by the Jews. They called it a Holocaust. They exterminated entire races. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Our judges, the book of Judges, Chapter 19, verses 25 through 28. So the man took his concubine and sent her outside to them so that they could enjoy raping her and abuse her throughout the night. And at dawn, they let her go. At daybreak, the woman crawled back to the house where her master was staying. Down at the door, she lay there until daylight. When her master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue on his way, there lay his concubine, fallen in the doorway of the house with her hands upon the threshold. He said unto her, get up, let's go. But there was no answer. The man put her on his donkey and set out for home. Oh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable indeed. Or the first book of Peter, chapter two, verse 18. Slaves, submit yourself to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the cruel. Oh, all scripture given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And by the way, that pro-slavery teaching is a New Testament verse. That's when God got kinder as he got older. On the issue of rape, Deuteronomy. Chapter 22, verses 28 through 29. If a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her and they are found, the man well, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife. 
According to the Bible, the raped women are forced to marry the rapist. And only the person, the only person restored is her father if he gets caught. All scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable indeed. Now, there's another choice besides rejecting religion outright. You can embrace God thinking for yourself and openly reject the parts of one's scriptures that outright fly in the face of fact, compassion, and decency. But where does that leave us? Certainly, if one adopts the view of all oh, the Bible is true, then it turns out that most people are a lot more loving and compassionate than their God. Which begs the question, where does that love come from? I can tell you, Lucifer. The fallen angel who couldn't stand to be in the company of such psychosis and madness and evil. The fallen angel who stands for you. Who created his own people, the Yazidi. Whom Michael Aquino and the American army seeks to exterminate through ISIS. ISIS whose shares were traded on the stock market in the United States. ISIS, whose stocks were owned by John McCain, the man who, because he was born on an American military base, unlike myself, can run for president. Understand? Was, you mentioned that uh, Aquino was uh, looking for ancient um... Antigoats artifacts. Was the desert uh, such a place to look for such a thing? I was able to mislead him. And in that sense, I'm responsible for the American Gulf War. The second one, Bush War II. I was able to mislead him as to the location of the Garden of Eden. As I've said, it's in Iran, the very Greek word for Aryan. Hence, Adam was the first Aryan man. Near the city of Tabriz. By convincing him instead that it was in the Fertile Crescent, he understood then that, or misunderstood, that the oldest tools of farming created by thinking man, man that had begun to think in terms of time binding, calendrically, and therefore matured beyond Edenic existence. His tools were what mattered. If he could find those tools, recover them, they would be kind of a universal remote that could hijack the other Artillica of other nations like Japan, that he could use it to hijack control of the Japanese royal reliquary with the first tool ever invented by man, thinking man, mature man, Aryan man. Thus, the Americans launched Gulf War II, as they call it, it's Bush War II, the American Gulf War in Operation Desert Storm was after the Iran-Iraq conflict, which had lasted for eight years and was truly the first Gulf War. But all of that was done to try and loot the Baghdad Museum, which is ultimately what the Americans did. They didn't find what they were looking for because I sent them in the wrong direction. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. But I do know that some of them are insane enough to try and provoke me into triggering the Vox Arca because they feel that the summoner would control that which is summoned. Only in the sense that you could use an electric cattle prod to keep rabid dogs at bay until the battery runs out. None of them have any comprehension of what they're doing. They're all insane. Understand that in order to work, the Vox Arca has to have human body parts. It's got them integrated into the machinery itself. The harnesses that are used are made of human flesh, leathered. If I turn it up to 
full power to summon the entities after tracheotomizing myself. It has a meat grinder mechanism. Well, the meat grinder mechanism inside of it would churn my tongue into meat hamburger. You can't control them once you summon them. You can only let them loose. After turning the earth in an artificial polar shift, it's only meant to end the world. Some of them are mad enough not to care. They think that that'll be a paradise for them. And so I'm attacked relentlessly day and night by gang stalkers. I've articulated this often enough in the past. I'm certain Peter Moon has shared some of it with you. I can barely maintain my sanity to make it through the day. In the end, understand that the God of the Jews is not your God. Your God oh, that created this universe. We are very well aware. <laughs> Your God that created this universe is of the proto-Christianity spoken of by the vampire mage kings, the same vampires who have guarded Christendom, the same vampires who consider the sign of the cross to be a pass, not a ward. That's your God. That Lucifer stands against this Jewish God, this God of the desert, this mad God that, as I said, without the balance of Sophia would leave us lost to insanity. No better than the anti-gods. Well, better by some degrees, but what degree does that matter when you see all of the suffering involved? Of course, between the devil you know and the ones you don't, you would choose that one, but it's still not the choice you have to make. The people in Bulgaria can help bring that enlightenment to the world. What Milko and Simeon are providing is an opportunity for the people, the people of Bulgaria to live in the wisdom of Sofia, the very name of your capital. To bring the feminine and the productive paganism back. The old gods combined with the proto-Christian understanding of the ancient vampire mage kings, of the very people that the Bulgarians helped to enlighten through Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu. All of this needs to be brought into account, brought into the awareness of the Bulgarian people. And even though there's less of you than there are Jews in Israel, four million alone in Bulgaria, compared to six to nine million Jews in Israel, you can become the center of a new human renaissance. Since no one has offered this opportunity to their people before Milko and Simeon have to the Bulgarians uncensored, then this is something that uh, renders uh, Simeon and Milko as, in a sense, Luciferian apostles in the most productive sense. Lucifer meaning the bringer of light. In fact, in Brazil, Young girls who are born are often named Lucifer. They're considered light bringers, bringers of light into their own homes. It's only in areas of the world that have entered into a kind of dark age that that is forgotten. And we must work together on saving the people of Armenia and the largest church of the Azidis in the world is in Armenia, the largest Luciferan church in the world. And the Azidi people themselves must be saved in Kurdistan. Which hopefully will become independent from Iraq. But understand that until they are understood and supported, they will forever be the target of extermination by the people around them. And by the likes of the Americans who seek their total destruction through mercenary companies like ISIS that have paid to unleash every criminal and maniac behind bars throughout North Africa and the Arab world, arm them with machine guns and turn them loose with the ISIS ideology, 
towards the extermination of the Yazidi people, the people of Lucifer. These are your people. Understand that my people are your people. If you don't defend them, there will be no reason for Malik Tawish to even stand by your side when the anti-gods are unleashed. I think that's Thank probably the most important the, message. Thank you, Douglas, for this message and uh, our role into it. And before we go into our last segment, uh, you have a very interesting short clip on your channel on YouTube about uh, the desert and uh, the beings that live there and the ancient temples uh, into the sands. Can you can you tell our audience about that? I'll do my best. Um, I hope you can understand how exhausted I am. And how yeah, I can feel that all of this brings a a real uh, post-traumatic stress order to, mm. to the fore for myself. I'll, I'll do my best. So in the time we have remaining, uh, I want people to understand that uh, one of the first people to speak of this publicly and openly of all people, uh, a completely despicable individual who I want no one to respect, named Art Bell, who was himself an Edomite, a propagandist of the Herodian insurgency, uh, he was the first to report after the Gulf War, the first Gulf War for the Americans, Bush War I, the ghosts in the desert, that people driving through the desert at night would see the dancing ghosts. Well, understand that uh, these were not ghosts. These were the ghouls. There was a 44-day atomic war that was waged in Iraq. Operation Desert Storm pulverized Iraq with airstrikes where you had the hundreds of ground assaults, deployments of artillery shells, ordnance. All of this depleted uranium, the equivalent of thousands of Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs in terms of radiation made Iraq's deserts glow in the dark. That's why for the first time, aside from the moonlight, people could truly see the ghouls, not just the reflection of moonlight on them, but the literal radioactive glow. There's no vampires in the desert. We're like pigs. We don't sweat. For those of you who don't know, why pork is forbidden to both Muslims and Jews. These are tribes of the desert. To support pigs in the desert would require more water than you could support villages of people with. You'd have to hose them down with water throughout the day because they don't sweat to keep them alive. As a result, only the most wealthy could sacrifice water supply for entire villages to support their pig stock. The Jews made it outlawed to eat them, saying they were filthy. The Muslims, after Muhammad, did the same. Vampires being like pigs in that we don't sweat. You never hear about vampires in the desert lore. What they have is ghouls. The desert ghouls inhabit the deserts and barren mountains of Arabian Peninsula, Sirirak, the Fertile Crescent. They may infest areas as far west as the Nile Valley and Sahara Desert. I know for a fact that they go beyond that. It's unknown to the Arabs, though. And certainly no modern statistics were available to confirm the fact that I found out the hard way later. I found out about the ghouls in Arabia itself, but encountered them again in Africa. The full ecological niche further south in Africa is fulfilled by the hyenas. But in the true deserts, the ghouls are the carrion eaters. The total ghoul population of Southwest Asia, the Middle East, is unknown. My belief is that New human incursions into the desert over the last 
Half a hundred years have resulted in more ghoul tombs and temples being disturbed. So, what had happened in my case was that, well, let's describe what the people were seeing in their cars. Understand that in places like Saudi Arabia, where the Saudi royal family is so wealthy, they forced everyone to take their last name. The idea of the very name of Saudi Arabia is bullshit. Saud is the name of the ruling dynasty. It would be like everyone in England taking the name of the ruler Windsor dynasty. We're all Windsorites instead of British. Or for Americans, it would be the Halliburton Company. We're all Halliburtoni. But because the family pays everyone off by pulling them on six-digit welfare, everyone accepts it. And, of course, uh, they buy new cars when their old cars die, which happens with talcum powder sand in the desert. You are, by law, always required to keep your air conditioner on. If your air conditioner dies, you're required by law to get out of your car and call for a truck to tow it and rescue yourself. You're not allowed to continue driving. So what they do with these cars they tow away in the House of Saud is they take them all to the borders and they abandon them. And they're perfectly preserved in the desert. Thousands of cars in a row, brand spanking new, perfectly preserved in the desert. And the only thing not working is their air conditioner. If somebody could find a way to cross that border and steal all those cars, repair the air conditioner, you'd have an unlimited amount of cars to sell. So people driving in their cars at night got their air conditioner on. We know that much. And then they see the ghouls if they happen to be in Iraq. And from a distance, the ghoul appears to be a normal human being wrapped in what would probably be misperceived as loose robes and headdress common to the desert. But as your car gets closer and they approach it, their true nature becomes evident. Uh, how would I describe it? I'm trying to think and recall about what people told me in terms of the encounters that we had, of course. I was lucky enough there. They weren't all that close, so we could get to see all of the details of their ugly faces. But if I remember correctly, Basically, they appear all naked, of course. They're always naked. And they're covered in dirt from burrowing under burial mounds, searching for food. They've got these, well, a permanent expression of feral rage that their face is contorted into. The female ghoul, well, they have hair. Dark, dank, and for both sexes, their main distinguishing feature is their small, sharp teeth, like those of a piranha. They don't speak, but, well, they hiss. There's also this cat-like hissing noise. That's what we heard after our mission where we encountered the result of their attack. Now, when it comes to ghoul skin, it's, well, when you can see it, it ranges from kind of blue-gray in color. And uh, as I said, it hangs really loose from their wiry frame. They're like camels that fill up with water before the hump gets full. They fill up when they eat. So even though they appear quite emaciated and feeble when they're hungry, well, they possess remarkable strength for their build. And so when they get close enough to your car window, the face gets drawn tight across the bare skull. You could even see signs of its tearing when it's been unable to feed for a few months. People who have driven past them in the night have told me this. But, of course... Probably, how do I say this when it comes to my own experience to try and make this relevant? 
Understand that when we started Operation Desert Shield, before there was Desert Storm, there was the preparation. Months of mobilization, nine months, like childbirth. Half a million men in Operation Desert Shield. We should have all just carried the atropine syringe. But as well, they imported 35 thousand dogs now there were 41,000 women as well but the men kept calling them bitches like they were another species of dog but as for the 35,000 dogs these were meant to be early detectors of biological and chemical weapons now theoretically they could have eliminated all the cumbersome mop gear that anti-chemical rubber suits we were wearing but these 118 dog teams, well, the very noise of moving them in eliminated special operations use. This was in April of 1990. Desert Shield became Desert Storm in January 16th of 1991. Now, when it came to all these dogs, we found out just why the Arabs thought of them all as rats or just shit on four legs they were worthless scared to death throughout the night of things they couldn't see or at least we couldn't scared of the ghoul oh my god thank so you, we got you. the news i'm sorry all right uh, we feel that you're very exhausted. Are you able to to keep going or at all? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we got the news concerning a Saudi supply column classified as missing in action while crossing a desert on night maneuvers. This was a long range patrol. And when we were sent out to search for it in that area, that hollow between the Kingdom of Jordan and Iraq. We discovered a long range patrol. Well, we discovered rather the wrecked trucks and Jeeps in a low valley in the central portion of the Sinai. Now the weapons belonging to the soldiers were found strewn across the ground. All of them had emptied their magazines. In fact, they had spent all of their bullets, apparently firing into the desert all around them in all directions. None of the soldiers' bodies were found until we discovered them two weeks later. Now, this was when we were operating in tandem with a tank column out on its own maneuvers, 80 kilometers from the location, 44 miles from the location where the trucks had originally discovered the fate of the men, the trucks that brought us in. As for the bodies, they were found in a small depression, their uniforms torn from their bodies. Most had been entirely stripped of all their flesh. No evidence could be found to determine the identity of their attackers. So what happened was, of course, the police were called in to investigate. We were ordered to stand guard until they arrived. When they did arrive, the police inspector was an old man and understand that the police are one of the few professional. Well, they're one of the few professional subcultures in the Arab population in the House of Saud. A lot of people don't know that almost nobody in the House of Saud works. There's the royal family and all they do is eat, drink and fuck all day. There's the population. And all they do is, well, you don't know what they're doing all day because there's nothing to do. There's theaters are outlawed. There's no theaters. The alcohol is outlawed, so there's no bars. Uh, there's certainly no adult entertainment centers. So I can tell you, as far as I'm concerned, all they do is shop. But other than that, those that get caught out in the desert at night and the cars aren't working or something like patrols that go out of their way to 
basically loot the temples of the ghouls. Then we get results like this. But as for the workers, everyone employed in the House of Saud is foreign. Almost nobody in the House of Saud works. All their doctors and nurses are foreign. Everybody operating all of their machinery is foreign. All of their servants are foreign. One of the few professional jobs that you will find only Saudi Arabs in would be the police force. So this old policeman had been around forever. And he told me that the legends tell of the hidden tombs and temples within the deserts of these areas, many of them older than the pyramids of Egypt and South America. These places of power were dedicated to humanity's earliest deities. Protected, well, the ghoul. Man and ghoul once worshipped such deities together. And the ghouls as the servitor races of these ancient unspeakable gods. The black-hearted dark ones themselves protected these holy places. Well, unholy unto us, even after the last of the worshippers had long since died. Human worshippers, that is. With no congregations for the temples and no mourners at the tombs, the temples lay undisturbed for centuries. And, of course, the only people who tended to them or had not forgotten about them were the ghoul. So when this patrol had discovered that the sand dunes had blown away to expose one of these ancient temples, they felt it was permissible to violate it because it was not of Allah, not of the Mohammedan creation, and of the kafir, or unbeliever, the infidel, they could raid it with impunity. You see, the new inhabitants of this world the intruders would discover the old sites and venture inward, their minds filled with images of jewels and gold. But all they would find is death. This is what happened to that patrol. They discovered the hard way. Desert ghouls often work as a pack while hunting and stalking across the night sands in search of solitary prey. The weakest, the oldest, and the youngest falling behind the caravan. Foolish enough, to walk the desert at night if they are dervish or holy men, unless they have the power to weld the ghoul off with either great love or great violence. Otherwise, they usually attack by surrounding their victims. They surround their victims as a horde and they come in low on the sand like scorpions. They crawl on all fours, but fast like the possessed girl in The Exorcist, keeping low to the ground. And once within striking distance, they, well, they use their powerful arms to grapple their victims. And once the target is in their grasp, they have these long prehensile tongues to stab through their prey's skin and inject their poison. If the tongue breaks the skin in the next phase, well, you'd be too weak to struggle and incapable of moving at more than a crawl. If you're rescued, those effects will last for a few hours. The policeman told me he had found that out the hard way. But ghouls typically eat their victim alive long before that time runs out. So they might suffer damage from being hit by a bullet, but they heal at a far faster rate than humans can. Very similar to any carrion eater. They have an internal antibiotic system that keeps them from being poisoned by their own toxin, similar to a Komodo dragon. All of this is something that I was told by the police officer, and after we left uh, our position at that site, while he went on with the police to make certain that they used DNA testing to bring the bones back to the right families, we were tracked throughout Desert Storm once it began by the ghouls probably identified us as part of that patrol. Hissing and singing in the night, their eyes reflected in the moonlight. 
I commanded a squad of only half a dozen men, and none of them was worth a shit. All of them cowards to the last and scared to death. The ghoul tracking us throughout the night until Operation Desert Storm was over and we ran into enough surrendering Arabs to provide us protection in numbers. That was my first encounter with a ghoul. The fact that they existed, the fact that they sang to each other in the night. But understand it goes far beyond what even the Arabs know. Now, of course, there was once an entire Arab nation in North Africa that belonged to France. In 1884, an author named Sertoy, C-E-R-T-E-U-X. He only had one name, like Prince or Madonna or something. And he wrote the book, L'Algérie Traditionnelle, The Traditions of Algeria. <laughs> That's very great French. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. In that book, he spraketh of Bauchoga. Bauchoga or Chouga. Now that sounds like something out of Lovecraft. It's not. But then again, Lovecraft himself was of Arab descent. So in a sense, whatever he wrote was out of Bauchoga. It's spelled B-O-U space C-H-O-U. Double G A when we Romanize it or Latinize it from the Arabic. This is the ruins of a city in Sahara. Now, according to the testimony of many of the inhabitants who live in the vicinity, beneath the ruins lies a large city inhabited by Christians who took refuge there when North Africa was invaded by Islam. The Christians diverted the rivers and streams that once made that area fertile, and then they lived happily underground. If you don't believe people can do that, think about what Gaddafi did when Gaddafi ran Libya and created entire artificial rivers. It was always said that one day they would arise and water the desert once again. On the surface of the Sahara, there was only one remaining trace of Bauchulga. A large stone well, four to five meters deep. And even though the well was dry, by the time Islamic man had spread his seed across the sands, a traveler placing his ear to the stone would be able to hear the underground murmur of the water that once fed it. But of course, if someone had the misfortune to stay long enough in area, they would hear the screams. People need to understand the horrors that that Christian population ultimately suffered. When you think of the deserts of the Sahara, there is, of course, uh, much that I could go into for hours. When it comes to the tallest mountain in the desert of the Sahara. Let me see if I can look that up in one of my books or uh, look it up online because this is important. It's something that, of course, is <sighs> central to the experience. It's something that, of course, is part of the uh, Oh, how do I say it? It's part of the reality that you're kept from knowing. Simply because there are some things that man was never meant to know. So, of course, I'm unable to find it online. If I take a look through some of the ancient tomes oh, that I stole from the library of the Presidio. There's a realm deep below the surface of the earth, covering a quarter of a million square miles. The only known access is down the cone of an extinct volcano in the Ahagar region of North Africa. And it's the Ahagar 
That's one of the most mysterious places on Earth. When you take a look at some of what we know about it, let me try and um, see if I can uncover anything about it that's even contemporary. Nah, nothing of worth. What I can tell you of what I learned from the Presidio Department of Defense Records is that it's the heart of the Sahara itself. The name Ahagar, A-H-A-G-G-A-R, dominated all exploration in the Western Sahara during the latter half of the 19th century. It was the problem to be solved, the inaccessible core. And the explorer Barth followed its eastern confines. The explorer Duveuillet gathered valuable data on the region, even though he never penetrated it. There was the man named Flatus, with all the members of his expedition massacred at Tin Tarabin, where a memorial was raised by the French government. The Fureau-Lemy expedition crossed the Sahara, but touched only the eastern margin of the Ahagar. So the name has always recalled an entire series of efforts, valiant indeed, but futile or incomplete. Now, supposedly, solution of the problem remained for the 20th century. There were two successive reconnaissances by the Maharis from Insala. They finally dissipated some mystery. The first was under the leadership of Lieutenant Contenest, the second under Lieutenant Willow Lohan. No relation to Lindsay Lohan that I know of, but <laughs> at any rate, the first geographical account of exploration in the Ahagar appeared in 1903 over the signature of the latter officer. And from this time, the French Maharis forward plow, well, they policed the Ahagar and the entire Western Sahara, of which the Ahagar is the key. Now, the credit for the work of pacification, rather than conquest, was due to General Laperine. He was buried in the Ahagar, to which he had consecrated his very life. The truth was, he had found out about the Gur. His life was saved by them. He made a pact with them that when he died, he would give them his body. When they took his body, the magnitude of his accomplishment never received the recognition that it merited. Now, today, people would tell you the Ahagar is one of the best known regions of the Sahara. It's one of the reasons why I can't stand to look at contemporary accounts. Now, the works on it have multiplied since 1903. But none of them will tell you what's beneath it. So beneath it is a hidden world, a hollow world, a giant cavern, so vast as to be a world unto itself the size of North Africa, thought to have been formed by an enormous meteor which entered the volcano and exploded inside the earth when it came in contact with solid matter. The explosion caused much of the solid matter to disintegrate, forming an enormous bubble of molten rock, the shell of that hollow world. The whole country is bathed permanently in an unnatural daylight, thought to be produced by chemical photoluminescence, sparked off by the substances released in the original explosion. And as there's no stars or planets, its sky is impossible, to devise any astronomical system of directions for. And similarly, the permanent daylight means there's no natural method of reckoning time at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would say that time would effectively cease to exist down there. The climate's warm and very humid with frequent showers because, of course, it's large enough for condensation of water, which produces rain, making it perfect to be blessed, or in this case, cursed with life. This is where the Christians escaped to. They escaped into hell itself. What I found out on mercenary contract for an American university conducting exploration into Africa was that underneath Africa, 
from the Atlas Mountains in Morocco across the Sahara and into the Rift Valley, and perhaps, as far as I know, into South Africa and the Cape, though it's probably all just the bulbous north of Africa, why, I would pray. There's a series of interconnected tunnels, caves, subterranean rivers, massive lakes, and most importantly, the largest kingdom of ghouls found anywhere on the earth. These ghouls are organized, they're disciplined, they're hierarchical, they're even cultured. Their artwork may be twisted and grotesque, but they adorn and decorate their world nonetheless. Their eating of human flesh might be savage, but they save and breed their food for future needs. The African ghouls know that the stars will come right one day. And they know to be prepared for that event, they're stockpiling humans. Tens of millions of them since the escape of the Christians into the underworld. They've bred them in vast caverns deep beneath the earth. These slaves herded into large groups are forced to survive with minimal resources. Those who survive under the harsh conditions remain lean and fit and tasty, while those who don't become food for their masters. All of this we found evidence of to the point where some of the researchers went insane. A number of them fell to the ghoul. I had to kill a few of them so that the rest could make it home alive. The researchers, that is. The university paid me to keep my mouth shut enough where I kept it shut and will keep it shut for the rest of my life. I honor bargains. All that money was spent when I was taking care of my parents in the years that they died, but I'll never forget the fact that they just let it go. To pursue it would have been a scandal that they could never have handled. So what I can say is that the ghoul in Africa have a culture in which humans are bred and they expect someday to swarm the surface of the earth as soon as the Vox Arca is triggered. They don't know about the Vox Arca per se. Yeah. All they know is that people like Aquino and Leslie Groves and their ilk are working to bring about the writing of the stars for the anti-gods. They're waiting for the window. Their window of opportunity their strategic yeah. window of opportunity to swarm the surface world. They'll invade like rats out of the sewers and into the cities and then breed people like rats. They devour babies as they emerge from the womb as a delicacy in front of their mothers. That's what they do down below. We knew that for a fact. So understand this is the world of horror that you know nothing of the world that the americans bargain with in fact the americans tried to create their own race such ghouls you see the underground nuclear testing conducted in nevada the deserts of america understand how this was done the boring of holes you see illustrations of such in old popular mechanics magazines. Bore a hole deep into the ground. Blow the warhead at the end of the drill. Well, the drill, of course, is something separate. Later on, you lower the warhead basically on a string into the hole the drill creates. Blow it underground, miles underground. You ever wonder why they did that? Well, what happens is the nuclear weapon creates a perfect sphere, a perfect sphere that, well, all the walls of that sphere, that hollow lacunae, that cavity in the earth, are glassed because the nuclear explosion turns sand into glass. Mm. So it creates a perfect glass bottle with a thin bottleneck to the surface. You can pump any atmosphere into that hole. You can turn it into a vacuum by pumping out all the atmosphere in the hollow. You pump in a new atmosphere. 
you can create supermassive terrariums. They experimented with plants that thrived off radiation. Your average banana absorbs solar radiation. There's more radiation you will absorb by eating a banana than you will get from your stupid cell phone. Not that any of it is bad, it's all quite harmless, but it's absorbed by the banana as solar radiation. It's how you, in turn, absorb solar radiation from the primary energy producer, the plant. So by creating entire radioactive jungles under the earth, pumping in atmosphere, water, creating a rainy environment where the condensation, like a terrarium, constantly, well, hydrates plant life. These super radioactive molten jungles became the homes for what Americans bred to be the successor race to humanity when humanity is destroyed. Radiovores that feed off radiation. A kind of humanoid ghoul with clawed webbed feet, semi-amphibious, glowing in the dark, living as a hive in super concentrated numbers that they can tolerate. No concept of individuality. Raised under the promise that when the ground above glows as much as the ground on which they dwell on the surface of the world, they were meant to inherit the earth. These are the hives created by America, meant to swarm the earth someday, something they believe will stand against the ghouls, as if they were an optional choice. The madness I've dealt with all my life in working for the United States government. If some jackass kid working for a single year for the US government released all the documents that Jack Douglas Tiagera did just a few weeks ago. Imagine what I've seen in a decade of working with the highest levels of security that I was never even meant to see. Yeah. Because well, we have little exhausted. time to, yeah. Do, do you want to finish or? I'd like to go on about the Dietrich Art elect in another interview. I'm hoping we can arrange for another one. Is that possible? Well, if you if you must go, you should go. There's no doubt about it. Um, well, it's simply you can imagine the emotional toll this takes on me physically and emotionally. I yeah, and the Dietrich yeah. story is, is extremely emotional for you as well. Thank you. I'm hoping you understand. Is mm -hmm. it possible yes, we can arrange for a third interview between us? Well, perhaps, but it will not be soon. Okay. Yeah. I will do my best. Uh, how long have we been on? I mean, how? what time is it where you're at? Five hours and a half. Okay, so it's been five and a half hours, similar to our last interview, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, completely. Okay, so our, our last interview was about five and a half hours as well. Did you ever get what I sent you in the email? Yes. Or it did arrive. <laughs> eventually, eventually, yes. Okay, interesting. Okay, um, I'm sorry, after of all I've been through, I don't know if I could stand another emotional adventure. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah I, I hope you understand. Um, Yes. Hoping we can arrange for another interview. I know it might not be soon, but um, I, I would like to make listeners in Bulgaria aware of the Dietrich Artelect in Taiwan and how that affects uh, contemporary geopolitics. We'd have to do it as soon as possible, meaning that, you know, as soon as you can arrange for it, simply because, as well you know, China might invade Taiwan at any time. Now, if that happens, I'm convinced that communist China will fail, but you know, before it even happens, I'd like to try and put the context out there so that people could understand why I believe they will fail. I hope that makes sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so that being said, um, love you both and certainly all of our listeners. 
Uh, I want to thank you all for your patience and understanding. We've been through a lot tonight. We were under constant assault. Uh, I'm certain that uh, Simeon and Milko will have no uh, problems agreeing with me that what happened to us was completely unnatural and that we were they tried to take us down any number of times until they simply got tired of it. It certainly never happened before, so. It's very common with myself, believe me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> time I conduct an interview, yeah. it's exactly what happens. You're used to it, yeah. So, um, um, again, I appreciate both of you for your patience and and uh, um, I love to you both and blessings and uh, I look forward to working with you again. Uh, um, as hopefully we can make that happen before Taiwan, before the communists attempt to invade my true homeland and ha heartland of Taiwan. And therefore I can explain to people the dynamics behind the geopolitics thereof and why uh, they should be prepared for a communist failure. But uh, one never knows. Our world, of course, is unpredictable, uh, but hopefully we can keep ahead of it. I, th I think what I gave you tonight would be enough for a while um, to uh, work on and uh, and thank you for we... being such an endless uh, treasure of knowledge and stories and wisdom and such a universal paradox you're uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you're, you're not supposed to you exist. cannot be described <laughs> almost yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah thank you i uh, i of course will look forward at some point to explaining a little bit about uh, cloning as well um, there's a quiet cloning program going on in Japan. It's how they intend to populate all their new land. I'd like to put that into perspective of the Raelian cult and what that represents. Uh, it has to do as a front company, basically, for the thousand year Reich in exile. I'll explain that um, the next time we speak as well. Please remind me. Um, aside from that, um, I might explain what else I recall about the ghoul in Africa. I hope everyone understands it's painful enough for me to recall where I don't want to give away the secrets of that would hurt the families of those that died. Uh, so I'll try and keep it as generic as possible in some cases, but there's a lot more to the story than I've gone into, as you can imagine. Um, as aside from that, uh, I want people to understand that um, ghouls are real enough where some people have become what they call ghoul lovers in the sense that some people see them as necessary to the ecosystem and therefore have done their best to help feed them the dead that would otherwise uh, be buried in mass graves or uh, beggar cemeteries. Uh, there are certain people like that, and they become, of course, in the old days, uh, condemned by their own population. If discovered, they would have been killed. Uh, the individual that I described, uh, General Laparin, was one of these. He fed uh, the Arab war dead to the ghouls and therefore had himself buried among them, so to speak, or as an offering to them so that they wouldn't harm his men. Contracts like this can be made because the ghouls in North Africa are truly civilized to a degree, horrifically so, where they breed chattel, cattle of humans. Uh, the Thousand Year Reich in exile, the Third Reich when it retreated, or rather advanced into Winterland, has fought a war against them and has rescued many of the Christian population. The Americans knew this in their communications exchanges with the Reich until the time that all communications broke off during the Clinton administration. Not that Clinton had anything to do with it. Indeed, he never knew of their existence. He didn't have a high enough security clearance. But the Thousand Year Reich has had the hardest time trying to get such people to operate beyond the level of feral animals at that point. They're very hard to rehabilitate. They've been bred for generations as food. This is the kind of world that the Thousand Year Reich has served as the vanguard against the ghouls swarming the surface of the world at various times that they otherwise would have. Just as Alexander the Great sealed them behind great walls. They were known, of course, as the unclean tribes, the cannibal tribes. People can look up Alexander the Great and his war against these tribes and his sealing them behind walls that cannot be breached. 
He drove them underground. Now, of course, with the Thousand Year Reich in exile in Unterland, defeating them on many fields of battle, they might be driven above ground yet again. We live in an unpredictable world, and uh, the Americans respond in fashions that are neither sane nor constructive any more than the Russians. All of the Allied powers are corrupted by the Herodian insurgency. They only make the problem worse. Our best hope lies with the former Axis powers. Japan is organized, Germany is not. Uh, until we can spread the word through Bulgaria of my existence, the fact that the son of Hitler lives and that Germany has hope for the future. Until the Germans are made aware of who I am and what I have to offer, they're hopeless and helpless. Are they aware? I'm sorry? Are they aware? In a sense, yes. In a sense, no. Very little. The problem was that the Nazis took everything with them, all the knowledge. The Germans that were left were simply raised by the Allies. Only the old school of Germans knew, and with time, generations, most of the knowledge died off with them. The uh, problem now is that the, uh, well, we won't go into the politics right now, they're too toxic. We can talk about that privately at some point soon and decide what we can share with the public. That would be the best thing to do about that subject. Does that make sense? Okay, okay. Yep. Yes. Okay, again, I love to hear Thank both you, Douglas. Um, Take care. Please maintain contact with myself. Anything you need to tell me before I sign off? I don't know. Nothing on my mind. <laughs> Just have a nice, <laughs> have a nice rest. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. I'll do that. We'll meet again. Yeah. Both of you have a great spring season. Um, and uh, again, I'll do my best to uh, work with you in the future. All you need to do is contact me. Um, and. Uh, um, any help you need or any clarification, feel free to ask myself. Um, yeah, when we start to make the subtitles, if if we misunderstood some words, uh, we will advise you. Thank you, thank you. Just contact me, and we'll do our best. We'll we'll talk about it on Skype and get it set straight. Okay. Thanks, Douglas. Okay, we'll keep in touch. Thank you both. My love for you both, and best wishes to all your listeners. God bless you all. Bye bye. Goodbye.